This is Audible. The Dealer of Hope. Adrian's Undead Diary, Book 9. Book 1 of Adrian's March. Written by Chris Philbrook. Performed by James Anderson Foster. September 2013. September 21st, 2013. Hey, buddy. It's been a long time, huh? I've been fighting the urge to sit down at this laptop and crank out something for some time now. It's hard to find the time and the will to do it, amazingly so. So very long I sat with this little remnant of technology in front of me in the dark. In the cold, and swore and swore about how much I hated it, and all the time it took from my life, and how much of a burden it was, and all that horse shit. With everything going on in the world, I still found the time to complain about writing my thoughts down voluntarily. Don't even get me started on depression, PTSD, survivor's guilt, chafing, all in a world overrun by the undead. Like, how can I label my bullshit now? Adrian's been reading, fitting, as so many think I was the savior of mankind. But sitting here, putting words back on this strange electronic white page, I feel good. A little guilty that I'm not doing the duties, <laughs> duties, that have taken over my life of late, but still, I feel good. The woman I love, Michelle Lewis, is down in the clinic with half of Bastion there with her, dealing with our baby birthing conundrum. You like that word? Conundrum? It's fun to say out loud. Do it. Say it out loud. Fun, right? Like discombobulate. So, with her down there holding on to the hand of our three pregnant girls, women, really, saying girls makes it sound creepy in my head. I have been left to my own devices, and Otis the cat is poor company when it comes to keeping up his end of a conversation. Headbutting like a champion, sure. Purring like a Harley Davidson, sure. Compelling conversation? Not so much. He's a fluffy cat, not a wordy one. It doesn't help that pretty much everyone else here in Hall E is off doing things this evening. Things, such a descriptive word. It's been fairly warm of late, especially as I write this, entirely unlike the first time I sat down with this laptop and started writing. Back in September of 2010. Three years ago, this very night. Shit, it was cold that night. Rough winter, really. Rough summer and fall before that, too. Remember June 23rd much? The day we hear a bastion take off to remember all those who died and rose again? A、uh, change of gears, I'm getting depressed. Abby's down in the clinic. She's about to pop out her first baby. Patty's little girl becoming a mom. My little girl, too, kinda, if I want to be honest with myself. Weird, right? Like, creepy weird she's having a kid? She's old enough, as you might imagine it, or remember it. She and our British Marine Harold hit it off right from the jump, and. When all the undead dropped and took their permanent nap on March 3rd of last year after I confronted Cassie, it became a lot easier to be in love and a lot safer to have babies. She was pregnant within months, and she's due any minute now. She's still blonde, still sassy, not skinny anymore. Still one of the best shots here, and I love that young lady, and I'm so fucking proud of her. I should go down there. Moral support. Speaking of which, I sincerely hope that she has been writing in her own journal. I initially handed my laptop, this laptop, to her in the hopes she'd just take over and keep writing, making files one after another like I did. But after a few days, she handed me the machine back and was all like, Thanks, Adrian, but I'll use my laptop. I caught a whiff of arrogance. I think she's a Mac user. Nothing against Mac users, but. And、they frequently have an air of elitism that makes me want to fist them. You use a computer just like I do. Now get over the make and model and software and just use the damn thing. Or I get the Ben Gay. 
Funny to say you use a computer just like I do. We don't really use computers. Lots and lots of writing by hand. Graph paper has become a staple here at Bastion, and anyone who returns from a loot run with it gets a round of applause. The school had droves of it piled up in storage, and we use it for everything. The only computer in regular use is the one running our security systems, and the few folks that absolutely need to use a computer play video games or watch DVDs or whatnot. I wonder how many people here at Bastion are writing journals on a computer just like me. I'd bet quite a few. As I understand it, journaling has become a popular hobby, with Abby telling everyone that during the entire apocalypse I kept a detailed journal. Which, by the way, reminds me that we are officially into the post-apocalyptic phase of the world. When the shit went down, it was the apocalypse. Now we're past that, and we get a prefix. Fun, right? Life has changed so much since I last wrote inside you, Mr. Journal. Ugh, innuendo much? And I feel like I should talk more about my... feelings. Feelings. <laughs> Things are good. Much better than when the world began to eat itself alive. More later. Maybe. I'm gonna go be with Abby. My little girl is going through some shit right now, and I need to be near her. At the very least, to protect her from killing Hal. Adrian. September 22nd, 2013. Abby's still in labor. Poor kid. Her and Hal have been in our clinic with Ethan and Fletcher for pretty much forever. I stopped in to visit her, but Abby gave me the stink eye, and Hal looked at me with his big brown eyes that said, Run, Adrian, run as far and as fast as you can, you beautiful idiot. He may have actually said that out loud instead of me reading that from his eyes. It's hard to say. It's the truth, regardless of how it went down. I guess sitting with your legs in stirrups doing the flying V while a fat-headed kid is taking their sweet-ass time leaving your womb via a stretched-out cervix leaves you a little irritable. Who knew? Michelle kissed my cheek and politely suggested I find somewhere else to be. So like the wise man I am, read, I have self-preservation instincts, I left. Things are quiet. I was bored, so here I am, writing again. Weird. I wonder where this urge is coming from. Let's talk about logistics, supplies, and needs as we head closer to another winter. Winter scares us a lot, scares me to death. Despite us doing very well on food and general supplies, staying warm and ensuring that our food harvest will last keeps us up late at night no matter what. I think from here on out, for a very long time, winters will be very scary. Fighting zombies for almost two years was one thing, but waging war against Mother Nature is an entirely different matter altogether. I can't snipe vegetables onto a plate with a twenty-two plinker. I'm glad now we are only fighting one at a time. We have accomplished a few tasks to make our lives a lot more tolerable, though. Not long after my last entry in March of... Uh, 2012? And our shit visit to the city, things have settled down. The biggest change of all is the entire lack of undead anywhere. No zombies anywhere to be seen. When I put that bullet through my first true love, Cassie's head, forgive me, they all dropped to the ground and that was it. Like a fucking switch was flipped. The whole scheme came together like our dreams had foretold. Like Gilbert told us about. I really was the representative soul of mankind and the scribe of the end times. I really was being tested to see if Humanity would get a second chance. Kevin really was the warden, the protector. Michelle really was the soul with me. My soulmate, if that's not too corny. Always sounded corny when I said it before I met her, but now I... I get it. We were two peas in an apocalyptic pod. We are two peas in a pod. She's yin, I'm yang. I'm Ernie, she's Bert. It's all very hard for me to believe, but... The reality of it went down exactly like that. It happened. We've seen no one dead since that day in March over a year ago, which has been a real friggin' blessing. 
Life has gotten easier, and moving around and finding salvaged goods is now a commonplace, easy task to accomplish. The roads are all overgrown by foliage, and most houses are buried under bushes and grasses, but the roads we drive on are pretty clear, and when we have time, we send out groups of kids to manage it with push-powered lawnmowers and machetes. It's crazy cool how easy it is to get a teenager to do something when you offer them a machete, just saying. The primary concern we have is how much fuel we waste if we use vehicles, making sure we have enough food and dealing with medical issues as they arise. Going house to house still requires increased vigilance over what I'd describe as pre-zombie days. Not as much as when the living dead were out and about, but still more than usual. We're worried about bumping into new, potentially hostile survivors and dealing with human rot and subsequent disease. Yeah rot. I think we're past the worst of it now, but initially in March through about late May, we were fucking overwhelmed by the quantity of dead bodies that suddenly started rotting everywhere we went. You remember when I said that the undead weren't rotting? Not even the flies wanted anything to do with them. I think while animated, they had some quality to them that prevented the vast majority of decay from kicking in, like keeping your weapons oiled to prevent rust. The devil kept them fresh for us. I think that same property kept them from freezing solid during the cold weather. That same property also prevented the spread of disease off their corpses as well. Remember the stories of how the second massive waves of death came from the spread of disease? Well, we were fortunate enough to dodge deaths from sickness, but I'm sure across the world others weren't as lucky as us. When they all drop dead, though, shazam, rot, decay, pestilence, you name it, it all came back with a motherfucking vengeance. Houses were beyond horrid. The city was entirely off limits the length of summer, a self-imposed reverse quarantine. We've only just this week started braving the edge of it again. Our friends over at Spring Meadows on the city fringe have been huge in getting supplies gathered. Everyone over at the factory has been a godsend as well. They're in a far more industrial region between town and the city, and with their access to factories and raw materials that previously weren't really an option, we've been able to accomplish far more in the way of technological recovery. We got exceptionally lucky mid-June when the factory people encountered a trio of fellow survivors nearby. They met on friendly terms, and after a week of staying in touch, the new folks moved into a building down the street, then finally into the factory itself. Two of the three are here at Bastion now. The two we have here are a husband and wife in their mid to late fifties, Fletcher and Annie Thomas. Fletcher was a veterinarian before the end, and Annie worked at a magnet company. She has a degree in electrical engineering. They were on vacation visiting some relatives in this neck of the woods when the shit hit the fan. Fletcher has added considerable experience to our medical capabilities, as well as to Ollie and Melissa's farming ventures. Our cows will be much better off, as are our chickens, our six goats, eleven sheep, and the three horses we've managed to find running wild, plus the six horses the Texans brought with them. They're a very nice addition to our transportation capabilities, though I'm still too scared to ride one of them. Horses scare me. They remind me of big dogs. Call me a pussy, I dare you. You ever been bitten by a horse? Me either, and I'm not in the business of collecting experiences of the kind. I've had just about enough bites, thank you very much. Annie has a lot of good basic electrical and engineering experience. She's done a shitload of research into biodiesel for us, and we're already several months into her building a substantial biodiesel plant in one of the staff houses in the ass end of campus. It's not technically in the house per se, but at the house, and the house is her office. We've spent half our damn efforts scouring the world around us for all the materials she needs to get it going. I should also add that the word substantial is pretty relative. When you have no biodiesel, a gallon a week is substantial. But she assures me that by Halloween we'll be in production of an appreciable amount of biodiesel— the fuel truck that Kevin and company brought with them from the coast before the big Cassie confrontation has been an incredible boon, as has all the other fuel sources we've been able to acquire, but it's getting lower and lower, faster and faster due to our increased travel to acquire shit here and there. 
especially seeing how we're moving much further from home than ever before. I can't even begin to describe to you how incredible it was for us to hit the city library and pillage it for science texts. Reminder, winter is coming. Biodiesel will help solve our fuel problems for the vehicles, as well as our fuel issues for the generators for the dorms. And he's been helpful converting the gasoline machines over into diesel as we find them. Plus, we were able to hit the DOTs in the surrounding larger towns and get our hands on the portable worksite industrial generators, which, luckily enough, run on diesel already. I don't understand the science of it all, but things are working out. She also has plans to build us a hydroelectric generator on the river, but that'll be several years of work we haven't begun yet. I'm excited for the future, and that has been a very long time coming. I guess I should say that one of the stranger things that have been going on is the steady influx of new arrivals looking for me, me and then Michelle and Kevin to a lesser extent. I don't like thinking about it much, but it would appear that many, many others were visited in dreams, and the tale of our deeds had been told to them in some fashion. In a world gone dead, I've become something of a celebrity, which is half hilarious and half sad and irritating. Wait, that make it thirds? Guys like me aren't celebrities, unless you count reality TV scumbags getting drunk and punching sluts on MTV, which... I guess, makes me a celebrity. Back to the subject at hand. A steady flow of people have arrived on campus, creating a bit of a population problem for us. I get real itchy when I think about too many people here inside the walls, so as they arrive, we talk with them, assess skill sets, determine usefulness and what roles they could fill and are interested in filling. Then we give them their option of living spaces. Everyone is welcome conditionally, more or less. Bastion is full up, so random houses in town are an option as always, but we try to push them to our off-campus population centers. What's that, you ask, Mr. Journal? Why does it have those almost quotation marks around it? Well, we have several hubs of people we're in league with, you already know about the cleared-out apartment building in town. MGR, still led by Patty and Mike, population of about 50 souls now, as well as the old strip club slash fortress on the city fringe we affectionately call The Factory, now led by a factory original named Celeste and one of our transplants, Hector, population of about 50 souls as well, and the gated community in the city suburbs, Spring Meadows, still run by Anders and Agnes, population of around 80. Before I forget, make a note that we are running hot at about 65% female population. Men trying to be heroes down the stretch didn't pan out for most of them. I think most notable of our arrivals was the Texas group. They arrived in late March right after the big Cassie confrontation in a convoy. They had a big old fuel tanker filled with fresh diesel plus a half dozen horses, a flatbed with all kinds of good stuff, and a powerful need to help the people they were convinced helped save the world. They were some of the first people who came seeking me out and knew more or less what we had done for the world, this without ever having met me or having met anyone who had met me. Go figure. Their leader, a dude named Adam who ran a Home Depot before that day, is a solid guy who almost died on arrival. He had a gunshot wound to his side that he'd collected somewhere in southern Virginia when they ran into a group calling themselves the First Virginia Republic or some shit. Let the wackos come out to play, says the guy who lives in a private school turned fort named Bastion. Anyway, the Texans are real good people, all 12 of them that are still alive. They lost a few to the trip getting here, which, if you think about it, is a Herculean journey that I am simply floored by, and one more here due to illness. As they were the first to arrive before we filled up, they got their pick of the litter in terms of living spaces, so... Some of them are still here. Adam and his kid Nathan relocated to Spring Meadows with Agnes and Anders and all their people, but the rest of the Texans are here in Bastion. They got this one guy, his name is Eddie, and he's a hoot. He used to be a truck driver and talks like one. I get such a kick out of him. Kevin does too. They're thick as thieves now. A good old boy from Longview, Texas, and an asshole army ranger from Southie in Boston. Who knew? 
Countless others are living in houses in the towns surrounding outside of our official protection. Without going into excessive and needless detail, we're now using all the dorms here, and they've all been upgraded with wood stoves as well as fresh generators. I simply cannot overstate how much easier it is to get around and find things when the threat of attack by zombies is nil. Right now, we get more excited when we find a gallon of bleach than when we find boxes of ammunition. ch ch, -ch changes Moving beyond our refugee situation, we've increased our food production. Well, fuel production. Ollie has put effort into translating a large amount of our available farming area, especially that area outside the Bastion Walls, to growing soybeans. They have great nutritional value, and they are one of the more efficient plants to turn into biofuel, so Annie and several techs on the matter say. Ollie has zero experience growing soybeans, though, so... I imagine this will be trial and error for a season or two while he gets things ironed out. And he will. Ollie always figures shit out. In addition to the soybeans, the simple fact that we have all the farming land now available to us means we've expanded our fields. We've still got the hydroponics gardens and the gymnasium of the school, but we have to use the earth outside to build supplies. We planted a fucking ton of corn this year, as well as squash, pumpkins, zucchinis, lettuce, cabbage, cukes, tomatoes, potatoes, etc. Ollie and Melissa are also in charge of our beehives, kept just outside the back walls of Bastion, half in the perimeter, half out, as well as a robust sugar maple tree tapping program. We're an industrial bunch. Our barn here at Bastion wasn't nearly large enough for all our animals, too, so we moved the lambs and goats to the barn on Jones Road. Wild game is returned notably, and deer and turkey are plentiful. We are eating well, and are canning a lot, too. I think we'll have enough food to last winter, but with all the new mouths to feed, well, humans are still humans, and without zombies up our asses on the regular, we still deal with bullshit. I'd say every three weeks or so we're shot at as we move about. We've run into two small settlements that I'd describe as being openly disinterested, yet interested at the same time in any kind of contact from us. One is set up in an old junkyard, for no reason I can divine, and numbers somewhere between 15 and 30, and the other is based out of a fairly large National Guard base several towns over. Mildly concerned about their offensive capabilities, but they seem to keep to their own. Not sure what their head count is, but I'm guessing it's around 20. Their building isn't that big, and our recon shows they have fairly small fields for food growing. These two sort of enemies of Bastion are in opposite directions and are approximately an hour's drive away each. Both first encounters were nearly the same. We rolled in with our travel group of Humvees and box truck, or military tow truck, that's a H-E-M-T-T, -T, if you're curious, cargo model, and immediately warning shots came across our way. We stopped, took up defensive positions, identified the source of fire, and as we were about to return it, they yelled at us to leave, and we yelled back that they were assholes. Luckily, enough diplomacy happened at both incidents that no one got hurt, but we've been lukewarm to ice cold with both groups ever since. We send a small patrol to both places every month to touch base to make sure all is well, but that's the extent of it. We stay on top of our defenses, ensure that all adults are either armed or capable to use a firearm quickly, and God help them if they come for us. Our anger at them over their shooting at us has diminished, but our expected accuracy in the event of an uninvited visit has not. As I said earlier, our new people are from all over. We've lost ten of the existing folks from Bastion that you knew about, and we've picked up forty-odd more. As folks leave and encounter new people, they're spreading the word of Bastion and all that we offer, and some of those who hear of us are coming. We offer a considerable place to stay, and all you have to do is hold up your end of the work and avoid general douchebaggery. Heartwarming and shit. We haven't been able to get Gilbert's old ham radio up and running, no one here has particular experience with operating one beyond experimentation, and we've chalked his gear up as damaged goods. No other radios have been found to salvage for spare parts, either. 
Periodically, we'll hear something transmitted over the military channels when someone with a military radio gets within range, but the messages are fairly innocuous, and we have avoided contact thus far. Mostly, it's the group to the south as they roll about. Isolation can be a successful strategy, remember. What else? I've got a million things to write down here, and I can't quite focus enough to hit the biggins. No one has died here since April. No one. We've been lucky, beyond lucky, really, if you spend any time thinking about it. Babies. Farm manager and resident Ginger, Ollie and his wife Melissa, are pregnant again. They're due sometime in February, I think. Patty and Mike are trying to have a baby, once openly in the Hall E common room at night during a visit from MGR, much to my dismay, but the age issue keeps coming up for them. They're both on the downslope of 46 now, I think. Blake and Kim are expecting again, and their second turd hit the bowl sometime around Christmas. Abby asked me one day if it would be weird if she asked Harold to name their potential son Gavin. I told her that man deserved a child named after him, and if she wanted, I'd talk to Harold about it. She smiled, and that was the end of it. We'll see what happens when she gives birth any minute now. Two couples in the new 40 are due as well, one within a few weeks and the other in about two months. Also, my brother Caleb and his wife Sophie are expecting again. If all goes well, we'll be plus six more little bouncing bundles of vomit, poop, and tears. I mean that in a good way. I should also mention that I haven't heard anything from my two brothers in the Navy. Both were deployed or out to sea when the zombies arrived, and... I've kind of given up hope of ever seeing them again. It sucks. I miss Thomas and William fiercely, and I hope they're safe wherever they are. I also know that hope is foolish as they signed up for the military, and Thomas was deployed with his SEAL squadron in Afghanistan when this all went to shit. Back to babies. Michelle and I are not expecting, despite our attempts to the contrary. We stopped using protection a few months ago, mostly due to the fact that there is a rather dwindling supply of condoms out there. Michelle isn't getting any younger, nor am I, and we figure of all the couples that are out there in the world, we're about as good as any to have a baby. Mr. Journal, I think I love her. I can say that pretty comfortably today, many, many months after the whole Cassie thing. I think I was starting to love her before then, too, but denial slows things down, and if anything, I'm stubborn as fuck. She's smart and sweet and thoughtful and kind. I love the way she takes care of everyone so effortlessly. She's forgiving, and I need someone like that. Yeah, I love her. It's good. Not sure what else to say here. School is going great. The farm is growing things as fast as could be expected. Our cows are good. The chickens are laying eggs. There are no zombies around, and the assholes that are still living are doing a good job of not killing us at will. I spend my days working on building a large second barn here for our animals, making a second sugar shack for the maple syrup, and helping Michelle run the show. She's the leader now, and I'm okay with that. The barn I'm working on is near the first barn we built last year, and I've got a great tan and a lean body to show for all my work, and I haven't had either of those since my days in the service. We should be done with the new stables sometime in late October, barring inevitable setbacks. I said that's strictly for the jinx fairy. I'm on to you, you lousy bitch. It's not all bad. Finally. Maybe I'll post again soon when the urge strikes me. This was nice. Adrian. Desperation. Early July 2010. Afghanistan. Thomas sat up and rubbed the early morning shit out of his eyes. Once clear of sticky gunk and debris, he looked a few steps away at his partner, Glenn Torrance. Glenn was hunkered down at the entrance to the small cave the two men had been holed up in for far too damn long. The shooter had his body prone and looking downrange through the scope of their Navy-issued M110 sniper rifle. Glenn's body lay as still as the stone below him. 
Thomas did a quick check of his person to ensure everything he fell asleep touching or attached to was still there. All his weapons were in check and his gear in place. Once sure everything was so, he finally cleared his throat quietly and hailed his teammate in a whisper. See anything? Glenn responded quietly, keeping his body completely still under the slate and beige-colored mesh he was draped in. Fuck no. No living or dead my entire shift. Is that good news? Thomas asked, smirking. He fished one of their last MREs out of his small ruck and tore it open to make something to eat. All he really wanted was peanut butter or cheese with jalapenos. I don't know. The village looks empty. Creepy as all hell, man. Thomas spent a few minutes preparing his morning meal and consuming it. He did his level best to not dwell on their increasingly shit situation as he chewed down the packaged dinner. Once done, he pissed in the small water bottle the two men had been using to relieve themselves and set it down next to the other full bottles in the back of the cramped cave. The bottles would leave with them. When they eventually extracted from the hide, their presence would be lost to any but the most critical of searches. Such was the way of the Navy SEAL. I haven't shit in three days, Glenn. I'm starting to think these MREs are designed by people who make a living repairing torn open assholes, Thomas said idly as he wiped his body down with a barely damp cloth. Says the gay guy angrily, Glenn responded wryly. Look, my sexual preference has nothing to do with constipation. Just because I love the dick doesn't mean I want my asshole wrecked, Thomas said, grinning. Yeah, yeah, you say tomato. I say go fuck yourself. When do you want to take a break? Whenever. I'm not tired, just bored. Nothing has moved at all. My journal is empty, man, not one thing to make note of. All righty, I'm going to try to get someone on the horn again, see if I can wrangle up a friggin' miracle for us. <laughs> I love the optimism. Sadly, I think it's time wasted, Glenn said. The man finally shifted his body ever so slightly, indicating that the form was actually a living body and not just a paper mache statue with a radio inside it. Thomas got their communications gear fired up and spent some time trying to get in touch with their chain of command. No one responded. No one had responded in a very long time. The year was 2010. Shit had hit the fan on June 23rd. At least, that's what the two men had been told when the radio had someone on the other end of it. In the city and all across their AO, the dead had stopped being dead. Just like in a shitty zombie movie Thomas used to watch with his three brothers when he was growing up, the dead were sitting up and trying to eat the living. They had listened to men they respected over the radio as they described fellow Americans dying to gunshot wounds, then sitting back up and attacking their comrades. They told stories of locals killed by the Taliban or by their own forces dragging themselves along, their bodies decimated and dead, all the while snapping their teeth greedily at the living flesh walking nearby. The world had become a bad joke. He'd always imagined he'd be somewhere in America when the zombie apocalypse struck, not balls deep in a sniper hide in northeast Afghanistan deep in Taliban country, the shooter-spotter duo had been dropped off about a week prior to the world shitting the bed to keep an eye on a tiny village nestled in a valley. A high-value target was rumored to be there, and the two men were instructed to observe, and if they identified shady activity, they were to call in airstrikes, take a shot, or otherwise find a way to eradicate the HVT safely. A typical week in the life of a SEAL. The two men weren't supposed to be this far out for this long, though, their food supplies, long since rationed to a single meal a day, were dwindling. Their fresh water was already out, and they were gathering local water out of a stream to stay hydrated, and so far they had managed to dodge any major illnesses. Purification tablets were working as advertised, but they both knew luck would run out eventually. Fortunately, their tiny cave, their distance from the village, and the dead and dying locals in that village sitting up and killing the living locals meant the SEALs had used no ammunition thus far. They were both still carrying their full combat loads, plus a good amount more. Good SEALs can find food and water anywhere, so bringing extra ammo is the priority. Glenn and Thomas were good SEALs. They also appeared to be very alone seals. Nothing, 
Thomas said as he switched everything off. Battery life was a major concern, seeing as how they had no current hope for any kind of resupply or extraction. Told ya, we haven't heard anything out of any of the nearby FOBs. Kabul, Kandahar, or Bagram for how long? Ten days? No UAVs or birds in the sky for even longer than that. Our sat phone hasn't had a dial tone like ever. Dude, they're balls deep in a Romero storyline right now dealing with their own shit. We've got to figure out our shit, man. Glenn shook his head slowly in frustration, never taking his blue shooting eye off the scope. If anything moved in that village, he was not going to miss it. Roger that. Let's switch out, give your eyes a break, and catch some shut-eye. Glenn tossed the mesh camouflage off his back and crawled backwards into the cave interior immediately. He may only have been bored, but being bored was often worse than torture, especially for hyper-aggressive men that pursued careers in the special operations community. Appreciate it, brother. The two men exchanged positions and began their day the same way every day in the previous three weeks had begun. All righty, you want the good news or the bad news? Glenn asked Thomas, looking around their dingy cave with a less-than-enthused expression on his face. Let's hear the good news. I always like to smile, Thomas replied as he observed the village 600 meters away and below in the valley. Nothing had moved there since he'd taken over behind the trigger of their powerful rifle. Good news is we are sitting on a relatively large abundance of ammunition, Glenn said, trying to sound as satisfied as possible. The bad news? Glenn sighed heavily. The bad news is we have two MREs, no bottled water, and only 30 purification tablets left. Thomas let the statement run through his head for a few minutes before responding. So we start to starve in three days, maybe four? Well, probably more than that, but not long, no matter how you slice it. Glenn tossed the two remaining meals back into their rucks, one meal apiece. It seemed like a feeble gesture. What are the meals? Are they good ones? Thomas asked, fishing for more good news. Chili with beans and spicy penne. Upside is either one of them is guaranteed to clean out your pipes. You'll be shitting your entire intestinal tract out in hours. Fantastic. Maybe I'll shit myself to death and I'll come back as a zombie with shit-filled pants. Thomas said dryly. Glenn laughed. But if you see any of the dead ones through the scope, they've all pretty much shit themselves. You'll fit right in. After laughing a good while, the two men sat quietly for some time, contemplating their situation. They'd been in bad predicaments before, many times over, but never quite like this. We need to think about going into the village, gathering food, checking for supplies. We need to start heading to an FOB to see if we can link up with a larger unit, see if we can find any kind of help. We're a long way from home, bud, Glenn said finally. Agreed. Let's flesh out a plan tonight as it gets dark. With any luck, we can slip in under the cover of darkness and get the fuck out fast. Aye, aye, Glenn said, feeling some positivity return. These were men of action, and the thought of direct contact made both their adrenaline levels spike. Glenn suddenly became somber, and even without looking, Thomas could feel the man's mood shift. It was like the air had been sucked out of the cave. Dude, what's wrong? Thomas asked. I wonder how my wife is doing, Glenn said. Thomas had no good answer. Later that night, the two seals worked out a less than perfect plan. How many people were supposed to be in the village, Thomas asked, even though he already knew the answer. Eighty, give or take, Glenn said as he tested their night vision equipment. How many of them do you think are dead now, Thomas asked. Eighty, give or take. Right. When was the last time we heard any gunfire down there? Five days. Foreign change, actually. No vehicles, horses, or donkeys leaving on the road out either, Glenn said, cycling the action on his as-yet-unused M4A1. Both men would be wielding nearly identical weapons on this nighttime assault. Which tells us the villagers are either holed up or dead. Either way, they're still dangerous. Bite us or shoot us, Thomas mused. Roger that. Luckily, the few dead we've seen are slow-moving as fuck. 
and I think we could literally walk around them if we had to. Barrel strike to the temple and move along. We just need to watch out for getting cornered or surrounded by too damn many of them. We have a lot of rounds, but we can't afford to waste them. Gwen eyed the magazines the men would be bringing and hoped it was enough. Both would be carrying 270 rounds of 5.56mm ammo into the village, containing approximately 80 hostels. It would be close if they had heavy contact with the living. Right. Fortunately, if they're all dead, we won't have to worry about return fire. Just clumsy attacks from B-grade horror movie zombies, Thomas said, grinning as he watched the village turned mausoleum through the green night optics on the rifle. Everything is packed to move immediately should we need to retreat in a hurry. We approach through the ravine to the south, which we know is now clear of that one sentry, and we slip into the village near where the goats used to be penned in. We clear house to house in a circle, then move inward until the entire village is empty or we need to beat feet up here. Should we get separated, we meet at the original extraction point, right? Roger that. Sounds shitty, but good enough. I'm just hoping there isn't some kind of fucking pathogen we need to dodge. And it'd figure, seeing as how we didn't bring NBC gear on this. Oh well. End of the road either way, I suppose. I'm ready when you are. Copy that. Thomas and Glenn moved like ancient Japanese ninjas stalking their prey through the rocky, barren Afghan nighttime landscape. Both were wearing modified digital-style camouflage that blended them in reasonably well with the backdrop and saw using night vision equipment. Somehow, the two men found perfect and silent footing with each step, belying their size and the weight of the gear they carried. One man moved forward, took a position in cover, and motioned for the other to move ahead in a similar fashion, leapfrogging, as it were. At no point was either man not being covered by his teammate. The two men formed an incredibly lethal, silent duo. Thomas moved forward to the edge of a home that could have been built in the Bronze Age. This part of the world seemed to have skipped a millennia or two. The Navy shooter leaned around the corner tightly, giving anything looking his way little to no target. He scanned the alley for movement, and when he saw none, he motioned for Glenn to close on his position so they could start entering and clearing the dated homes. When Glenn slid up against the building across the alley, the two men exchanged a series of rapid hand signals, indicating which house to hit first and who would do exactly what when they got there. Mistakes in communication for professionals like these were rare, but almost always deadly. High stakes gambling with your life was their daily routine. Thomas moved down the alley toward the center of the ancient dying village and turned quickly to the building on their right. Without a moment's pause to prepare or hesitation from fear, he raised a powerful leg up and kicked the flimsy door straight to pieces, creating an entrance for the two men. He moved directly through the entry fearlessly and cleared it, escaping the highly dangerous space to stand in. Both men entered the small home with the barrels of their weapons and both eyes scanning for targets that needed a few holes punched in them. Neither man saw any threats in the tiny home, and when they exited quietly, searching both ways for movement and noise first, they left a chalk X on the wall next to the missing door. The only sound they had made the entire time was the door breaking apart. The house directly across the alley was their next destination. This time, Glenn took the lead instead of Thomas, though the door gave way just as fast. The wood splintered into an absurd amount of pale gray and brown shards as his boot impacted against it. Unlike the first home, however, this abode still had occupants— Glenn's foot destroyed the door and impacted the chest of a man standing just inside it. Barely audible over the wood smashing against Glenn's foot, Thomas heard several of the man's ribs give way with a series of muffled snaps. Glenn was a tremendously powerful man. After cracking several of the man's ribs, he spun awkwardly and fell backwards into the center of the home's main room, never once making a noise over the pain he should have been in. Both men knew instantly the stumbling man had to be one of the walking dead. Glenn's suppressed weapon coughed angrily twice, striking the man in the shoulder first and the side of the head second. Before he'd fallen from being kicked viciously in the chest, he was dead from the gunshots. 
Before the casings could bounce off the rough floor, Glenn was a ghost, moving along the wall of the central room like a camo-covered Grim Reaper. Thomas fanned into the room heading in the opposite direction. Both men engaged moving targets with fluid ease. Thomas saw a woman wearing a neutral-colored shawl attempt to get to her feet in the corner of the room and took no chances with her. A double tap to the upper chest out of his M4A1 put her on her backside and bought them a few moments to assess the room. Glenn's new target was a child approaching from an entryway to the rear and left of the room. Possibly it led to a pantry or a cooking area, but that didn't matter at the moment. It only mattered that the boy was missing his entire throat, was still moving at all, and he clawed at the air like a feral creature as he approached the two warriors. Glenn's weapons trained to the missing flesh underneath the teen boy's chin. He gently operated his trigger twice, sending both rounds into the bloody gap, severing the spinal cord and sending the child tumbling to the floor, permanently dead. Out of the corner of his eye, Thomas saw Glenn's killing shots and put a single round into the face of the woman he'd just knocked back. Her head snapped back with the bullet's impact, splattering a huge portion of the back of her skull against the wall. What remained of her head slumped to the side as her body flattened on the floor. In the green moonscape of the night vision equipment, the blood looked forest green and cast an odd sheen. After putting her down for good, Thomas felt movement directly to his right, against the wall of the small room that doubled as bedroom and living room. He sidestepped away from the motion just as a hand grabbed his boot in a tight grip. The sudden yank at his leg nearly sent him off balance and sprawling, but he kicked out powerfully in a crescent kick motion, putting his heel down onto someone's body. The impact of his foot shook the hand holding him free, and he turned, taking in his aggressor. On the floor of the room, directly in the corner, lay an old man. He'd died some time ago from some form of injuries to his chest, Blood was dried in streams that looked to be from stabs or bullet wounds. Either way, the elderly man with the ashen skin was grinding his teeth and trying to reach out to attack Thomas. Tommy jacked a single 5.56 millimeter round into the skull of the mummified old man, spreading the contents into the corner of the home. The entire engagement lasted less than 12 seconds. Shit, Glenn said urgently, slightly disturbed. Fucking kid's throat was gone. Thomas stepped over and took a moment to look at the dead teenager. Glenn, they're fucking zombies. They're apt to be missing all sorts of body parts. Man the fuck up. This is gonna be a long-ass night, and it's gonna get worse. Roger that, Glenn said, blinking the bullshit out of his mind. Let's roll. The sun's almost up. We've got maybe 20 minutes before we're compromised. Thomas said as the two men moved down a wider street towards a small cluster of homes at the far end of the village. They'd been at it all night, kicking in door after door, putting a final stamp on the life of this settlement. Glenn reached up with his off hand, lifted his NVGs, and wiped the sweat off his brow. His tactical helmet slid down on his slick forehead, covering the area he'd just cleaned with sticky sweat. The rising blue dawn gave them enough light to see without the gear, We've got three houses left. Daylight or no, I say we do them and then head out. At least make sure we've secured all the AKs in this fucking burg. Motherfuckers collected them like my wife collects my paychecks. Sounds good, Thomas said with a laugh. The two men trotted to the door of one of the three remaining homes on the flat fringe of the village. The trio of homes spilled out into the valley where steps had been carved out of the side of the terrain to both sides. It looked to the two Americans as if some giant had carved stairs into the mountain to make his ascent to the peak a little easier. Glenn booted the door in, and Thomas darted through the entryway, ready for anything that awaited them. The same as the thirty-plus structures they'd already been in, both men breached and split up, creating separate targets for anyone attacking them, as well as giving them multiple angles of fire. Fortunately, the home was entirely empty of anything, dead or alive. Taking a minute, the two men quickly perused the contents of the dwelling, searching for anything that might be edible or of use to them in this dwindling world. After seeing nothing beyond the usual, the two warriors turned to leave the home. 
Just as his eyes swung to the entrance, Thomas noticed a tiny speck of movement at the very corner of his eye. A dirty, small, ruby-colored rug had moved on its own. Something underneath it had been propping it up a fraction of an inch, and Thomas had seen it drop down to the flat earthen floor. He pivoted on one foot and trained the red dot side on his weapon directly where he'd sensed the movement. Glenn followed suit out of instinct, bringing his weapon to bear on the tattered floor covering. Movement under the rug, Thomas said calmly and quietly. Glenn simply nodded and approached the rug from the side. He carefully stayed out of the line of fire should Thomas need to open up with his weapon as he crept forward. Moving slowly and almost silently, Glenn tiptoed forward and reached down, snagging the edge of the rug in a gloved hand. When both men felt ready, Glenn yanked the rug out of the way, setting free a bundle of motion from underneath. A small female figure leapt out of a hastily made hole that had been dug out of the earth floor of the house. She flashed forward towards the door, clearly attempting to escape the room and the two massive seals that had just bashed their way into her hiding place. Grab her, Glenn barked, dropping the rug. Thomas took a massive step to the side, cutting her angle to the door abruptly. The girl sped too fast to change her course, and she slammed her frail body into the hip of the tall American, still moving at full speed. She careened off of him and collided with the stone wall of the home. The girl dropped to the ground, grunting in pain as she tried to recapture the breath that had been knocked out of her forcefully. As she collected her wind and her wits, Glenn crawled to her, pulling a pair of zip ties from his ballistic vest and binding her hands and ankles, rendering her harmless before she could try anything. Wow, that was a little random, Thomas said, letting out a nervous titter of a laugh. Glenn looked up to his friend with a grin. Dude, you just laughed gay, I swear to God. Fuck you, Glenn, eat my ass. Yeah, you'd like that. Glenn said, searching the tiny girl for weapons or information of use. She had nothing on her, sans a small knife that looked to be a few decades old. It was worn clean of rust from frequent use and was stashed in her waistband. Glenn pocketed the knife. Leave her? Yeah, we'll check the last two homes and come back for her. Let's do this. The two men sat in the cave as the sun made its morning trip to its zenith. The tiny girl rested in the back of their neatly organized cave, struggling against the strong plastic bindings Glenn had put her in just a few hours before. Glenn and Thomas poured over their hall from the village as she writhed on the ground, attempting to slip free. Glenn counted their haul of 762 ammunition for the pair of AK-47s they'd taken as Thomas looked over at the girl with pained eyes, wishing she'd just relax. The little girl froze, staring back at Thomas's brown eyes with blue orbs that shone like the day sky, even in their tiny dark cave. Thomas couldn't help but smile at her fragile, dirty beauty. Glenn interrupted Thomas's moment with the girl. We've got maybe two more days of food. That's assuming we keep the girl around and feed her too. Water is decent as long as our purification tablets hold out. I don't think I'm the only white-skinned fella in this cave that thinks we need to find a far better place to be in damn short order. Thomas broke his eye contact with the mocha-skinned Afghan girl and nodded, looking at the meager remnants they had collected from the village they'd watched over. The food they found was just as likely to tear their intestines out with diarrhea as to sustain them. Local goat grabs were always dicey this far off the beaten path, never mind month-old leftovers. Yeah. Do you see that old Nissan pickup in the lean-to against the little hut on the far side of the town? If it works, and there's a little fuel, we might make it out of the valley and towards an FOB. We aren't that far by vehicle. We could drive halfway and be there in no time flat. Glenn sniffed a tiny chunk of unidentified smoked meat wrapped in fresh cotton. It still smelled good, and he felt a smidge more relieved. Not too much between here and there either, really. Real question is, what do we do with our little guest? Thomas asked, trying to avoid eye contact with the girl. Somehow the girl sensed that they were speaking about her, and she sat very still suddenly, keenly paying attention to their body language. How's your pashto? Glenn asked Thomas. As good as my Farsi, Thomas mused. Neither man had a strong aptitude for the foreign language or its dialects in the region. They'd caught unending shit for that failing, too. 
Should we try Greek? I mean, it's just as likely to be successful, Glenn laughed. Thomas turned and faced the girl, and after giving it ample thought, awkwardly stumbled through a series of greetings in both Arabic dialects. The girl patiently waited for him to finish, then slowly shook her head in a sad fashion that looked very familiar for the girl. She'd said no to this before. She'd said no to speaking or hearing. The two men sat in the cave thinking of what her defiance meant when suddenly Thomas put two and two together. Oh shit, watch this. Thomas turned back to her and pointed to his ears. He then made the universal sign of no by slashing his hands slowly back and forth across one another, trying to indicate that she couldn't hear. The girl nodded, showing slight relief that the large man in front of her had so quickly discovered why she didn't respond to him. She's deaf? Are you shitting me? World is covered with zombies. We're stuck in the greasy taint of Afghanistan. We're running low on food and water. My balls are itchy, and we pick up a deaf, starving girl? Shit, someone up somewhere high is getting a laugh over on us, brother, Glenn said, scratching his head and laughing at their predicament. Hold on, Thomas said, as he pulled a long, thin stick out of the corner of the cave. The seal scratched out the Arabic word for hello in the dirt on the floor in front of the young girl. He pointed at it, and she nodded at him, finally showing a smile. Despite her yellowing teeth, her smile lit her face up, and a small bit of real beauty came through. Thomas grinned. We're in business. Let's cut her hands free and see if she can write as good as she can read. Glenn stood up and flicked his blade open, startling the girl. She scrambled backwards to get away from him, but with Thomas showing both palms to her and smiling in the most calming way he could, she sat still long enough for Glenn to cut the zip tie on her ankle. She offered the hands behind her back quickly after, and Glenn freed her fully. He sat down in the center of the cave, blocking her in should she try and bolt past them again. Thomas broke the stick in half and handed a doll half to her. He wrote his name and rank on the dirt floor and pointed to his chest, and she nodded. She quickly and adeptly scrawled a name in the floor, and she pointed to her dirty robes draped over her too thin body. She returned to the floor and quickly wrote out multiple sentences, spilling out a wealth of conversation in just seconds. It took Thomas a few minutes to piece her bad handwriting and misspellings together, but he looked to Glenn with a new confidence as she crossed her arms in a satisfied manner. She says her name is Raza. She's originally from Kabul. She's 14, and she wants to go to a village about two days' walk away to find her aunt and uncle. If I'm not crazy, I'd say her village is right near F.O.B. McPherson. Let's hope that Nissan starts up then, eh? Let's get packing. September 23rd, 2013 Abby gave birth this morning. Gavin Charles Parker. Cute kid. I could not be more proud of her. She's well, and the baby is too. Harold, well, the jury's still out on him. Adrian. September 30th, 2013. Hal and Abby are doing well, as is little Gavin Charles, He's the picture of good health when he's not screaming bloody murder. Fussy little baby. She and Hal have moved to the far upper floor of the dorm here, to the rear nearest the river, so they aren't bothering anyone. Well, so their little one isn't bothering anyone. While their attempts are appreciated, they have failed. The organic air raid siren they've brought into this world has seen to it to wake the dead yet again. My little sister Becca and her boyfriend Ryan, the ex-stoner, now head hydroponics gardener, relocated from the top floor to one of the staff houses far to the rear of Bastion's campus to escape, which was smart on their part. I bet the kid only sounds like a chained banshee that far out. I hate that I like Ryan now. As much as I love Abby and her baby boy, Michelle and I haven't gotten a lick of sleep since Gavin's birth. A few hours here and there, but it's been miserable for the most part. I slept far better when Kevin and Becky's kid Chloe was born. I forgot to mention that before, didn't I? Turns out the two of them got a wee bit busy on the journey here, and 
Becky arrived, as Kevin explained, somewhat pregnant. Baby Chloe has made Kevin a complete man. He couldn't be happier or a better father. He takes care of his little daughter better than he ever did me, and that's saying something. She's cute as a button, too. Looks just like Becky, thank God. We're taking bets if the kid winds up speaking with an English accent. Becky's from England, after all. The reason I'm sitting here writing is because I can't sleep. Remember that problem, Mr. Journal, when Ambien and Lunesta were my very best friends? Back when my dreams were all fucked up? That's something I actually miss, to be fucking honest. Not the meds, but dreaming. I do enjoy the fact that we no longer are restricted, read cursed, to dream only of the dead, but I miss my dreams of the white room, that glowing warm place where I sat around a table with the ghosts of my fallen friends, where Gilbert told me stories and kept me sane, where I learned about things I wished I hadn't. Now the divine or whatever has passed judgment on us and seen us fit to receive our second chance, I miss that element of uh, specialness in my life. I miss feeling it was real. I mean, I I still have my memories and I still know it all happened, but I, I feel different inside now. Better and worse at the same time. Like, Waking up after a night of heavy drinking and feeling better, but missing out on the fun. I think it might be that I just miss Gilbert. Curmudgeonly old fuck. I hope he and his wife are sipping Mai Tais on a beach somewhere in the afterlife. Of course, knowing him, he might be on a range pissing through endless crates of 762. Could go either way. I still dream of him, but it's not the same. These dreams are like watching old home movies projected on the living room wall. They're amazing to experience, full of the flaws of time and colored by feelings, but they're not interactive. I'm seeing him, but he's not there, not present. Eh, I'm tired, sort of cranky, and now that I've opened the can of worms that is my brain, I want to write more. I love watching Michelle sleep. Watching her chest rise and fall is so soothing. I love how Otis swishes his tail as he dreams when he sleeps between us. Sometimes he lets slip this little squeak of a meow, too. I imagine it's when he catches his little dream mouse or meets a fuzzball girl kitty to make kittens with. I'm also uh, a little nervous. Tomorrow we're heading out to the junkyard settlement to pay them our quarterly visit. We're bringing generic trade goods and meeting them at an open rural intersection that's most of the way to the junkyard, but safer for all involved. No elevated firing positions nearby, clear open ground for a few hundred yards, etc. Kevin vouched for it, and as you know, we'll have XPJs Ethan and Joel in the far trees with their rifles ready to take out anything that makes them nervous. Having gone so long without shooting anyone or losing anyone makes me uneasy about when my people go into harm's way now. Call me protective, call me paranoid if you want to, Mr. Journal, but I'm over people dying. I'm also aware that people die and there's fuck all I can do about it. So add baby crying to overactive brain and sprinkle liberally with pre-danger thoughts and you get the perfect recipe for shitty sleep. You'd think by now I'd man up and just get used to it, but... An old soldier does one thing better than anyone else. Bitch. That and worry. We bitch and we worry. The baby's finally quiet. I'm shutting this down and curling up next to my woman. If the urge strikes me, I'll write again soon. Adrian. October 2013. October 2nd, 2013. So something terrible happened at the scrapyard. Recently, too, I feel. No more than a week ago, I'd wager. Maybe a week and a half. AAR time, though no middle A. I guess if there's no middle, then there's no need for the first A either. Unless I'm just writing a report, in which case, this is just an R. After trip report? ATR? Fuck it. I'll call it my TPS report. I'm a fucking dolt sometimes. Standard rollout trip for us, shrunk by a Humvee, leaving us with one plus the HEMTT and a box truck. 
I rode shotgun in the Humvee with Kevin driving and Blake in the back seat. We had the saw on the turret mount. Mike drove the HEMTT with Rich, one of the mid-20 guys from Texas, and Eddie drove the box truck with Angela riding shotgun. Have I mentioned Angela yet? She's doing great. Her son Danny is too. He looks more and more like his dead dad every day. It's creepy to watch the kid develop into someone I saw killed during the end days. His dad was a good cop. Anyway, that meant we had a fairly small head count of seven as we headed to the podunk area of nowhere with the scrapyard dead center. We had a quick reaction force ready to go if we hit any trouble, but we'd be almost an hour away if we needed help. Not ideal, but things have been on a peaceful footing for a long time, so it felt comfortable. We went to our meeting place after the PJ snipers had infiltrated several hours earlier to their firing positions. After sitting in the road for several hours, I got the sinking suspicion something was wrong. Call it gut instinct, but I just knew something was up. They'd never been late before. I made the call, and we reassembled and drove to the junkyard slowly, ready for bad badness. Wilson auto salvage during the days before the end of the world was a home mechanic's dream, I imagine. You could pay them a fee to walk their yard and pick over their junk to find parts, or you could pay them more to find the part for you. If you were into fixing cars and trucks yourself, it was a great place to get parts dirt cheap. Granted, they were used, but fuck it. Used and working is always better than used and broken. The place sat on the side of a country route in the center of a pair of fields on opposite sides of the road. A few trees dotted the landscape here and there, but for the most part, the yard demolished a great field for farming. Like all smart business owners, Bart, that'd be the owner, had a ten-foot-tall chain-link fence around the whole place, and when the zombies got all bitey and shit, he used a forklift to stack up all the car wrecks just inside the fence. It must have taken a week to accomplish, but in the end, he had thousands upon thousands of pounds of car behind a sturdy fence between his family and the world. It would have held out an army. One without tanks, that is. Bart used a big flatbed wrecker to block off the gate. I wonder what his plan was when he ran out of fuel to move it back and forth. Anyway, the gate had been rammed down and the wrecker shoved to the side by something really big and tracked. The rear wheels of the flatbed had slid sideways the better part of about 20 feet, causing the wheels to leave curved sideways marks in the earth. Crossing over those smears were very clear tank tracks, and then tire tracks from several heavy vehicles, semis or something like that. Clearly a forceful breach of the gate. Immediately on alert, Blake got into the turret and covered the compound with the saw as we dismounted and started a search and clear of the place. Right after that, on top of the flatbed truck, we saw the body of the old man who ran the place, Bart, though he wasn't a Simpson. He'd been run through multiple times with high-velocity rounds and bit it right there on the bed of the wrecker. Near his body was a spent 12-gauge shotgun shell, but no shotgun. There wasn't much to search or clear. One large split-level house in the center, plus a large multi-bay garage, and then the maze of cars piled up in rows ten feet tall. In the field, maybe a hundred yards away, there was a burnt-out hulk of what might have been a really nice house. The fire was at least a year ago, more. Had to be forty acres or more of old cars and parts and metal racking in a fenced-off field. Crazy. Outside on the grounds, we found three dead German shepherds. Junkyard dogs, clearly, but not feral. They had collars and were clean. Someone's pets. They had been shot a couple times each with something small caliber. Pistols, or maybe 5.56. Five, Couldn't tell. I'm going on record and saying that the owners didn't pull the trigger on them. I think if the dogs had been shot by their owner, the shots would have been to the head, at very close range. These shots were at distance to the torso, almost without exception, and that tells me strangers shot them at range. I hate to see dead animals, even dogs. These three hadn't bitten my crotch, so I still had some love for them. I can't handle animals dying. Gore and human adult suffering, no problem. Hurt puppy or kitten, and I either fly into a rage or break down into a blubbering mess. Sometimes both. Not too far from one of the dog bodies, we found old blood heading into a rear entryway of the house. The home was a split ranch built on a rise with an entry-level basement in the rear. 
The blood ran across a small patio to the slider and got more pronounced as it got closer to the door. The slider itself was closed, and through the glass and vertical blinds, Kevin and I saw the body of a woman and a man on a 70s green shag carpet. Well, most of it was green still. A lot of it was red-brown from bleeding. A lot of it. Now, back when the undead were a problem, these two might have been upright and ready to kill us, teeth snapping shut over and over, dead white eyes scouring the world around them for a living thing to kill. But not anymore. Now, dead bodies stay dead, and we worry about the living person who made them dead. Major change of gears. I pulled the slider open as Kevin covered me through the glass. Once past the blinds, the smell hit me in the face. Do I need to remind you, Mr. Journal, how much a dead body stinks? How about one in a small space? Oh, god-awful. The man was face down on top of the woman who was on her back and had multiple entry wounds to her stomach and legs based on the spread of blood on her clothes. At least four hits if you counted them from the blooms of blood. The guy had been done execution style. He had a single gunshot wound to the face and a notable amount of damage to the back of his head, as you'd imagine. He went quick on top. She went slow on the bottom. I'll slowly back away from the obvious yet tasteless joke. Were I a betting man, she'd been shot outside and made it into the basement, whereas he'd been shot inside and fell atop her as if he might have been protecting her. I didn't need to check for pulses. There's a certain point where you just know someone's dead. Missing a face and brain is part of that assessment, like fourth or fifth on the list of things to look for. Kevin and I swept the silent house's basement first, then the upper level. It had been ransacked top to bottom, though we found no other blood or bodies. A secondary sweep showed that whoever tossed the joint took everything worth taking. I suppose there's a chance it had been gone over twice, but very clearly whoever had been there before us left nothing. Even the garage was cleaned out, minus the lifts installed into the bay and the shitty nicotine-stained wood paneling covering the walls. Shortly after that, we searched the nearby fields for bodies or people hiding and found nothing. We spent an hour searching for clues or signs to tell us more about what happened. Other than a fourth German shepherd returning alive and a shitload of spent 5.56mm casings in the road, a little bit of blood in the road as well, and a shitload of bullet pockmarks on the wrecker and house, we found zilch. The dog was initially angry and distrustful, but... Eddie sweet-talked the pooch, and eventually she came over all gentle and loving, distressed but calm. She had a name tag, Jazz. The other dead animals were Warrior, Hornet, and Rocket. NBA team names. Strange, but I suppose that's more original than Fido, Spot, or Lassie. So, pretty obviously, there's something at work here. Whoever hit these people hit them fucking hard, coordinated with a high round count of military issue 556. If you're curious, we picked up the brass for reloading. Yeah, so whoever did this had a shitload of guns, many, many rounds to send through them, and to top it off, they have some kind of tracked vehicle. The genius in me has been lying since we left there, saying they had a bulldozer, Arian, Nothing to worry about, my friend, just a good old piece of farm equipment repurposed into something aggressive for raiding jobs. Just some John Deere or Caterpillar bullshit. Then I remember Kevin tossing me one of the 50 cal casings we found in the road. At that point, my lying genius inside says, No worries, Adrian, nothing to see here. It's just some rich gun enthusiast who owns a Barrett. Nothing to see here, move along, fight back the tears, kid. I should make a note that at this point I'm calling the genius in my head an idiot because a Barrett all on its own is a huge problem for anyone that isn't surrounded by military-grade vehicle armor. Then I remember Kevin handing me a small number of belt links, clearly designed for 50 cal belt-fed ammunition. Kevin said, I found these on the right-hand shoulder, Fell off, ran down the right side of the vehicle the 50 cal was mounted on. Whoever these people are, they have a ma deuce. Kevin shook his head and walked away, notably unhappy. I won't go into the breakdown of a Browning M2 heavy machine gun beyond saying, it puts really large holes in things at a fast rate very far away. 
This is a very bad thing for us. Some guns, when they're fired at you, are really just saying, seek cover. Something firm between you and me will protect you. The M2 says, fuck you and your cover. In fact, I'll fuck you with your cover. I'm serious. This gun puts holes in airplanes and liquefies people when they're hit by it. It's a serious escalation of threat. It's also an incredibly rare weapon in the private market, which means we're dealing with someone who has military-issued weapons, made more evident by the military-issue 556 casings we found. Now, the question is, who was the bad guy here? Was Bart the villain, or was the person who rolled up in the tank with the Browning the bad guy? Did Han shoot first? Hard telling, not knowing, especially with the shitty re-releases. Team Greedo for the win. Buttholes are puckered, and we're unhappy. We've got a trip south to the National Guard base we're at a cordial standoff with within a few days to see if they had anything to do with the junkyard hit, though I doubt it. The Guard base to the south was primarily a civil affairs unit, as I recall, and they wouldn't have had that kind of hardware on hand. That means we have a variable in the region that's acting up. New actors in the play fuck up the script. Abby's baby is cute, sleeping better now, too. Crashing. Adrian. Junkyard Dogs. Comfortable warmth infused the sun soaked afternoon. How long until those people from the school get here? Barton asked Jay in a wheeze. Bart's lungs had been shit ever since they lost their house to the fire and subsequent pneumonia he caught the first winter after the dead got hungry. That had been a rough stretch. Bart's son Jay had escaped the house's inferno with his lungs intact, but he had a patch of scar tissue on his back the size of a turkey platter and equally sized pain to match it. Jay had the good looks Bart used to have, but no woman to spoil with them. Jay peeled off his Expo's baseball cap in the mid-September warmth of the automotive junkyard the family owned and wiped his brow. Today's the 28th, Dad. They were supposed to come back to visit and try trading on October 1st. 30 days in September, right? Bart asked as two of the family's six German shepherds came running over, happily bouncing and pouncing, chasing a ratty old tennis ball through the dirt. Make it last, boys. I don't think the tennis ball factory's in business anymore. Yep, Jay said as he took the ball from one of the dogs and hurled it past a row of salvaged automobiles. The dogs bolted after the little green ball. Selling used auto parts had been the family business prior to... What am I forgetting? Bart asked as he sat down on a stump that had been worn flat and smooth from years of customer asses taking a break from their parts searches on top of it. We have two days until the people from the north come visit, Jay said, watching the dogs race to get the projectile he'd thrown. He smiled with a sadness his father saw him try to hide. I hate those people, Jason. Bart's son looked down to his dad and looked at him with eyes far older than his twenty years. The wisdom in his son's eyes hurt the old man. I hate them too, but... There ain't a whole lot we can do about them other than leave and go far away. That's still an option, you know, Jay offered. We can find another safe place for everyone. There's enough gas left over for us to make a hundred miles at least. We pack everyone up, Mom, you, me, Sharon, and the others can stay or follow. No shame in- Stop it, Jay, Bart said with a wave of his hand. He reached into his shirt pocket with the hole in it and fished out his pack of cigarettes. It was near his last. He lit it with an old Bic lighter that still had juice in it and took a drag on the stale thing. The process soothed him. He handed the cigarette to his son, and Jay did as his dad did. Dad, they are fucking crazy people, not like those folks from the school. I know you don't like them, but you don't like anyone. Those fuckers from up north, though, every time they come down here, they got more and more demands. And the last time they came, we only barely had what they wanted— what do they want in two days, Dad, and what happens when we can't pony it up? Bart took the cigarette back and looked over his shoulder where the dogs were playing, ball found. 
He looked beyond them and saw the burnt down garage and house in the field. The house sat rotted away in the summer heat, skeletal and charred, a remnant of a life lost. Inside the usable structures on the junkyard land were the nine other people who lived with them, 13 total, family and friends all. I can't just leave these people. This is my home, Jay, our home. God, you're stubborn. Dad, if these people come in here, they're going to annex us, take this land and all that we fought for while the zombies were around and leave us with nothing. Best case scenario, they evict us. Worst case, they relocate us against our will like fucking refugees in a war zone. Worst case, they shoot us like criminals, Bart said, taking a drag and passing the butt back to his son. Jay tugged on the cigarette, shaking his head almost angrily. He exhaled the smoke as he talked. According to what law exactly? They have no right to do that to anyone. This is still America, Dad. Bart coughed and spat a gummy wad of green phlegm into the dirt. Autumn always did that to his sinuses. Not so much. No police, no government to speak of, no pledge of allegiance. We live on land formerly known and governed as the United States, but in no shape or form are we protected by the laws we used to live under. These men and women think that because they were the National Guardsmen before, they can run whatever they want, however they want. And son, they have the guns to enforce that belief. Might makes right in the new world, Jay. Jay spat into the dirt the same as his dad and finished the cigarette off. He flicked the filter into a stack of crushed cars that they had arranged to form an impenetrable wall that surrounded the chain-link fence of the junkyard. The car wreckage had served them well against the hordes of undead, but Jay wondered if it would stop men with big guns, Humvees, and intelligent purpose. I suppose. I just don't like the idea of these people. I like nothing about them. They keep selling the idea of moving up to the mountains where their ski resort turned fortress is, and each time it sounds less like a suggestion and more like a threat. I agree, Bart said. How's this for an idea? How about we send some folks away before they visit? Jay looked at his father, confused. How so? What would that achieve? We pack up, say... Half the group and send them over the hill to the south, towards the direction of the school people. It's safe that way, I think. I at least like that big fellow with the shitty haircut and the tattoos more. Have our little scouting party scrounge up some supplies or just take a break away from here. The rest of us stay behind to meet the soldiers. If anything shady goes down, at least some of us will get away. Who stays and who goes? Jay asked. I'll remain behind with your mother and whoever wants to stay put. You leave with your sister and whoever wants to go for a jaunt in the country. If anyone asks what we're doing, then you can explain it easy enough, Bart explained. You stay out until after the meet. Come back in a couple of days after they leave. What happens when they ask where everyone is? Jay probed. Bart shrugged and chewed on the idea. His eyebrows popped up. If they ask, the easy answer is I tell them you're out looking for food and supplies. I could tell them some of us left for greener pastures, but if they came back and saw the people returned, we'd be caught in a lie. Jay nodded, seeing the logic in his father's idea. Sounds good. Truth is good, even to assholes. We haven't been out scrounging in a long time, I think a trip to that cornfield between Westfield and Smithville should do the trick. The corn's got to be about right for picking if the animals have left us any. Sugar and butter in that field. There you go. We don't got much time to plan it all, though. What'd you say, uh, a day before they get here? Jay shook his head. Not tomorrow, but the next day. Bart stood from his comfortable stump and adjusted his ill-fitting jeans before they slid off his narrow hips. Perfect. We'll pitch the idea tonight at dinner, then see what people are interested. Pack tomorrow, leave early in the morning the day after. The northern people are slated to get here right about at noon. We could be on the road before they get here, sure. 
Jay said after a bit of thought. Good deal. Uh, what guns should I bring? Shotgun and pistol? Bart snorted as the father and son started the walk back to their garage-turned home. Bring them all. Why? Jay asked, confused. If they come here to kill us, no amount of guns you leave behind are gonna stop them from doing us in with their machine guns. So, Dad and I were talking earlier, Jay started. He sat at one of the wooden picnic tables they had brought into the garage bay to form their communal eating area. Eight tables were arranged in a random geometric shape, and Jay's chosen spot was nearest to what could be called the center. Mercifully, the room that had originally been a high-volume car stripping business had lost much of its industrial oil scent, and now only smelled like sweat and grilled meats. Tools hung unused on pegs and sat inside red chests, waiting for the day when they'd be called to duty again. Jay continued, and we think that a food run a couple towns over might be a good idea before it gets warmer. At his feet, the dogs peacefully shared a series of bowls filled with large chunks of dry dog food. If there was anything to be found in abandoned country houses, dog food was it. His teenaged sister Sharon, who looked just like Jay and Sharon's mom, right down to the mousy brown bob haircut and the spattering of freckles on all of her exposed skin, looked at him and then their father. Why now? We still have weeks before the weather turns. Their father answered her as she stuffed another bite of cooked venison into her mouth. Remember that old corn farm between Smithville and Westfield? The one on the right side of the road near that brook and tiny covered bridge. We were talking and figured the corn there should be more than ripe, and an overnight trip to gather some up would be a good idea. Hit some of the farm stands on the way there and back, and see if anything's growing wild now. There's got to be berries all over the place. Take the four-wheeler and the cart to carry everything. It'll be good to get out and get the kids some fresh air. Bart pointed his fork over to the Cahill kids, Emma and Aubrey, tomboys with corn silk hair both. Bart had joked to his wife late at night more than once that they didn't need two girls who thought they were boys. They needed two girls who thought they were girls. Real girls, not girls pretending to be boys. But then again, in this world, having female traits was often associated with vulnerability and weakness. I guess some things never change. Daddy Cahill seemed to approve. Frank replied, I think it's a good idea. Plus, aren't the assholes from the ski place up north coming soon? I wouldn't mind being scarce when they come around. Sharon's eyes popped wide like corn kernels in a pan. She looked to her father and older brother like she'd caught a kid with their hand in the cookie jar, and that kid was her dad. So that's it, isn't it? Really. You want to split us up in case something goes wrong with those people. Bart looked to Frank, then at Frank's two daughters. Frank, you mind taking the girls out for a walk? Frank knew the score. Aubrey, Emma, let's go see if we can throw some rocks at cans on the fence again. Daddy, I'd like to stay, said the older Aubrey, only having just celebrated her 11th birthday. I'm old enough to hear this. Frank looked at her and shrugged. All right, you remember everything for me so you can tell me later. The younger eight-year-old Emma, however, had already fallen in love with the rock-throwing idea and was scampering out the open garage door into the cooling September evening, replete with golden-colored light. Once she and her father had exited the garage and meal, Bart looked to his daughter with fatherly disappointment. Tact, Sharon. You're catching on to the idea is a good thing, but you're calling us out in front of the kids like that stinks. I'm not a kid, Aubrey said from her now empty picnic table. Her hands had bunched into fists at her side. One of the German shepherds plodded over to her feet and rolled onto its side. Yeah, you are, Jay said sharply. Stop it, Jay, Aubrey said to the older ex-scrapyard worker. No one is a kid long anymore. Jay was about to shoot her down again, but Sherry, Bart's wife, and his and Sharon's mother spoke up. Jay? Leave her be. 
Jay withered in his seat. Bart continued his conversation with his daughter. Sharon, you're going to have to learn one day that that big brain of yours is going to cause problems for you if you can't make it control the flapping lips on the front of your face. Like I've been telling both you and Jay since you were little, if you want to be respected, be thoughtful of what you say. Dad, you ran a junkyard. I don't think being respected was ever anything you were concerned with, Sharon said, her words intended to cut. Sherry stood from her seat beside her husband at the picnic table. Young lady, that junkyard put food on the table your whole life. That junkyard paid for our cars, your clothes, your braces, and the guns and bullets we've used a thousand times to stay alive the past near four years. Remember vacationing to Disneyland? If you want to talk about respect and your father in the same sentence, I suggest you do what he said and use your brain. Leave this room now. The teenaged Sharon stood and stormed out of the bay of the garage, stomping her feet and pouting. She shot an angry glance at her older brother as if to blame him for the words that came out of her mouth. Jay looked to his father, wondering why he caught the bad look. Bart smiled and shrugged. What could you do? Go ahead, Bart, Sherry said, returning to her seat. She scooped herself a second helping of cucumbers and vinegar. Well, the cat's out of the bag, then. Jay and I are thinking, with them coming back in two days, we should send a, a group out. They're too big and too well-armed for us to fight back if they come here with that on their minds, and each visit here makes us think the day when they choose to muscle on us is getting closer and closer. What do we do? Margaret asked. Margie, as she liked to be called, was an old and wizened survivor of three husbands plus the apocalypse. She was as pickled as three gin and tonics with lime a day over ten years could get you and just as sour. Let them come take our home? Bart nodded. Yeah, better that than them coming and taking our people. I have no interest in moving to their town to work for them just to get a slave's wage in some strange communist version of America. How do you know it's communist? Margie asked, sipping on a glass of sun-brewed tea. No sugar for her, she didn't care for sweets, thank you very much. From what they've said to me, they're hiding behind some sort of policy about the greater good in the time of war. Donate your steal, recycle, pitch in, all that. If you do all they ask, they give you a ration of food to limp by on, and I'd be willing to bet the fat heads in charge on that mountain eat whatever they want and do whatever they want all day. You know what they're calling themselves now, right? No, Margie said. The Northern Valley Cooperative, or as they like to abbreviate it, the NVC. Last time V and C were strung together, it was the Viet Cong, and there's some memories about those folks my uncles could share with you. Two letters don't make you evil, Barton, Margie said with a condescending cackle. Maybe not, Margaret, but deeds do, Bart said back to her. So we go for a trip, Sherry asked, breaking her husband's building ire. She was already on board with the idea and wanted to get others in line as well. Those who want to go and be somewhat safer while they're here visiting. The Cahills, I imagine, maybe some of you others, too. Jay'll be going, taking our guns with him. He'll be collecting corn and coming back in a couple of days after they're long gone. Should be fairly simple. It's only about twenty miles to the cornfield. Six hours worth a walk. Call it eight with a lunch break. Camp there, come back in two days' time. It'll be a nice little adventure. I can't walk six minutes, let alone six hours, Bart. I'm too old. I'll stay behind, Margie said in a shockingly unselfish show of good sense. We'd love to have you, Bart lied. That seemed to appease the wrinkled Methuselah. Bart's statement of bring em all as it related to the small community's gun collection wasn't much of a statement at all. 
They had been hit particularly hard by the undead due to the nearby presence of a retirement-age trailer park and a burning need for survivors to attempt to steal things from their junkyard without trade. In mid-September, on the morning of the visit from the Northern Valley Cooperative, Bart handed two pistols, two shotguns, and three long rifles to his son. He kept one pistol and one shotgun for himself, they had more firearms, but the ammunition for them had long ago evaporated into the air that was the skulls of the undead. Are you sure, Dad? Jay asked as the six people leaving on the food-gathering journey shuffled around in the road nearby. Bart laughed as Emma and Aubrey played tag in the middle of the road, smack dab on the yellow line. Well, traffic ain't a worry, is it? Yeah, I'm sure. Like I said the other day, we won't put up a fight if they get ornery. You just enjoy a long walk to the cornfield, pick some berries along the way and back, and be safe. I wish more people were going with you. Frank and his two kids plus Roy isn't much of a trip. It'll all be fine. Jay laughed at his father. Dad, if it was going to be all right, we wouldn't think this was such a good idea. Bart felt a swelling of pride in his son and gave him a hug. After patting him on the shoulder, he walked over to his petulant 15-year-old daughter, Sharon. She wore a fat backpack that sat on her shoulders more like a mini-fridge than a piece of hiking equipment, and she had a square set to her face that matched. Don't be so angry all the time, Bart said to Sharon as his wife moved to speak with Jason behind him. Sharon's eyes told Bart she wanted to be mean to him again, but that big brain inside her thick skull asserted some sense, and she held her tongue from the worst of it. I'm just not happy. Bart felt that earlier swell of pride get squashed by a wave of fatherly empathy. Baby, it's a hard world. Happiness doesn't come as easily as it used to. I'm sorry. I wish I could have done more for us to be happier than we are. Sharon's eyes were leaking with streams of tears when she looked up from the ground. She slid her skinny little arms around his skinny little midsection and squeezed. His ribs bent inward and he let out a whimper. Dad, don't say that. You've been great and this trip is a good thing. It's a good idea. I'm sorry I ran my mouth at dinner the other night. I didn't think. Bart kissed her forehead and squeezed his daughter tight. Sharon, there'll be plenty of time to think properly in the future. One dinner's worth of stupid is just the appetizer in the meal of life. I love you, Dad, she said to his chest. I love you too, Sharon, Bart said. A few minutes later, Jay and Sharon led the hulking brute Roy, as well as Frank Cahill and his two daughters that looked like boys away down the road. The two German shepherds happily trotted alongside, eager for an adventure. Corn was their secondary mission. Getting away from expansionist neo-nationals was their primary. Jay looked over his shoulder at his father as he dragged the chain-link gate closed and slowly drove the flatbed wrecker into place behind it. Jay followed the gold stripe in the middle of the road, one ratty sneaker at a time. Inside... He hoped it led to the Emerald City. Barton heard the heavy rumble of the military vehicles long before he saw them. That was the thing about the world now. A deathly quiet sat everywhere, crowding out the noises of the birds, which was the only thing anyone heard anymore, unless the people made their own noise. The world suffocated you if you let it. Silence frightened, and the only thing more frightening than the silence was the noise you weren't making yourself. The noise stopped Bart's blood from pumping. It made the four dogs still in the compound bark like the end of the world was coming again. At first, he heard the diesel rattle of multiple Humvees, coupled shortly with the higher-pitched squeak and rattle of struts or shocks or moving parts all manufactured by the lowest bidder. A few minutes after, deep underneath the military whine of the Humvee engines, Bart heard a heavier growl, something much larger and more powerful. The noise of the bigger engine came with steady rattling clank, like a pair of metal bowling balls falling down an endless set of stairs in concert with one another. 
He moved to the closed gate and climbed up on the flatbed truck he parked behind it. The choice of place to stand felt very theatrical to him, but it also made him stand taller than a man walking below him. When he saw the flat-fronted tank with the giant machine gun atop it, he knew the visit had a much larger purpose than trading for car parts. Bart recognized the beast. He'd seen tanks just like it in movies many times over, as well as on the news. He remembered that the back end of it opened using a ramp and soldiers would come out. Bart wondered how many soldiers this one right here had inside it. In total, three Humvees, two straight-body box trucks, and one rather intimidating tank stopped in the road outside his home, his sanctuary. The top hatch of the tank popped open and a man's upper torso appeared. He rose until he positioned his body behind the mammoth machine gun that sat atop an iron mounting. The man rested his elbow on the gun casually like it was a buddy at a bar. His lip was fattened with tobacco and he launched a fresh squirt of spit into the air off the side of the tank. The brown spittle left a smear on the road where Bart had hugged his son earlier. Bart felt offended, but hid it. Bart recognized the man, but didn't know his name. As he waved to the man who had just appeared out of the tank, he heard a metallic hum and watched as the rear ramp of the tracked vehicle lowered, and shortly thereafter, a half-dozen armed men wearing body armor and military uniforms spilled out. They moved with unpracticed military style to points surrounding the line of vehicles where they dropped to their knees and watched the surrounding world for threats. Bart hit a laugh as the dogs kept barking. Good afternoon, the man in the tank said loudly over the idling engines. I'm Captain Piccarillo of the Northern Valley Cooperative. Piccarillo, that's familiar. He wasn't a captain last time. Good afternoon, Captain. It's good to see you and your people again. Did you get a promotion? I remember you, but don't recall your rank. For whatever rank is worth when a bunch of assholes sit in a room and hand out titles to each other. The man spit again and nodded. Yes, sir, thank you. I was lieutenant last time we visited. Bart hated how small and dark the man's eyes were. His dark hair, dark eyes, and olive skin told Bart the man had to be Italian or Latin in heritage and no more than 30. The last name served as a dead giveaway as well. He had nothing against Italians as a rule, but this man seemed tiny and angry, like a rat who'd been left in charge of the cheese for too long. Congratulations, then. What can we do for you today? This is a welfare assessment, Bart. Your name is Bart, correct? Captain Piccarillo asked, his voice still loud. Barton or Bart works. You can call me Mr. Wilson if you're wanting to be called Captain. Formality for formality. The little Italian man with his arm on the giant gun grinned and spat again. Mr. Wilson it is. Welfare assessment, you say. Could you uh, explain that exactly? Bart cradled his shotgun in an unthreatening way, but wanted to emphasize that he did indeed have a gun. It was a much smaller gun than they had, but still. We are now doing welfare assessments to determine the suitability for habitation and overall safety of people in the populace. If folks are found needing, we're helping them move back to the Northern Valley Cooperative Territory, Free relocation, guaranteed protection, work, and food. You think the Nazis told the Jews that? Barton posed. The captain straightened up in the hatch of the tank. Not sure I like your sense of humor, Bart. We're good people trying to help other good people by maintaining order and providing security. Well, I do appreciate good intentions, Captain. I'm happy to report that we here at Wilson Auto Salvage are doing just fine. Plenty of food and water, safe as can be. Nothing to worry about, Bart said with an air of finality. That's great news. Do you have a head count of citizens here? We're trying to establish a population count for resource allocation. What about medicine? 
Bart spoke skeptically. I don't have an accurate number. Somewhere between one in fifty. Lots of folks coming and going. We got enough medicine for the little stuff, but if anyone gets cancer, we'll call. Captain Piccarillo looked to Bart as if his patience waned. Mr. Wilson, please understand, we ask these questions and do these things for the betterment of all. For the betterment of the NVC is what you meant to say, Bart said, helping the younger officer. Sir, in the absence of the American government, someone must step up to provide security and order. We gladly serve, Piccarillo said in a voice that sounded anything but altruistic. Well, I do not recognize the authority of the body you represent, and while we are fellow human beings, I don't answer to you or them. I'm happy to trade with you and be civil, but you've no right to anything beyond my kindness. The small-statured officer dug into his lip with a finger and pulled out the wad of black tobacco inside it. He flung the loamy-looking material out and took several minutes to flush his mouth out with water from a canteen he was handed from inside the tank. Once satisfied his mouth was clean, he looked at Bart with clear and present danger. Look, buddy, I need to go home with answers or new citizens. If you don't give me the first, I'll take the second. How decidedly American of you. Bart said, switching the carry of his shotgun so his hand went to the stock where the trigger was. Two of the soldiers nearest and facing his direction pointed their weapons in his direction, though not at him. They had adrenaline in their expressions. Fear, too. What? America annexed the vast amount of its territory. Annex means we took it. Those who had it before, we simply defeated by strength or guile, and that's what you're doing right now. You're expanding your influence and territory by force. The captain had an expression of incredulity. The fuck you say? We haven't done anything by force with you. I beg to disagree, my friend from the North. Showing up here in three Humvees and a tank is a swing and dick show of force. You don't bring tanks to a diplomatic endeavor, kid. You bring cars and trucks and gifts to show goodwill. You bring compromise. This little dog and pony show was intended to intimidate us. Piccarillo sighed and looked up at the clear blue sky as if glancing at it would give him patience or an idea of what to say. Bart delighted in the consternation he was causing the young man. When Piccarillo spoke again, the Italian had reset his charm to pleasant. Look, Mr. Wilson, I am doing my level best to be pleasant and conversational. But as I said, I need information about your little settlement. If I can't get that information, then I'll... Simply order my unit here to take you into protective custody while I search your little scrapyard here anyway. And if you choose to resist us, Mr. Wilson, my men will respond with force. I didn't come here to hurt anyone, but as you see, he patted the massive girth of the machine gun at his side. We came well equipped to do so if needed. Bart's face wrinkled into a muted snarl of frustration, and he immediately hated himself for it. The look of satisfaction on Piccarillo's face at his displeasure gave Bart a hemorrhoid on the spot. His hand was forced. There are twenty-eight of us here. We have everything you can get for over-the-counter medicine, but we're out of antibiotics. That enough for you? Thank you. Now, what about your firearms? Piccarillo asked as the two soldiers nearest to Bart seemed to ease up. What does that have to do with anything? Bart responded back fast, irritated. We need to know what outlying communities pose a threat and what resources they have that can be brought to bear in the event a larger force action is called for. Good fences make for good neighbors, right? 
This question amounts to a nice, big fence. Piccarillo punctuated his word by drawing a long rectangle in the shape of a fence with his fingers in the air. We got two nuclear bombs. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Bart pronounced the word nuclear like nuclear and drove his wife crazy when he pronounced it wrong like that. He wondered where she was with the pistol. She should be in the house protecting the others. Bart's smart-assed response put a look on the highfalutin officer's face that gave Bart the impression he, too, had just gotten a hemorrhoid on the spot. Look, asshole, my good mood is about to take a walk. Quit being difficult and just tell me what I need to know so I can get out of here. Bart opened his mouth to tell the man in the tank to go fuck himself with that giant machine gun barrel, but a single gunshot interrupted him. Bart didn't see where the shot came from, but he clearly saw Picarillo's head snap to the side, bouncing off his left shoulder as if he'd been struck upside the head by a two-by-four. A tiny puff of red mist appeared above his head, though his skull stayed intact. He had been grazed by a round and kept his brain pan in one piece by the grace of God. Picarillo's head righted itself and his eyes blared in shock and betrayal. He screamed, open fire! And as he ducked down into the recesses of the tank, his hand went to the massive machine gun and triggered it, sending off a short burst of incredibly loud gunfire. As the gaping maw of the barrel smoked, he disappeared into the tank through the hatch. Bart had a second to act, maybe less. Had he been a few years younger, and had he served in the Marines like his father wanted him to, he might have been a bit faster to act, but alas, he wasn't, and he hadn't. One of the soldiers on his knee close to Bart lifted his rifle and squeezed off a succession of rounds at Bart, even though the old man clearly hadn't pulled the trigger of the shot that started the chaos. Bart felt hot, plunging pain stab at his midsection in several places, and he doubled over, dropping his shotgun. His belly button felt like a hot coal had been dropped on it. The strength in his legs left like the air from a child's balloon, and he collapsed on his face atop the flatbed wrecker he had stood atop. Several more rounds whizzed over his head, buzzing like wasps as he clutched at his ruined belly. He could feel hot, sticky blood running through his fingers as more shots blasted out, ruining the summer day. He rolled to his side and got the pump shotgun back into his hands. Jeez, sure got cold fast. Bart planted the stock against the top of his thigh and aimed it over the edge of the flatbed. He closed his eyes. That was easy, really, until they were slits and he played possum. A young man's head appeared with a rifle at his cheek, his eye behind the iron sights. Bart squeezed the trigger and the shotgun kicked hard against his leg. The soldier's head ruptured as a series of heavy pellets were driven into his face. He dropped from Bart's view immediately and the old man heard more snaps of gunfire. Vaguely, he felt his body move of its own accord as if someone were tugging the strings of his puppet. Mighty cold. He racked the 12 gauges pump downward, but lost the strength to bring it back up. His balloon was deflated. The world went dark for Barton Wilson, though he could hear more gunfire in the darkness for a few more seconds. Captain Picarillo stormed around his convoy of vehicles, his Beretta in one hand, the other holding a bandage to the top of his head as his seething frustration boiled over. Multiple trickles of red blood ran down his face and neck from the painful wound. He pointed his gun angrily in all directions, stabbing the barrel at the sky, the earth, the people with blatant disregard for safety. God fucking damn it. Fucking assholes. Fucking cunts. Who the fuck do these people think they are? Don't they fucking get it? We are the fucking army. Do as we say. Despite being the leader of the military-style convoy and the men and women in it, he stood the shortest of them all, and as he marched in their midst acting the fool, his subordinates hid laughter. He was ridiculous, a man who walked far taller than he should have and who yelled far louder than he had any right to, but he had rank and friends that mattered, and 
He had earned his two silver bars regardless of what they thought of him. Sometimes you tolerate an officer, sometimes you follow them. Who the glorious fuck fired the first shot at me? One of the specialists that Picarillo served with in the guard stood nearby. Picarillo turned to him. Specialist Rodriguez, do you fucking know who fired the first shot? The Latino soldier hated the captain and hid it. Sir, Sergeant Powers just said he found a woman with a revolver inside the house. It's the only other gun they've found so far. He shoot the twat? Picarillo said as a medic came over to swap out the bandage on his head. It would appear so, Captain, Rodriguez said with regret. Good. Fucking nut job. Who just shoots at people anyway? Damn it. I'm trying to do this as peacefully as fucking possible, and so many of these fucking people are wannabe patriots fighting to keep some shitty kind of lone wolf independence. What gives? May I speculate, sir? Rodriguez asked. Let's hear it, community college boy. Captain, I think these people are distrustful of government after the dead came back. I think they are all used to doing it on their own. I think, just like us, they have an idea of what's best for them in the world, and when we show up and tell them what to do with their lives and intrude, we look like the aggressor. You don't know shit, Picarillo said with a wince as the bandage came off his head. The wound was a furrow that ran across the top of his head, running in the ear-to-ear -ear direction. His hair would never look the same. The medic spoke over the distant sound of dogs barking. You're gonna need some stitches to close this up. I can do some here, or we need to move to get back home. You're gonna get a fucked up scar that'll ruin the part in your hair if we don't take care of this. The captain looked at the young male medic and scoffed. Let's get home. Boys, ram this goddamn gate open and take everything of value. Anyone here still alive gets zip-tied and brought back with us. He walked away towards the lowered ramp of the armored personnel carrier before stopping and turning. And someone shut those fucking dogs up. Many miles to the south, Pacer and Nick, Jay's two dogs, let out a series of barks to the north. Of all the people walking to the cornfield, only Jay heard the tiny pops of distant gunfire. The faint noise continued for a minute or two before abating, a few minutes later, he heard a few more shots, then silence. The birds began to chirp again, forgetting the interruption to their summer day. Jay wiped away the single tear that ran from his eye and started to think about what to do next. He looked at his sister Sharon, then at Frank and Frank's two daughters, Aubrey and Emma. Roy was closest to him, swaying back and forth like Frankenstein's monster, laughing as the two little girls hopped and skipped, oblivious as to what just happened far away. I suppose we'll need food no matter what. October 6th, 2013 It's not hard to stay busy, there's always a pile of shit to do around campus, and as one of our resident big guys, I'm always tapped to help lift heavy things, move heavy things, or supervise someone else lifting heavy things or moving heavy things. Heavy lies the head that has to lift heavy things all the time. It's like being the one friend with a fucking pickup when someone has to move. And now you know why I didn't have a pickup before the apocalypse. Been a few days since I wrote anything, Mr. Journal. It's a strange thing that I feel guilty again when I go too long between entries. I'm also fairly sure that with Abby breastfeeding, I think being a mother has grown her itty-bitties to a solid B-cup. She must be thrilled. And taking care of her son, she isn't writing in her journal, keeping up with the history that we're making here at Bastion. Sometimes I feel guilty that I passed on the responsibility of the journal to her, but... She's tough and smart, and my fatigue at being the record keeper of the apocalypse wore me down. I feel recharged now and am happy to write. We'll see how long that feeling lasts. After the incident at the scrapyard, we've elevated our security a bit. I hated to do it, but with the threat of the 50 cal and a possible tank roaming around, we had to. 
I spoke with our community leaders and we reallocated resources to the roof of the McGreevy Russell apartment building downtown in the event that anything came towards us from the east. It also helped that it is the highest elevated position for miles around, and controlling that position allows us to control town, or at the very least, it gives us the eye in the sky we need to see things coming and moving. Michelle, Kevin, Ollie, Patty, and Mike all agree that the incident was auspicious and that we had to act a bit more carefully. Yesterday, we had a scheduled meeting with the people who live to our south in the National Guard base, and as you can imagine, we figured we were heading into a very awkward conversation at best and a very ugly firefight at worst. Granted, that's like normal now, but the issue of our visit yesterday was exacerbated by the still unexplained events at the scrapyard. Kevin's long years in the infantry as well as with the Rangers, then working for the private military contractor Warden Protective Group, Anyone else realize the name of that company and think to themselves, just how long were the powers that be working on the apocalypse before they set it free? Led him to take a very militaristic approach to all problems. In this situation, it's hard to argue with him. Unlikely as it may have been for the base to have been the attackers, we had to assume that it was possible, and if they were indeed the attackers, we had to assume they could be aggressive to us during our regular visit. As a result, we rolled out south very heavy yesterday. Wasted fuel be damned. The Westfield HEMTT Mike brought over from his unit, plus Kevin's two Humvees. No box truck this trip, but we had our QRF of three pickups waiting a mile away down the road in the event shit hit the fan. Kevin, Blake, and myself rode point in a Humvee. Joel, the para-jumper, Clayton, Angela, and Danny Jr. rode in the second Humvee. Eddie from Texas and James Howitz from Westfield, whose ankle is all good after shattering it in the big school fire over there back in the day, rode in the HEMTT. That's a rogues gallery of ex-military shooters, or people whom I trust with my life. I might even trust these people with my money or porn collection, if I still watched porn. Thank you, Michelle. The truck had our second stringers, led by our other para-jumper, Ethan, Kevin and I figured we'd need them under tight supervision in the event we called for help. Ethan's shit is razor sharp, as you'd expect of a special operations guy. I should just go on record and say again that Ethan and Joel are both boss-mode badasses. Their medical expertise is something we couldn't live without, something I couldn't live without after being shot in the damn neck, and their paramilitary training has been priceless. And get this, they're nice people, too. The triple threat. After our initial standoff with the Southerners months ago that resulted in them shooting at us and us almost shooting back, we agreed that a neutral meeting point would be beneficial, someplace with no buildings or prepared fighting positions, someplace high so no one had an elevation on it. Nothing is perfect, so after talking with their leader, a captain named Maria Hunt, we decided that an overpass off of Route 18 would work, just outside their small town. No houses nearby, flat land on all sides, and the trees had been cleared away years ago during its construction. One vehicle each would meet in the center on top of the overpass, and everyone else would remain a hundred yards or more back. Each meeting would happen at one in the afternoon. Kevin drove our Humvee up to the center of the overpass, and waiting there for us was Captain Maria and her Humvee. Weird that there are Humvees everywhere, I suppose that makes sense with the bases getting raided and the higher likelihood that military people might survive longer. Captain Maria, it's good to see you, I said in as friendly a way as I could. As friendly a way as you can say while you're wearing body armor and have an M4A1 strapped across your chest. She didn't have a gun across her chest or body armor, but she did have a pistol in a holster at her waist, the same pistol her hand was on. To be fair, my hand was on the grip of my rifle, too. It's sad to say, but trust is earned with a gun in your hand now. Adrian, I hope you're well, she said back. Maria always looks at me like she expects me at any moment to start headbanging to metal music only I can hear. I could understand that if I had the mohawk still, but I let it grow out and just keep my nugget buzzed now. Maria's hair is short, I... Think she comes up to my armpit at best wearing boots, and yesterday she had her hair down for the first time. 
black shoulder length and hyper curly, like a Jewish girl on a humid day in Miami, longer than I thought. I'm well enough, thanks. Looks like you're still in one piece, I said. Yeah, we're doing fairly well. Crops are harvested or harvesting, and winter should be a solid one for us. We'll see what the weather brings. Ain't that the truth. Good for you guys, I said. Gasoline and diesel doing okay? We've got a good stash still if you're needing trade on it. We might need a few hundred gallons of diesel come November. The generator in the base runs on it. What would you want for a couple barrels? I already had a list from Michelle and our red-headed farmer-in-chief Ollie of stuff we needed. Uh, well, the big-name stuff like usual, antibiotics, bleach, 5.56mm, 9mm, horse feed, a male cow if you have one, table salt, size 14 and 15 men's shoes or boots, and pumpkins. We'd love to carve them up with the kids and then make pies. Maria laughed at that. Well, we could probably scrounge the shoes, the horse feed, the cow, and the pumpkins. There's a farm on the west side of town that has a pretty good-sized pumpkin patch still. We'd need more than two barrels of diesel, though. Can you do three? If I bring my farmer guy and if he says the cow is a good stud for us, I can do three, I said back to her. Sold. Next month, then. Actually, later this month, if you want the pumpkins for Halloween. Meet on the 25th? Her hand came off the pistol, which I took to be a sign of her comfort. My hand didn't come off my rifle. Sure thing. You got any news? She nodded. Yeah, some radio stuff trickling up from the D.C. area. Maryland and West Virginia, it seems. Elements of government returning, bunkers opening up, that kind of thing. Fractional stuff, though, nothing centralized. No one I'd take orders from, at least. Sounds like there are factions fighting for control, the two-party system has been retired and replaced by something far worse. Also, a handful of people asking about you. Me? For real? Yeah, by name no less. Bunch of folks heard about some stuff you supposedly did that helped end the zombies back in 2012. They're talking about making some kind of pilgrimage to meet you, to thank you, that kind of thing. It was my turn to laugh. Tell them not to bother. I'm nothing special, not anymore at least. Not anymore, huh? She asked me with a curious look on her face. Care to elaborate on that vague statement? Not really, Captain. Just a normal, vague kind of guy. Do me a favor and tell him to skip the pilgrimage. We got enough to deal with without people coming to pray or say thanks. Pilgrims eat food and drink water, and we need to manage what we got for who we got. I got a question for you. We swung by the people at that scrapyard north of here. Wilson's? You remember us talking about it? Yeah. Well, someone hit them pretty hard and cleaned them out. We found a handful of dogs shot dead, plus three bodies. I know they had at least a dozen folks living there, which tells me if there were survivors, they left after an attack or were kidnapped. You have any idea who might have done that? She shook her head. None. Wasn't us. I pressed. Whoever did it had military hardware. We found 556 all over the place and some 50 cal, too. Belt-fed 50. There were some tank tracks in the driveway. You sure you don't know anything? Her hand went back to the pistol on her hip. I guess she didn't feel comfortable anymore. Are you accusing us, Adrian? I don't appreciate the implication. I'm not. I apologize. But in this neck of the woods, Maria, there are very few people with access to tanks or 50 BMG. You guys are guard, Westfield's base is cleaned out and abandoned with everything there under our control, and well, that leaves the bigger base up north in the mountains, Maria said without hesitation. I'd forgotten about them. You remember them, Mr. Journal? The group of guardsmen that set up some kind of municipality at a ski resort, a couple hours drive north past the city. We took in a bunch of people from the north who ran from them before March when the zombies were all still up in ornery. Lindsay came from the north with her little kid that wound up dying when we had that terrible flu outbreak. Oh, what's their name? The people we took in that brought the flu in. They were from the north, too. Jackie and Warren and... Danielle. I had to ask Michelle downstairs. She's better with names than me. Anyway, they came back down from the north telling us about this ski resort that had been taken over by a large National Guard unit. 
They had asserted control over the biodiesel facility there, and using their fuel production assets, base equipment, and training, they'd created a fiefdom, or whatever you want to call it. They'd forced people into what sounded like servitude to support their little town, and it was their way or the highway. We never crossed paths with them. Yet. The Wilson Auto Salvage Wreckage fits their M.O. to a T. <laughs> M.O.A.T. Moat. Simple things amuse me. Back to the subject at hand. The Northern Guard Base and their reportedly despicable action fits this, and it makes sense in my head. Go with your gut, right? What I don't like is that I can't think of a damn thing we can do about it. If they have a tank and 50 caliber Browning machine guns and theoretically endless amounts of fuel to drive said tank and guns around, there's precious little we can do about it. Lay low, don't look like an easy target if they come by. When Kevin and crew made the trip across the Atlantic trying to find the mythic third person in the Trinity, that's me, Mr. Journal, if you forgot, they managed to appropriate a large supply of military hardware from the air base at Mildenhall, England. We have a small number of AT-4 anti-tank weapons remaining, and that's a huge asset we can bring to bear, but as powerful a weapon as they are, they can't scratch the paint on an Abrams main battle tank. I can't recall exactly the tracked footprint of an Abrams, but I'd be willing to bet my left nut, that's the big one, so you know I'm serious, and that the tracks we saw at Wilson's didn't belong to an Abrams. Track pattern was too narrow, going on gut. If they have APCs, then the AT-4 warhead can take them down, though that'd be a fight I'd like to avoid. We'll see if that's a fight they want to avoid. I don't think they know we have the heavy weaponry we do, and that again is an asset. I also don't think they know that we can probably make some of our own IEDs to go at the bottom armor of their vehicles. Let them underestimate us. <laughs> I'm getting so far ahead of myself here. Maria and I were still standing there, sort of looking at each other awkwardly, the news sitting in the air like a fart in a car with the window rolled up. I had to say something to make peace with her. I've heard bad things about those people. I'm worried they're expanding if it's them. That's a possibility. We've heard bad, too. People who left the more urbanized southern parts to head north to the woods got caught up in their bullshit— they gathered up all the salvage and forced people to work to earn their own food back. That's not cool. That won't fly with my people, I said to her. Mine either. If you hear more, will you keep us informed? I nodded at her, looking around at the distant woods, suddenly concerned with what I couldn't see in the trees. Absolutely. If you hear or see anything, keep me informed as well, please. All right. Let's plan on meeting back up here at 1 on the 25th. She took her hand off her pistol and extended it to be shook. I took my hand off my M4A1 and shook hers. It was the first time we'd shaken hands, and it felt good. Everyone departed with no shots fired or trouble raised. A great meeting by all accounts, despite the potential revelation of a very large threat not that far away. I think we might have crossed them off as potential enemies, and that's a big win. Kevin and I talked about it the entire way home. Not a lot of good was said. I'm gonna take a few days to think this over and formulate a plan of some kind. A contingency at the very least, should they start knocking on our door. Adrian October 8th, 2013 I hadn't set out to write this often when I cracked this laptop open a few weeks ago, but life conspires against the plans of those living it, and here I am, writing about that life. My life. Clarity is something that often evades us. That fact has only gotten worse since June of 2010 when society collapsed and the undead began to cull the herd. Trying to obtain facts when leaving your fortified house could cost you your life, and that meant you chose ignorance every time. It's better today now that the undead have fallen, but still, there are precious few ways to get clarity. This morning, we got really lucky and got the answers to a few questions. 
As part of our perimeter defense of Bastion's walls and to beef up our ability to screen for people trying to find us, Kevin has operated and managed a series of patrols. For a few months, we used the Humvees, but after the Texans arrived, we switched over to using the horses. They don't consume fuel in the normal sense, and they allow us to take a series of routes off the road to be more efficient and harder to track. Typically, the patrols encounter a traveler or two, occasionally a group of people passing through heading north or south, east or west, nomads looking for family or the few people who are stupid enough to think that there are still resources left. We haven't had to engage any as hostiles, which is nice, but periodically we do have a moment where dick measuring occurs. They pull, we pull, they talk, we talk, and eventually they leave and we stay. It pays to have highly trained, well-armed, and patient people guarding your borders. Today, Kevin crossed paths with six people and two German shepherds moving on foot to the west side of town, Route 18, actually, the road that heads to Westfield. He was with Hal, our token black dude and British Royal Marine in exile, and Rich, the handsome Texan who most of the guys here hate because he's handsome. He's going gray a smidge early and has that whole silver fox thing going on. Good for him. The three men in our patrol encountered the six walking our way, exhausted as hell, and they waved, beckoned our men over, and told Kevin who they were. The leader, if there was one, said his name was Jay Wilson. He was the son of Bart Wilson, owner and founder of Wilson Auto Salvage, the same scrapyard we found his dad's body at, as well as his mother's and one other man's. Kevin knew I would want to talk to them as well as Michelle, so he called for a car to be sent out to retrieve them. They'd been on foot making their way for days. The cast of characters from the scrapyard was Jay and his little sister of, I think, 15 years, Sharon. She had enough freckles on her face and shoulders to make her look like a chocolate chip cookie. Her boyish, tattered haircut didn't help her look either, whatever look she was going for. Jay looked like his dad, lanky and long, hair that needed a trim. Must have been genetic. With him, he had a guy named Frank and Frank's two daughters, Emma and Aubrey. They had a spunk to them that told me they'd kick ass given time and opportunity, though their dad struck me as the kind of guy that couldn't see the bad in a situation if the jinx fairy flew over and shit straight in his mouth. I think he'd swallow it and thank her for stopping by and thinking of him. The last on the list was a dude that is easily the largest human being in town by a long shot. His name is Roy, and he is a solid head taller than I am. And remember, Mr. Journal, I'm over six foot. And he has to weigh at least 280 if he weighs a pound, maybe more. He's like Shaquille O'Neal, only white, poor, and awkward. I keep thinking of Lenny from Of Mice and Men. I plan on hiding all soft and squishy things for a few weeks until I sort him out. Jay arrived in the back of one of the old Auburn Lake Preparatory Academy vans, Miss Daisy style, with the rest of the crew, and Michelle accepted them as ambassador and took them into the school's cafeteria. We got them back to Bastion here at about lunchtime, so the food was already cooking, and from the looks of it, they were hungry. The two dogs laid low under the tables as their owners ate, I watched the humans eat ravenously as Kevin and I got our trays of food, then we headed over. I made a note in my head to make sure they got a few bags of dog food. I also made note to ask my balls to drop when I got away from the dogs. Jay stood up quickly, almost out of fear, and stood straight as an arrow. Roy, the hulking dude, stood up too and balled his fists. Over time, you learn to ignore that kind of posturing stuff, and I did. You must be Jay, I said as I sat my tray down beside Michelle's. I smiled a little. Not too much. Too much would have been fake. Plus, the dogs were nearby. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I am, he said back. I extended my hand and he took it. You must be Roy, I said to the behemoth. Yes, sir, Roy said back to me as he stuck his own hand out. I shook it, and he sat down, staring at the tattoos on my arm. Sometimes the ink says more than my mouth. You guys already met Kevin Witten. He's the dude in charge of keeping us safe. Has Michelle been treating you well? She's pretty good at treating folks decently. I said to them while winking at her. The chocolate chip cookie answered back. 
Yeah, she's cool. I'm Sharon. This is Frank, Emma, and Aubrey, she said, pointing to each in hand. I shook everyone's hand and sat down. You're the real Adrian Ring, aren't you? The one people talk about? Sharon asked me. I guess so. I'm definitely Adrian Ring. As for the talking about me, I try not to listen. I tried that once and only heard people talking shit. Oh, he's Adrian, all right, Michelle added in. He's the one, foul mouth and all, in the flesh, proof that we can live a better life on this earth. Kind of cool, huh? I hate it when she gets all preachy and prosy. I guess I should expect it from a woman with a PhD in theology that I'm in love with. I sure do hate it when people talk about me. Neat, Sharon said like a teenager would, that is to say, unimpressed. I'm sorry to hear what happened, I said to them. Thank you, Jay said. I heard you picked over one of the cornfields on the way here and intend on donating it to our stores. Is that true? Yeah, my father and I agreed to take a small group away for the time the NVC would be visiting. If it went well, we'd return with the corn. When I heard the gunfire in the distance, I knew the meeting hadn't gone well, and we started to head here. Smart. Gutsy, but smart. Why here? I asked. Jay shrugged and hunted for words. Well, my dad liked you more than any other choice we had. He didn't respect you because of your tattoos, and he had a hard time believing you were the real person so many think stopped all the zombies, but still, he knew you were better people than them. I think he thought you'd give us a fair shake. What do you ask? I asked him. About what? About me. About me stopping all the zombies. Jay chuckled. I don't know what to believe. I know the world is far, far stranger than I could have possibly imagined. You got that right, I assured him. Look, here's the big picture. I pulled the trigger on the woman I loved before this happened. It took me almost a year and a half to find her and do it, but when I did, the undead fell. We were being tested by the Almighty. Whatever you want to believe is upstairs was fed up with us and set the dead upon us to wipe the slate, but if we were able to redeem ourselves before it was too late, we got a second chance. Me shooting her and forgiving myself for my failings and living as a better man and rescuing people and doing good as best I could was enough to give us that second chance, or so I'm led to believe. The six from the scrapyard looked at me like I'd grown a third eye on the tip of my nose. Perhaps I said too much. I'm really awkward with talking about everything that happened. Enough about that. You're here, and I'm sorry for your loss. What's the NVC? The Northern Valley Cooperative. That's the name of the uh, government or whatever they have up there. We've heard a fair amount about them from folks who left their borders. I didn't think much about them after the zombies went away. Aggression by living people has almost disappeared. Did you see any of their gear? Kevin asked. Kevin would ask that. They all shook their heads. They had a tank? He asked again. It was an APC. Big boy Roy said with a certainty in his voice. We both looked at him a little surprised, like how you'd look at a goldfish if it started singing. Kevin continued. You're certain of that, Roy? Any chance you know what kind? He nodded. M113 APC. M2 on the top. Good condition. Gulf War era, I think. Kevin's eyes lit up with the information. An M113 is a problem, but one the AT4 can solve, and I knew that was what he was thinking. You're sure, absolutely sure about that? Yeah, I liked tanks a lot growing up. My daddy bought me picture books. I watched a lot of war movies. I know what most of them look like, Roy said, especially if they're NATO. Wow, thanks, Roy. That's really helpful, Kevin said. Beyond that, Jay told us that the NVC people had been trading with them the same as us. Each trade became progressively less fair, and each visit became more about encouraging the Wilson family and their protected population to move north to work with slash for the NVC. Jay's dad Bart wanted nothing to do with it, and it would appear the other day they pushed too hard and the meat escalated to violence. We also know that with only three dead bodies and six here with us, that leaves four people unaccounted for. 
for people who were, in all likelihood, relocated to the north, to the Northern Valley Cooperative. I think before the fall of the country, that would qualify as some kind of kidnapping. I'm not a cop or a lawyer, though. Either way you slice it, I don't like it. it feels shitty to me. The Wilson people are staying in one of the houses down the road from Bastion, outside of the walls near Gilbert's house on Prospect Circle, but still within our protective envelope and not far out of the range of our guns should they try something shady. People are always trying something shady. No one will ever live in Gilbert's home. I consider it and where he's buried to be a sacred place, and many others here do too, especially those who knew him personally. His sacrifice to keep me alive and fight off the influence of corruption has elevated him to saint-like status. I miss that ornery old fuck. Tomorrow we're having an emergency all-hands brain power meeting to figure out how to prepare for the inevitable visit by these NVC people. I'm hoping they've come as far south as they're going to, and whatever preparations we make are unneeded. But again, there's that little bad luck bitch fairy. She's like my fucking anti-mascot. Lucky for me, Otis is my actual mascot, and that furry little tub of cuddles has my back. Adrian October 12th, 2013. I'm back. Briefly, though, I think I've caught the flu. My guts feel like hot cement is being pumped inside it, and the creeping doom of diarrhea is only a sneeze away. I am on guard. The ninja shits will not ambush me this time. It's all made worse because my head feels like someone snuck up beside me and pushed an entire case of cotton balls in my ears and up my nose. I hate being sick. Michelle is making such fun of me over my whining. Anyway, in an effort to protect ourselves in the event of a full-on frontal attack by the Northern Valley Cooperative, Kevin and crew have spread out several caches of weapons, food, and general supplies. He's hidden them way off the beaten path beside stone walls and under large trees where we can find them, but where others wouldn't search. In the event we need to bug out of here, there are a dozen of us who will all know the locations of the stashes and can use them to rearm, stabilize, and fight back or flee. Defenses here at Bastion are largely unchanged. We still have our ten-foot-tall or so berm wall with logs on the exterior that'll stop anything short of a cruise missile. Our double front gate is still made of heavy timber and steel thanks to Martin, our resident welder, and Blake, our diesel engine tech and all-around handy dude, which was adequate for stopping most civilian vehicles long enough for our guard towers to kill the drivers and occupants inside. If you remember, on one side of the river we have one gate, then the hundred feet or so of the bridge, then on this side the other gate built into the berm wall. It won't stop an M113 APC, nor will our guard towers with their saw mounts and posted guards with either M4s or high-powered hunting rifles. With our arsenal on hand, our lone choice to stop a tank or APC is the AT-4. Kevin reported that we have five of the anti-tank weapons. Two have been relocated to ground-level structures near the front and rear gate in the event of an attack. It made some sense to store an AT-4 anti-tank weapon in the tower, but Ethan and Joel both pointed out that they can light up the towers with the 50 cal and destroy the weapon long before we can bring it to bear on them. But an AT-4 brought to the top of the berm wall on foot can't be stopped. One of us pops up like a fucking angry meerkat and whoosh, cooked tank. I hope we don't get to that point. We also need to really look into trying to manufacture some kind of IED to place on the roads as needed. Tank bellies are thin, and a little boom will go a long way underneath them. Not sure what we have for explosives, but Kevin assures me he's looking into the option. Not much else new. No word from the tower downtown, nor word from the factory near the city. Spring Meadows has been quiet, but that's a comms issue on our part. Andy, the electronic whiz we adopted from the original factory people, is still living there, and he's working on moving one of the city's police fire repeater towers to the factory roof. They have power there to spare, and a boost tower in that spot will give our radios the juice to travel almost 50 miles. 
That'll mean some of the radios we have can reach everywhere we call home. I think Hector said he and Andy and crew would have their tower operational any minute now. You know, the more I think about it, the more of a priority that needs to be. The fastest way to get from the resort where the NVC is headquartered is to go south on the interstate, then cut west towards here. If they took that path, they could conceivably drive right past Spring Meadows, then the factory, and we're at least 45 minutes away from either of those places should they need help. And shit, like I said, we aren't even in radio communications with Spring Meadows. Huh. Crisis brewing in the back of my head. I'll talk with Michelle and Kevin tomorrow and see if we can make a trip over there stat. It's time to shit. Turns out the crisis was in my bowels. Check in later, maybe. Adrian. Strange Bedfellows. Early July 2010. Afghanistan. Thomas turned the key of the filthy old pickup truck gingerly as if his sensitive, slow touch would coax the motor to life more successfully. He felt the starter kick in, but the motor coughed and wheezed a few times and then failed to turn over. Cunt, Glenn Torrance said disapprovingly from a few feet in front of the grill. Let me try one more thing. As Glenn leaned into the engine compartment to tweak the engine, pretty little Raza stood watching behind him. They were inside what an Afghani resident of the town at one point considered a garage. At best, it could be called a carport. The structure consisted of a few logs propped up right beside a stone home with a thatched roof stretched over the top. The material did little to protect the venerable truck from the world outside. Thomas scanned the outside of the vehicle shelter for anything moving. Other than dust, the land seemed bare. All the goats in the small pen outside had been destroyed by the villagers when they'd been turned into zombies and their corpses had long since rotted, their putrescence giving the air a heavy, rotting smell. Thomas felt strange thinking about the presence of the undead, like the whole experience was an overly elaborate, fucked-up prank some of his seal friends were playing on him. Seals did that, play pranks, Extra makeup left over from last Halloween and some highly paid Afghan volunteers, perhaps. Sadly, he knew that wasn't the case. These were real, painful, bloody, filled with all the dreadful sorrow of the dead, and as real as anything could be. The world as they remembered it before the deployment was gone. Try now, Torrance said, stepping back next to Raza, the young Afghan girl they'd found earlier that morning. Glenn towered over the teenage girl like a modern-day camouflaged knight standing next to a robe-wearing hobbit. Thomas laughed slightly at the mental image of Glenn wearing full plate armor emblazoned with the American flag and wielding a broadsword. Thomas inhaled deeply, gathering every flittering ether of good luck in the air and gave the key a smooth, gentle twist. The engine coughed, sputtered, nearly died out, and then roared to life, kicking out a huge plume of dark black soot and smoke out of its tailpipe. The stench of burnt oil and old engine wear covered the smell of the rotting goats. All three of the ragtag survivors let loose a restrained cheer of joy, Raza's cheer, tinny and wild. They immediately dropped low and looked around, fearful of the repercussions of their noise. Any sounds could draw unwanted attention of multiple kinds. The seals were very much still in Indian country. Of course, the sound of their yelling was half the noise of the four cylinders shaking themselves steadily into oblivion under the hood of the truck. Thomas popped back into the cab and watched as the fuel gauge slowly crept up, shaking like an arthritic finger until it came to a stop midway between the quarter and half marks. A third of a tank probably less. Thomas did the math quickly in his head, estimating low. I think we've got maybe 75 miles, assuming this piece of shit stays together that fucking long. Ready to go? Glenn had already started moving to the passenger side of the truck, pushing Raza in front of him so she could slide into the middle. After loading their spare gear into the bed and securing it, Torrance hopped into the seat and pulled the rickety door shut, Thomas slid the shifter into first, popped the emergency brake off, and engaged the clutch. They were off. 
The two SEALs and the Afghan girl made it ten miles before the truck died. If the previous owner had been alive to witness the adventure, he would have thanked Allah for the miracle bestowed on him. The truck had served him well over the decade he'd owned it, but there would have been no conceivable way for him to have imagined it making the ten miles Thomas coaxed out of it. When the Nissan finally went to the grave on the side of a washed-out dirt road at the bottom of a steep valley, it was belching smoke and flames from the hood, and the trio of mismatched companions had to run from it down the dirt-packed road towards their destination. Dark black smoke billowed into the sky. Thomas felt as if the smoke resembled black blood drifting in sky-blue water. Neither of the seals felt like the trip the truck had managed was in any way miraculous. The sun baked down from above, strangling the sweat from their bodies. The salty streams ran in thick rivulets down their faces and backs, soaking their clothing. Their position in the valley also made both warriors incredibly uncomfortable. To be out in the open and exposed on the road with elevated positions on all sides. A month prior, doing this would have been an invitation to the Taliban to either hit them with a mortar repeatedly or to invite small arms fire. Precious little cover could be found in the alternating ravines and flat expanses they were traversing. It felt like suicide just walking. After talking to Raza using a small notebook during the walk, Thomas reasoned that they were about three miles on foot from the small village she had wanted to visit. Her aunt and uncle lived there, and she very much wanted to see them, to see if they were alive. Glenn and Thomas checked their AO maps, and if all were accurate... Then the village was only three miles from a small U.S. Army forward operating base in the hills. The FOB was intended to be an observation post for the valley and Raza's family village. Once they passed through the village and theoretically left Raza with her aunt and uncle, the SEALs would move on foot to the FOB. They'd reunite with U.S. military forces there and make a real run at survival, heading towards the closest major air base. The three stopped a thousand meters short of the village and took cover behind a few large boulders with a tiny hill to their back. Unlike the first village Glenn and Thomas had observed, this village sat in the flat of a valley surrounded by an eight-foot-tall stone and mortar wall. The edification had been pockmarked heavily with the familiar rosettes left behind by gunfire. The village had seen heavy fighting, and it looked recent. The only gaps in the beaten-up wall were at opposing sides of the town, and the only approach to either entrance was in the form of an elevated berm road. They'd be sitting ducks on approach. I don't like it, Thomas said as he peered through the ACOG scope he'd mounted on his rifle. There was no movement outside the walls of the village and no sounds to match. Typically, a village of this size would be bustling with activity in the later afternoon. Prayers should have been done by now, and the residents should be moving about, settling the affairs of the day. Silence could only be a terrible omen. Ditto, Glenn responded as he looked down the more powerful scope of the pair's sniper rifle. As both men stared intently, looking for signs of danger or life, poor little Raza sat in the dirt behind them, watching the two seals for signs of good news. Her damaged ears didn't allow her to hear the men, but... She was acutely aware of their body language and what it conveyed. Some languages transcended the barriers of speech. She felt despair creep into her as the two men focused on where she wanted desperately to go. Say we stay here until dark, then we move in on foot using NVGs. I can't see shit inside those walls, and with no eyes in the sky, we're pretty much blind to everything. I'd rather have the advantage of nighttime. I like it. Raza noticed the two men look at one another and exchange calm words. She took that as a sign that a plan had been made. Her heart picked up a bit as she felt relief and hope return. The relieved, dark-skinned girl turned her attention to the area behind them and noticed a darkness growing in the sky. It rolled up and towards them like a piece of the earth itself, a hazy mountain of thin earth swirled into a wave that began to dominate the sky. She'd seen it before, a sandstorm, an ugly one that would scour flesh and invade the lungs. Raza nearly leapt out of her dirty robe to grab Thomas's backpack. She mouthed words and yanked hard, spinning him off the large stone he leaned on. What the fuck, Raza? 
Thomas said as he landed on his back. He looked up and saw the panic in her tiny eyes. Thomas remarked to himself strangely how much the white of her eyes shone. The girl stepped aside, one hand still clutching a strap on Thomas's chest, and pointed to the storm barreling down on their position. Thomas, what is that girl freaking her shit over? Glenn asked, looking over at the strange exchange between man and girl. He couldn't see what the fuss was over. Thomas saw what her sudden anxiety was provoked by. Fuck, sandstorm, big motherfucker, Thomas said, getting up into a crouch behind the boulder. Glenn turned and looked back. Raza watched as the man's already pale face turned a shade wider. Holy shit, that'll beat us to death out here in the open. Looks like we're headed into the town under cover of the storm. Let's move, fast. Glenn got to his feet as Thomas took off. He guarded his pace to ensure that Raza could keep up, but Glenn did no such thing. Tugging a red checkered bandana up from under his collar and over his beard and nose, protecting his breathing from the gray storm that would surely try to invade his mouth and nostrils trying to choke him. The noise of the storm grew in intensity as the roiling cloud filled with harsh dirt loomed closer. Run, Raza, let's go, Thomas yelled pointlessly. She couldn't hear him. He waved her on, picking up his pace in the hope she'd match him, but her weak and underfed body with spindly short legs couldn't manage. She looked like she ran through a wall of water or into a headwind that had the best of her. Thomas stopped suddenly, spun his M4A1 to his side fluidly, and scooped the girl up without losing more than half a second. Nestled in the crux of his arms, he went to full speed like only an apex predator could, like a wolf chasing down prey. Raza's stomach churned as the huge man carried her like she weighed nothing. She was amazed at the two men and their seemingly superhuman abilities. Glenn reached the walls of the village as the storm reached them. Despite being only ten feet apart, the sand and debris kicked up by the vicious winds made it nearly impossible to see each other. The roar of the storm made it almost impossible to hear one another as well. Glenn's mind abruptly slipped back a decade to the memory of nearly drowning in the white waters of a Colorado river. The sound of the rushing water and loss of visibility from the memory of the river incident was far too similar to the crushing weight of the storm and all its fury bearing down on him. His already stretched body burned harder, pushing itself to move faster as his anxiety from the memory welled. Glenn, the furthest ahead of the trio, passed into the village through the wall opening and headed directly to the first building he saw on the right-hand side. The bone-colored square building made mostly of concrete blocks with a firm wooden door looked lost in the growing darkness. As the wind whipped up in a greater fury, stinging every exposed piece of his skin and obscuring the space between him and the wall of the home, he lost sight of the door and simply moved through the brown-gray haze towards where he remembered the door to be. The world was awash in the rage of the desert as he reached out and found the dark rectangle that was the door. As the wind blew him off balance, Glenn made a short prayer, hoping the home was empty and smashed his shoulder into the pale brown wood of the door, bursting inside, seeking the precious shelter. A dozen yards behind Glenn, Thomas still carried Raza. He watched Glenn for a moment and then lost him in the haze of the storm as it enveloped the world. Hold on, Raza, Thomas screamed into the maelstrom, now stumbling forward as the gusts of wind buffeted him to and fro. Thomas locked the location of the gap in the wall into his memory and moved as straight towards it as he could manage. He stopped suddenly after a dozen paces as the corner of the wall suddenly loomed out of the void directly in his face. He'd nearly smashed his forehead into the storm-hidden stone. Thomas stepped to the right around it and moved towards where he hoped a home was. He heard Raza cry out in pain as the biting sand continued to eat at the soft skin of her face and arms. He reached over as best he could and shielded her eyes with a gloved hand. As Thomas pushed forward, sent to the left and right by the wind like a drunken bum, he saw the world turn a bit brighter in a specific direction. Guessing it was the side of a home, he pressed forward with newfound resolve and reached the smooth stone side of the structure. He coughed heavily into the bandana he'd covered his mouth with, hefting the small girl in his arms so as to not drop her. 
He slid his shoulder down the wall, leaning heavily on it for stability until he saw the darker frame of the entrance appear. Thomas put his back to the wall and kicked to the rear like a workhorse over and over until the door smashed off the hinge and fell in. Once sure the door was down, he spun inside and entered the home, hoping for refuge against the abrasive sand made deadly by the wind. Dipping inside the building quickly, he only barely heard the nearby gunfire over the roar of the world. Glenn's instinct to slide down the wall of the home he'd entered proved to be life-saving. As his back skipped across the rough interior wall of the common space of the home, he watched as the muzzle flashes of an AK-47 barked at the doorway he'd only a split second before been standing in. The fatal funnel had that moniker for a reason. The flashes were low, waist level. The seal judged that the shooter sat on the floor. Glenn already had his weapon in his hand, and he ripped off a short burst on full auto at the space where the flashes had just subsided. He couldn't see in the pitch black of the room if he'd hit anything, but no more muzzle flashes came from the floor. He made an educated guess where the shooter lay, and he popped off another short burst. Insurance. Glenn moved on as his eyes adjusted to the darkness and the familiar ringing set into his ears. Another door was to his right. This door was thin and flimsy, designed to separate interior rooms from one another. Sensing the entire house was a bad place, filled with danger in every room, he operated on gut instinct and sent a third of his magazine through the door, annihilating anything living on the other side. He heard the wet thump of an adult body hit the floor on the other side of the door and booted it open. Beyond the kicked-in door sat a small square bedroom, not much bigger than a mattress, and in the center lay a fresh dead body, his handiwork. He looked back to the common room and made sure that the original shooter was still down and took stock of them as his eyes adjusted to the differing light inside the home. Both wore the typical garb of insurgents, dark wool vests over magazine bandoliers, loose-fitting pants, shirts, and sandals, Perhaps these people were just locals protecting their home from an intruder coming in from the storm. Perhaps not. Glenn felt they were Taliban survivors who'd simply taken over the home after the undead had risen. Now he'd never know, and it didn't matter. He lived, and they didn't. The cold mathematics of war and survival. Glenn wrenched the interior door off the weak hinges keeping it up and propped the door into the larger frame of the entrance to the home. The wind and sand breaching the living space diminished dramatically, and he fell back to the security of the tiny bedroom, hoping his partner fared better than he was. When he saw the body of the gunner in the living room stir back into unlife, he drew his service knife and set out to finish again what he'd done just moments before. Thomas's mind lost focus and drifted to concern as he entered the building. He had just heard the very familiar sound of an AK fire, and it had been close. He gathered his wits with battle-hardened acumen and pushed into the hallway of what appeared to be a tiny school building. Barely audible in the building he and Raza were in, Thomas heard a burst of M4 fire, followed a second or two later by another. The shots were near the initial burst of AK fire, Whatever had fired at Glenn had eaten at least a half dozen 5.56 millimeter rounds. Thomas smiled, and the concern he had faded a tiny amount. His grin died a second later. An arm's length ahead of him, a figure appeared suddenly. He heard Raza scream out in fear, and he recoiled, half dropping her as he reached to his side for his weapon. The figure stood a full foot lower in stature than he did, and it shuffled forward, hobbled and broken, tipping and lurching with each step. Thomas gave Raza a half push, half toss to get her behind him as he lifted the muzzle of his M4. The weapon's safety flicked up from training, and he stroked the trigger several times, letting the muzzle lift walk the weapon's barrel higher, bringing his following shots directly into the face of the menace standing in front of him. His fifth shot landed in the open mouth of his target, smashing the head of the person apart as if he'd hit it with a jackhammer strapped to the hood of his Dodge pickup back in Coronado. The headless body tumbled backwards, and Thomas saw the reason behind the height of his attacker. 
His legs had been eradicated halfway between the knee and ankle by a mine or IED, most likely. The body twitched twice, then came to a rest in the stained tile hall. Thomas licked the dust off his lips and spat the filth out, forgetting he had the bandana across his face. He felt the grimy mucus stuck to the fabric rub against his chin, and he pulled the cloth down, disgusted by the sensation. He turned and watched Raza get to her feet. She looked battered and dirty, but whole. Thomas gave her the thumbs up. Okay, Miss Raza, he asked. She nodded and returned his upright thumb. That's my girl. Thomas pointed a finger at the floor, telling her to stay still until he returned. She nodded and scooted her back against the wall, shielding herself from the storm outside the open doorway. She reached over and pushed it shut, propping her foot against it to hold it mostly closed. The big Navy SEAL raised his weapon to his shoulder and stalked away to search the small building for more threats, both dead and alive. The sandstorm raged on for hours, eclipsing not only the sun and sky, but the remainder of the day as well. The storm quite literally ate the rays of hot daylight as if it were some mythical beast from legend that feasted on lava and hope. The two men were isolated from each other while the storm raged on outside, Separately, they had come to the conclusion that trying to move about the town completely blind was foolish. Glenn was concerned about more Taliban threats, while Thomas was deeply concerned about the remaining dead and their ravenous hunger for the flesh of the few still left alive. Two different experiences by two different men in two different buildings resulting in two different concerns. Thomas had found and killed two more zombies in the classrooms of the building he and Raza hid in. Thomas exited he and Raza's den of safety first. The special operations warrior knew that Glenn wouldn't have gone deep into the village alone, so after affixing his night vision equipment to his helmet and shutting Raza safely inside a sturdy closet, he stepped out into the cool and calm Afghanistan night. Sand, dirt, and scattered debris covered everything, everywhere. As he searched and scanned the confines of the small alleys, he was reminded of the television footage of towns in the aftermath of a tornado or hurricane. It looked as if the very hand of God had come down into a sandbox filled with toys and shaken everything up, sending all his divine possessions askew. He wondered what would make God so angry. Thomas tried to focus on dangers rather than disorganization and moved back towards the gate entrance. The center road into the village was perhaps twenty feet wide. Thomas moved to the end of the school building and stopped, not wanting to cross the space in between, even under the cover of darkness. Enough moonlight poked through the few clouds above that he'd still be quite visible to someone with ordinary eyes. The young Ring brother crouched at the corner of the building without exposing himself and waited a moment to listen. Thomas snatched up a stone the size of a ripe plum from the ground and gauged the distance to the building directly across the way. It would have been the most logical place for Glenn to have gone in the blinding storm earlier that afternoon. The seal drew his thickly muscled arm back and rifled the rock into the stony side of the home, sending a resounding clack into the night air. He found two more rocks of similar size nearby and fired the two of them one after another into the house within a foot of the first rock's point of impact. A few moments later, he saw a dark green tinted shadow appear from the doorway of the building, and he knew he'd found Glenn. Glenn moved to the corner of the building he'd been hiding in and waved to Thomas. He whispered, You two okay? Thomas nodded. Yeah, had three dead tangos in the small school building. Little hairy for a second, but nothing big. You good to go? I heard AK fire. Glenn grinned and fired off a thumbs up. Yeah, I had two inside my hole. They were locals with AKs. Insurgents, probably. Took them both after nearly getting stitched up the midsection. Little worry, though, dude. If you had Zeds and I had a Taliban, this whole place is likely to be a giant fucking bucket of trouble. Soup sandwich action for sure. We need to skate and skate fast. Roger that. I don't want to clear a village of, what, two or three hundred with just two shooters? We'll run dry of ammo far too fucking fast. You retrieve the AK from the house? Thomas asked. It's still there. I'll grab it before we exfil out of here. I think he has five magazines on his chest unless I shot holes in him. 
That'd be a nice injection of ammo. We've still got a long fucking way to that FOB. Three miles at least, and the ground between here and there is apt to be covered in dead bodies and insurgents. Might be just as bad as this fucking town. Okay, you go back and get that AK. I'll grab Raza and give her the bad news. Meet back here in one minute and we slip out the way we came and skirt the whole town and keep heading towards the FOB. If we're lucky, we'll slip out and buy anyone nearby. Thomas raised himself up to his full height as Glenn did the same. Glenn nodded and both men turned to attend to their task. Raza looked up at Thomas as he opened the door. She looked scared to him, but her expression instantly turned to relief when she recognized him. Thomas slung his rifle quickly and produced his small spiral-bound notebook from a pouch. He wrote to her, and they swapped the book back and forth until the conversation was finished. The village is filled with the dead. We must leave to go somewhere safer. But what about my aunt and uncle? Raza, I'm sorry, but they are likely to be dead or held by the Taliban as prisoners. We must check. We cannot. We don't have enough bullets to do that and then reach safety. We must choose one or the other, and we have chosen safety. Maybe later we can return for your family with more soldiers. Okay, we will return later with more soldiers, and bigger guns too. Raza smiled, pained, but happy at the compromise. She was concerned deeply for her family, but she already knew it was a dim hope that they were still alive. It was Allah's will that they live or die, and if they had been called to him, then she would mourn their loss but celebrate their good fortune to be with the Almighty. After getting the little girl to her feet, the two exited carefully back into the alley facing the wall. They crept down to meet Glenn. Thomas checked their rear as they moved forward, paranoia getting the best of him for a moment, fearful that the girl would be snatched away from him. He'd seen too many horror movies late at night with his brothers to trust a quiet street, especially in the revelation that the dead were returning to life, hungry and bitey. When he looked back to the space between the two buildings, he saw a handful of robed and loosely garbed men walking down the road to the town's exit. They were each hefting AK-47s or RPG-7s, and they were no more than ten feet away. The sight sent an icicle straight down his spine. Thomas shoved the girl behind him, using his own body as a shield as he heard one of them scream the last thing a seal wants to hear a man holding an AK-47 say, Allahu Akbar! Thomas watched in perfect slow motion as one of the men's guns started to chatter out thick and heavy 7.62 millimeter rounds into the dirt, kicking up pockets of dust in his direction. In a millisecond, the rounds would start pounding through his body, ripping flesh from bone and sending his soul into the afterlife. Glenn's reflexes had been finely tuned during his four years in the teams. He'd been in more firefights and shit situations than he had memory to spare for, and the training in between never stopped. What his mind didn't remember, his body did. It's all muscle memory, after all, one of his shooting instructors said to him one day during SQT. Glenn heard the man yell, God is great, in Arabic, and then start firing, and... By combination of good fortune and those four years' worth of muscle memory, he started spraying 5.56mm five, five, rounds into the street, hoping his unconscious mind and trained body would put two and two together and put at least a few rounds into the shooter that was trying to kill his best friend. The M4A1 that both Glenn and Thomas carried had a fully automatic setting that was able to empty the entire magazine in around about two seconds, give or take a fraction of a second. Normally, the SEALs would never, ever do this, but this was not a normal moment by any means. The heavier, slower AK was already firing on full auto, ripping the silence of the night apart like an angry lion's roar. The smaller and faster M4's oral assault was tiny by comparison. Glenn had affixed his suppressor. Unfortunately for the five men standing between his barrel and where his bullets were heading, the lower sound volume meant they were no less riddled with bullets. Glenn's first high-velocity rounds were sent to their target by some mixture of divine providence, incredible luck, experience, and formidable skill. The first round blew the man's knee out, twisting his body. The second and third rounds hit his arm, shattering the elbow, rendering the limb useless. 
As Glenn twisted the weapon to the side, the other 27 rounds in his magazine punched holes in every single man still standing. The 5.56mm rounds laced their bloody way through torsos and limbs alike, sometimes traveling so fast the only reaction the wounded had was to clutch at the sudden burning sensation where the new hole in their body appeared. All that remained was the fall to the ground below where they'd bleed to death. Across the way, Thomas watched as the puffs of dirt heading his way from the AK rounds suddenly kicked to the side, missing him by less than a foot. Despite the very same imminent death heading his way, he'd been raising his own weapon to start firing the entire time, and when the puffs passed him, he was already squeezing the trigger. Thomas's weapon was not suppressed like Glenn's, and the reports issuing from the barrel were rapid and ear-splitting. The group of men standing in the street was caught in a two-fold valley of death. Both seals ejected their spent magazines half a second apart. Thomas's hands moved faster on the reload, and he had his weapon back in the fight first. On the ground, one of the wounded men had sat up a few inches and pulled the trigger on his Russian weapon. Thomas stood in the line of fire and knew it. He watched in the green light of the night vision equipment as the weapon's flash threatened his direction. The bright light coming from the gun looked like the petals of an insane flower that belched lead and steel, not pollen. He launched out of the way, landing on his stomach hard, nearly emptying his lungs of air. He felt no impact from slugs, nor the horrible sensation of burning rounds piercing his flesh. Holy shit, he thought, realizing his new position on his stomach gave him no line of sight to the man still shooting at him. He'd be perforated where he lay if he didn't figure something out. Glenn had no problem with his line of sight. He shouldered his weapon, and with a single squeeze of the trigger and subsequent cough from his weapon, the man threatening his partner had his head exploded, and he flopped down to the ground, leaking his brains. The remainder of the men in the sandy street were either dead or were moaning in a sad, wet way as blood filled their lungs and throats from fresh, ragged wounds. Glenn scanned the peripheral area for any kind of movement as Thomas quickly got to his feet. You all right? Glenn asked as he pulled out his service knife again. It didn't make sense to finish the men off with a gun. Firearms were loud, and it was a waste of ammunition to shoot a man that wasn't a threat. Thomas brushed his chest off and quickly gave his body the once-over. Many wounds didn't hurt. He was clear of blood and pain. I'm okay, you all right? Yeah, how's Raza? Thomas's adrenaline spiked as he realized he'd left the young woman entirely alone just ten feet from a major gunfight. Fuck, he said as he jogged over to the side of the building where he'd more or less shoved her. Raza, he barked out uselessly. Her ears would never let her respond. Thomas jumped around the corner of the building where he expected her to be as Glenn's grisly knife work began. Thomas saw the little girl crouch down against the base of the school's wall, sitting very still. Thomas dropped to a knee and put his hand carefully on her shoulder. The thin girl raised her face up to her American companion, and Thomas knew instantly something was wrong with her. Her coffee-toned skin had thinned in color, and she had the look of a drained husk about her. Her eyes rolled up into her head as she slipped to the side, into the oblivion of unconsciousness. When her shoulders hit the ground, Thomas saw a huge dark stain in the dirt below where she'd sat. Glenn, she's hit, Thomas screamed, getting his backpack off his shoulders. Inside was the medic's gear that could be her sole chance at survival. Be right there, Glenn said, bringing his M4 up and around. It pumped out two fast rounds into the skulls of the final two bodies. It wouldn't be helpful at all if they sat up and attacked them while they attended to Raza. Thomas had his knife out almost immediately, using its razor-sharp edge to slice Raza's clothing in half, revealing the rack of bones that she really was. He tugged her arm roughly, pulling her so she was flat on the ground in front of him rather than leaning against the wall. He rolled her over, looking for what had caused her to bleed out so much so fast. Directly below her protruding pelvis, right where the longest of the leg bones reaches up to connect, she had a channel of flesh carved out of her. The joint was exposed and the muscles and connective tissues were flayed apart. 
The wound stood as a morbid monument to the effectiveness of the AK. Thomas set to work confidently and quickly, allowing his training to guide him. He removed all the items he'd need from his bag without even looking at it. Everything in his pack was meticulously organized for moments like this. A single moment's delay could be the time it took for a heart to pump out one pint too much for life to be rescued. What can I do? Glenn asked as he dropped to his knees in the blood-soaked dirt. Pressure, right there. Thomas pointed with a bloody finger where Glenn could help stop the flow of blood. Glenn responded immediately, pressing downward with both palms heavily. Both men watched as the steady flow of blood slowed to a meager trickle. Thomas began to insert expanding material that would staunch the flow of blood into the gaping wound in the child. The white material soaked up her blood impossibly fast, swelling to fill and plug the entire wound. As she stabilized, Thomas produced an IV bag and somehow managed to find a vein in her stick-like arm. He threaded the needle in and affixed it to her with tape. Using both hands, he squeezed the IV bag, forcing the life-giving fluid into her body, refusing to allow her any chance of bleeding to death. Within seconds, her color shifted in the dark green of the NVGs, and her breathing steadied slightly. As Thomas let go of the IV bag, both men heard movement coming from the street where the ambush had taken place. Thomas had the angle on the street and one hand still on the IV bag. He drew his service handgun fluidly, and as another insurgent ran around the corner, AK in hand and ready to spew death, he stroked the trigger twice, double-tapping the man in the chest and dropping him like he'd been struck by lightning. He twitched a few times, gurgling blood onto his face, and Thomas pulled the trigger again, ripping the top of his forehead and skull off. Both men remained on their knees for a few minutes, Glenn still applying pressure and Thomas still squeezing the IV bag. Fuck these people. Fuck this place. Thomas holstered his handgun and turned back to the shattered little girl he had every intention of saving. October 18th, 2013. Abby and Baby are doing well. She looks so good as a mom, too. I made fun of her for years, mercilessly, I should say, for having the feminine figure of a discarded popsicle stick with blonde hair on top, but I can't anymore. Having a baby gave her boobs and some hip fat, and now she's actually attractive. It's not just the changes pregnancy made to her body, either. I mean, she was always pretty in that awkward, you want to help her talk to people way, but now she's a genuine, bona fide, badass, creeper attracting hottie. I have the overwhelming desire to punch people in the face when they look at her like she's a piece of meat, which I correlate to my fatherly feelings for her. She, of course, doesn't need anyone to punch people in the face for her. She's more than capable of doing it on her own. She's also got to be one of the damn few to breastfeed with a Beretta 92F on her hip and an AR-15 within arm's reach. That's my girl. I love holding her kid, too. The look of relief on her face when Michelle or I take baby Gavin off her hands for an hour or two is so worth getting thrown up on. Abby's appreciative of us helping, which leads me to the point that the kid upchucks like every fucking time I hold him. Never on Michelle, rarely on Hal or Abby, but so often on me it's a running joke now. Do I need to explain his throw up is Abby's breast milk? I'd relate this to my toe pusher expression, but I can't think of a way that doesn't make it sound like I'm the turd in the bathtub circling the drain, so I won't. Let's just move on. About a week since I put an entry in, a goodly amount of shit has been accomplished. Things are quiet on the northern front, no appearance by our neighbors that we've observed, but our preparations in the event of their visitation continue. I traveled to the factory with Kevin and a small crew in vehicles to help them sort out the installation of the repeater tower. I hadn't seen Hector or Celeste in a long time, and it was nice to catch up. If you recall, Mr. Journal, Hector used to work with Sergeant Mike in the National Guard in Westfield, but now he's grown up and moved on. Hector's hair, especially. When I first met him, he had short hair to match his short stature, but 
Now his locks have grown out a bit and he reminds me of Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. Hector speaks less like an idiot, though, unless you get him started on cars. And then all bets are off. Guy was born with a wrench in his hand. Celeste is fun to be around. She's sassy and tall as hell. Taller than me, which puts her at six, three? I bet she played college basketball right up until the point someone showed her she'd make 500 bucks a night taking most of her clothes off for lonely men. Celeste used to be a dancer when the factory was a strip club. If you recall, the two heinous sisters who owned the factory more or less enslaved their girls to sell sex for supplies, and that got them a good ways along through the end times. Food, bullets, and pussy appear to be universal currencies. Anyway, the sisters did real well right up until they crossed paths with us, and they damn near kidnapped my little sister Becca and my brother's wife Sophie to add to their harem. I wasn't having that. Since we dislodged the douche nozzles that ran the joint and the oppressed took over, things are great there. The interior of the club has been rebuilt to be more human-friendly and fortified, and they-slash-we got some additional large diesel generators in the back rooms, so the huge-ass building has power until the fuel runs out. Water is still a problem so close to the city, but there are some streams and rivers that are now clean enough to drink out of that keep them going. They use the same water to keep their roof and alley box gardens growing. Their plan is to expand into other buildings soon. Hector and his crew had removed the large repeater tower from the closest fire department the month prior and moved it over using a truck from a lumber supply company. Now, Hector has a good amount of dudes and hard-working ladies there, but getting a 5,000-pound radio antenna and a series of wires, cables, boxes, and attached shit up there with it was a bit out of his reach, so we helped. Most of the heavy equipment in the city is just sitting where it was left on June 23, 2010, waiting to be brought back to life. Hector and Blake are both engine-slash-heavy equipment nerds, so we formed a search party and hunted around until we found a small crane. Of course, the thing had been sitting in an abandoned lot, an unfinished strip mall. Three years of sitting idle meant it needed some tender, loving care to work, and thankfully our grease monkey nerds were able to do just that. This new world will be built by those with dirty hands, not neckties. It took Blake and Hector the better part of eight hours on a crisp day a couple days ago to get the crane up and running, and that was counting the time it took for them to find parts at a nearby garage and swap out the batteries on the beast. Driving it back to the factory took but half an hour, and after that, Martin was able to decipher how to operate it with Blake real quick. It helps to have handymen around. I'm good at shooting things and being a smartass, but when it comes to repairing things, I am not your man. I'm a handful, not handy. We took a break after all that for the night, had a nice rooftop cookout with the factory people where we reminisced about the apocalypse and violent things, and then the following day we lifted the tower and all the gear up to the roof with minimal issues. I should just say again how much easier it is to do shit without the fear of zombies killing us at every turn. We still post security on a perimeter to watch for the living when we're outside the wall, but still, that's like guard duty on base. Most of it is staying awake, I hate to say. After that, we needed to give Andy and Hector a couple of days to install the tower's innards and link it to their electricity supply. We're hoping that the project is completed tomorrow. When done, we'll have radio comms all the way out to Spring Meadows from here at Bastion. Life will feel far safer. Is it weird that I constantly cycle through all the names this place has had? Auburn Lake Preparatory Academy, a.k.a. ALPA, or casually just Campus, or Bastion, as the newer people have christened it? Eh, Whatever. Speaking of Spring Meadows, when we left the factory, we swung by there to touch base. You might remember Agnes and Anders, the Nordic married couple that are the de facto leaders of the settlement. They're still in charge, though Adam, one of our Texas transplants, now helps them keep things running. Anders and Agnes are stereotypically tall and blonde, and if you saw them on the street, you'd be really creeped out when they kissed— they could easily pass as brother and sister, and you'd immediately think that they were from the deep wilds of Kentucky and not Norway. Good people, though. 
college-educated, good family, pleasant, and kind. The walled-off community of Spring Meadows served them well when the undead roamed, sturdy brick walls on all sides topped with iron decorations that would fit in at a prison, and a series of iron gates that they blocked off with vehicles to keep out the dead. As long as they were quiet and kept the gate shut, they had little undead to deal with and few living raiders as well. Nowadays, they don't need to block off the gate, they simply post a guard at it and keep it closed. Inside the walls of the high-end neighborhood, they have turned almost every square foot into food-producing gardens. Their water supply is exterior, the same as the factory, but with their location to the south and in the suburbs of the city, they have potable water far closer. Adam's skills as a Home Depot manager have him on a project to pump the area water in somehow, though I'm wondering how much of his experience will help him in a region of the country that gets snow and ice a third of the year. Texas experience may not apply here in full effect. I have faith in him, though. He claims to have faith in me. I guess that should be a two-way street. There's some kind of wisdom in that statement I'm missing. Maybe it'll come to me when I'm three fingers into a bottle of blue label in Gilbert's honor. They are otherwise well. All are healthy. One couple is pregnant. Food cultivation on their land has been adequate, and the houses are holding up. There's a long-term concern we've had about home maintenance. Houses decay, especially when they aren't kept warm during winter and when the roofing isn't kept up to shape with fresh shingles. Mold grows inside if the moisture gets out of hand, windows get broken from who knows what, and there are precious few skilled carpenters around. In that regard, Texas Adam is a treasure. It's going to be very helpful training others and such so all of our households can be self-sufficient. What else? Babies are good. Moms are good. Dads are regretful. Fall harvest is in full swing, as is Michelle's preparations for Halloween at our little school. The kids are cutting out paper ghosts and goblins and sewing costumes to wear to trick-or-treat. Having her be the accepted community leader as well as running the school has given our community a strong emphasis on education and family. It's the path to betterment for all. I truly believe that. The smarter our kids are, the better the chance at a strong, viable future for the human race— or, at the very least, a viable future of our settlement of people here at Bastion. Blah, 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 Adrian, no one gives a shit. Well, many of us here do, but they aren't reading this. God, I hope not. This journal is embarrassing as hell. Adrian October 23rd, 2013 Kevin reported to Michelle and me tonight that his patrol spotted Humvee tracks in some mud east of town heading towards the city. Two sets of tracks that pulled off the road dismounted at least three adults wearing boots, then pulled back on the road heading towards the city. We notified the factory in Spring Meadow via comms and prayed to God whoever was in those Humvees wasn't listening to civilian police and fire channels. Kevin's now running his military radios 24-7, in the event, whoever that was fires their gear up. If they don't know we're listening, we could learn a lot. Two days to meeting with Maria's group to the south. Ollie and his group are getting the food and animal stuff we're hoping to trade ready. I desperately want us to shore up relations with her and her crew. I know we started off a little ugly, but I have a good feeling about her. She's good people. When I talk to Michelle about her, she and I are certain of it. She hasn't even met Maria and still thinks there's hope to be had. They're coming, the NVC. I can feel it. I hope they're friendly. We're going to need more guns. Adrian October 26, 2013 The visit south with Captain Maria Hunt's team of people went well yesterday, it ran far longer than I anticipated, though, which isn't a bad thing. It just made for a long day. Cue the obligatory, I'm too old for this shit complaint. We had to transport more supplies than I thought was needed. Ollie came with us and reminded me the day prior that the point of the trade was to pick up a male cow, and if that went through, we had to have three barrels of diesel handy, which meant 
we needed to roll out with the Texan's horse trailer. Bud, Donna, a middle-aged married couple that came up from Longview, Texas with Adam and Eddie and crew, had a nice big truck with a horse trailer, and we've been using that to move some stuff around. Bud and Donna are good people, horse ranchers of the small variety from East Texas. Of course, when it comes to ranches in Texas, small is big. They're kind and charming right down to the AK-47s they both have. I should add that they had those AKs before the shit hit the fan. Bud and Donna believe in preparedness. They came with us for the trade today, and we loaded the back of their horse trailer with three barrels of premium aged diesel and some other shit they wanted. We almost forgot the barrel dolly at home, but Ollie remembered as we were about to drive off without it. Speaking of which, this is one of the rare times Ollie has left Bastion with us. The look of worry on his wife Melissa's face felt real to me, and it didn't get any better when he kissed her and their little baby Martha goodbye. I made a promise to myself to make sure he'd come home to his two girls. No matter what I do, I can't keep that promise when and if I make it, and that hurts more than I can say. I will always do my best, but I cannot control what others do or how lucky they get. We met again on the same overpass we always do, and this time I came up to the top with Ollie and Rich as my buddies. Captain Maria hilariously led a big old bull up the overpass on a rope lead as one of her Humvees drove beside her, keeping pace. Mind you, Maria is a tiny peanut of a person, and the bull she led looked positively elephantine in comparison. It was like watching a pea lead a coconut down the road. The bright eyes Ollie gave that animal as she approached with it told me the deal was sealed. Rich and I had to sit back and laugh as the whole situation played out. As our farmer men looked at the animal with inappropriate lust in his eyes, Maria and I bullshitted, pun intended, about the weather, the rest of the trade, and other stuff. I think she, too, was lusting after Rich in a strange four-way lust affair. I for sure felt like a fifth wheel on that overpass. Anyway, she had pumpkins for us as well as some of the random items that previously were in ample supply but now are getting rarer by the day. Shampoo, baking soda, bleach, vinegar, that kind of shit. For her to be able to trade it to us tells me she has fewer people than we do by a large margin, or she's been sandbagging this shit for premium trade value. People are always telling stories whether they realize it or not. Devil's in the details, right? Then I told her about the Humvee tracks on the east side of our town, and shit got solemn. Do you think that's them? Are they still searching out and trying to expand? She asked me. If that's them, then yes. Somehow they slipped around our satellite settlements and came straight to town. Not sure what their logic is on skipping the city. After the scrapyard incident, I'm not quite sure how to handle it moving forward. They outgun us in many ways. I'd bet they outnumber us as well, though quality beats quantity in an unfair fight. That's very true, she said, kicking a rock. If we go dark all of a sudden, you'll know why. I'm not in the picking fights business, but we'll stand up as best we can if they come in guns blazing. Yeah, she said. Anything over the radio? I asked her. More of the same. People heading this way to be closer to you despite winter coming. Idiots. I haven't seen them yet. Most of them sound like they're still in the Virginia or Pennsylvania areas. Those that are coming. Oh, I did hear more rumors that more government officials are surfacing from new bunkers and whatnot. There's more hope stirring the actual United States will reform. Do I need to explain how odd it is to hear that people are moving across the country to be closer to me? That'd be neat. What about Europe? Asia? Anything? Black hole. Nothing communication-wise. We've tried to bounce signals off the atmosphere towards Europe, but nothing is working. We can communicate down into Mexico and Central America sometimes, so we know it's not the gear. Either the continent is a complete loss, or we're incompetent in sending or receiving signals to and from it. I'm not sure which is the case. Something about what she said sent a shiver up and down my whole body. Images of a destroyed London and Berlin flashed inside my eyelids as I blinked. 
The Eiffel Tower rusting and covered in vines, Frenchmen smashing in skulls with hard loaves of bread, Spaniards using red capes to dodge charging undead, Italians beating away zombies with enormous pots of pasta and sexist beliefs. I joke, but it messed me up. I'm still thinking about it. After that, we wound down and set another meeting for November 25th. A month seemed like plenty of time. Ollie did, in fact, love the bull, which meant we offloaded the diesel and loaded in the cow, which I will now call Romeo, henceforth. They had the pumpkins in the back of a beat-up Silverado, and we swung our truck around and swapped them out. This marked the first time our second-line people met their second-line people. Not all of them were guardsmen. Most were just ordinary folk. Lots of hands were shaken and smiles exchanged. I feel real good about Captain Maria and her people. It goes without saying that I feel far better about them than how I feel about the NVC people. Them and their fucking APC. Michelle and her other teachers in the school were elated when the pumpkins arrived. We set aside a dozen for the kids to carve, and the rest will be used for seeds and cooking immediately. We'll be able to have pumpkin pies very soon, and that makes me happier than I can describe. Oh, and Annie's biodiesel facility is near to completion. She's been forced to nickel and dime her parts acquisition as we've shuffled things around, so there's been a delay of sorts. She's adjusted her fuel production expectation from Halloween to Thanksgiving, which I consider to be no net loss in the big picture. Go, Annie, go. Beyond that, all is well. I'll write more when the urge strikes me. Adrian October 30th, 2013 like oatmeal left on a table, the plot thickens. I mentioned quite a while back that Kevin is now running our military frequency radios 24-7 to listen to traffic from the people north of us, and that decision hit pay dirt this morning and through the afternoon. Hector has his Humvee's radios on the same as Kevin does, and he alerted us to distant comms coming through. The talk we heard had a similar feel to ours, meaning it's obviously military men and women speaking, but with notably relaxed radio protocol. Lax officers, I would imagine. The same as us. They've gotten as lazy as we have. It wasn't long before our radios picked up their talk and a mess of us clustered around the truck park near the bridge gate of Bastion with the operational radio in it. In total, there were perhaps 20 or 25 transmissions over the course of eight hours, starting at about 9 a.m. and ending sometime around 5 p.m., the early messages were coordination of cover and instructions as they searched a neighborhood. The later messages were them talking about their spoils, not much, and then discussing falling back to a secure location for the night somewhere near the hospital. Same hospital we raided back when we first started going into the city. They referenced a few street names in an obscure fashion that a few of us locals pieced together to get their approximate location. We were able to figure out that they have a six-vehicle force and that the command vehicle, which they referred to as Call Sign Pasta, was the M113 APC. That meant the toughest nut to crack had the brains of the outfit in it. Pasta Actual came on the radio several times and very clearly had what I felt to be a forced Italian accent. Maybe it wasn't Italian, maybe it was Bronx, not sure. Jay Wilson of the Scrapyard was there listening with us, agitated as fuck, I might add, as the People who lit his mom and dad up chatted like it was nothing, and he identified Pasta Actual for us. Lieutenant Picarillo. Didn't make sense, though, as they referred to him as Captain, or The Captain, several times. It seems he'd been promoted for killing Jay's family, or some other horrifying act of bullshit. Jay said he was a short Italian guy who ran the Exploration Salvage Truck team we were listening to, that he'd been promoted struck me as strange, as typically a promotion came with an increased responsibility. You don't get a title without a new job, more or less. If he got a promotion but was doing the same job, maybe he caught the title as a lip service thank you. Maybe his group got larger. That might explain it. Same job, bigger team. Then again, there's no reason for them to follow promotion procedures from the old army now. 
Can't read too much into it. Sometimes the devil in the details is just wasting your time. Anyway, he sounded like an asshole, as most officers do, and we gathered that they had two sergeants, too. The tank, four Humvees, and two civilian trucks was their complement. I couldn't tell if they meant pickups or semis or something in between. No idea on what weapons were mounted on their Humvees, but if the APC had a 50 cal, I'd wager the Humvees had at least a few saws. Worst case scenario, another 50 cal or an MK-19 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Jake couldn't fill us in on the details. Not good. They went radio dark around five, and we spent the rest of the evening planning like paranoid monkeys. Kevin and I agreed that Hector and another skilled person would take up observation positions in the neighborhoods near their movement to take some digital pictures and get a better idea of what we're looking at. Tomorrow, we celebrate Halloween for the kids. Should be a good time, if those of us in the know can forget about what's moving around in the world out there. I get the impression it'll feel like enjoying a picnic on a floating dock with sharks in the water all around us. Drops of blood dripping down one at a time, hitting fins, bringing more and more death in from miles around. Cheery bitch, ain't I? Adrian. No One's Home, Early July 2010, Afghanistan. Is she stable? Glenn asked Thomas. Glenn crouched low in the center of one of the debris-strewn classrooms in the Afghan school building. He watched carefully out the openings in the wall and through the broken windows for anything moving in their direction. The light of the approaching dawn danced flirtatiously on the horizon outside, and both men were becoming antsy. If they waited much longer, they'd lose the protective cover of darkness. The seals owned the night— the loss of the advantage they had was something they had to weigh against Raza's life. If they waited too long, she'd likely die from the wound she sustained. I would kill for another set of eyes. I can't watch everything, Glenn continued before Thomas had a chance to respond. Well, the bleeding is slowed dramatically. Little thing has drained three IV bags. Not good for us. She was so fucking dehydrated to begin with. I could barely find something to put the IV in. She was so collapsed. Almost did an I.O. line. Thomas sat next to the girl, his warm hand on her frail shoulder. She slept deep despite the agony her hip wound put her through. Glenn nodded. He'd seen how weak her body looked when they were saving her life from the gunshot wound. Underneath her clothing, her bare bones poked against the insides of her skin like clothing hung on a hanger. What are you thinking? Move her to the FOB or sit here until nightfall, give her a chance to recuperate some? If we sit here, she will probably make it to tonight. I have three more IV bags, and you have two. I think she'll piss through one more. If we take off right after dark to the FOB, I think we're in good shape. If she gets worse here during the day, then we change our plans. Thomas looked down at her with pity. Her life hung in the balance, and his decision would tip it one way or the other. Sounds good. What are your thoughts on clearing this village now? We have a large pile of dead tangos outside, and I can't imagine there are more out there. They'd have come for us by now. They know where we are. Thomas nodded. Yeah, it's a solid idea. She's stable. How long do you think it'll take for us to clear this place? I haven't gotten a clear look at the size of the town. Three hours, tops, Glenn said. Man, that's risky, leaving her here alone that long. Thomas sighed, worried they'd lose her while out checking the town. Man, it's risky not going out there and collecting these Hodges' food, dude. They looked healthy. Those fuckers are eating and drinking on the regular, and they're carrying weapons and ammos, and likely have more wherever they were putting sweaty head to shitty pillow. Plus, what the fuck do we do if there are two or three more of these pricks still here when we try and leave? They start chasing us or shooting at us as we carry her, and then what? We engage them on the run with her on one of our backs or on a stretcher? It's got shit written in shit all over it. I think we got to clear this place for our own sake, not Raza's, Glenn said with steel in his voice. His patience wore thin with the waiting. Paradoxically, he needed action to feel safe. Yeah, you're right. Let me put a fresh IV bag on her and we can get on it. If she dies, though, I'm going to be in a foul motherfucking mood. 
Thomas got up and began to get the IV bag. Roger that, brother. I'll be right there with you. Glenn stole a glance over his shoulder at the small deaf girl. Her weak form and shallow breathing exuded misery, and he hoped they'd be able to save her. Losing her would hurt both men something fierce. The younger ring brother and his partner Glenn Torrance moved through the town with rapidity and fury that bordered on recklessness. Were there other seals watching, the two men would certainly be scolded for their brash actions. Both men were doing things a little too loose, a little too full of emotion. Behavior like this got seals killed. The two men had been exceptionally lucky. Home after home, the special operations men put boot to door only to find the home filled with dust and the memories of residents recently dead. There were hundreds upon hundreds of bloodstains on the walls and floors of the homes, so many signs of violence that the two men had their stomachs fouled. No bodies remained, all were gone. The men who attacked them earlier had done the vast majority of the heavy lifting when it came to killing the undead in the tiny town. Thomas moved across the living room of a large two-story home with fluid grace. They had been at it over three hours, Glenn estimated, but both men were still focused and on point. They had raw emotion coursing through their bodies, and despite the loose tactics it brought out in them, it fueled better than adrenaline. Glenn went into the large home right behind his best friend and panned his weapon to the side. The room was empty. Far to the right of the room near Thomas was the staircase heading upwards to the second floor. It had no railing and looked hewn from soft stone, similar to the actual building itself. It could have been in an episode of the Flintstones if it weren't for the congealed blood everywhere. I got a bad feeling, Glenn said as he looked at the stairwell. The stairs were too easy. They were too open and far too inviting. It felt off to the warrior. Wrong. Something's up. We're missing something here. Look around quick, Thomas said as he froze still. His heart quickened and the pit of his stomach wobbled with hesitation brought on by years of experience and Glenn's sixth sense. His partner's hunch felt right. Something was wrong, but... He couldn't quite put his finger on what it was exactly. Both men dropped their eyes in unison to the sparse living room floor. By rural Afghan standards, the house would have belonged to a village elder. The largest in the town by far, it would have been reserved for the wealthy or an imam. The seals hadn't found the home their attackers had been staying in yet, which meant this could be the home or the earlier perpetrators had come from elsewhere. Thomas's eyes bulged as his mind assembled the clues. There's no furniture in this room, or the little dining room over there. Nothing, just this damn rug. Thomas kicked the edge of the rug, rolling it over and revealing the corner of a hidden wooden door in the floor. The dry edge of his lip cracked into a smile as he raised his weapon to the threat the door posed. Glenn mimicked him and reached down to the edge of the rug closest to where he stood, Many Afghan homes had trapdoors like this here. Afghans had no love for proper basements, but fucking loved the trapdoor cellar. Glenn's work pulling the large oval rug away yielded a thick wooden door recessed into the floor and held shut by two iron rods fastened across it. Rudimentary, but effective. What's down there that they needed to use steel rebar to keep that door shut? Glenn whispered. Good question. Do we open it and find out? Thomas asked back. Glenn shrugged. Could be food or ammo. Or a hundred zombies with flamethrowers and jelly dildos. Ditch the flamethrowers and you're in heaven, Glenn said with a smile. I do love me some jelly dongs. I say we crack the door and see what happens. I bet there's food or perhaps other perfectly normal Afghans that we'd be rescuing. Hearts and minds, right? Thomas said with his trademark smirk. On it, cover me, Glenn said as he slid his weapon to his side and laid flat on the floor. Inch by inch on the dusty floor, he slid over to the door. If anyone fired up out of the door, they'd miss him by a mile. Thomas crouched down and kept his weapon trained on the door. His low position put him out of any likely line of fire. After adjusting his angle, he looked to his side at the stairwell that had triggered both men's bad feelings and made sure nothing bad came their way. 
Glenn rotated the first iron rod as slowly as he could, attempting to be silent but failing. The metal grated slightly and sent a short but shrill noise into the afternoon quiet. Both men winced. Torrance slid the bar to the side out of the locking mount and moved to the second bar. It too gave way with a slight noise, though the grinding noise was quieter than the first bars. Glenn shifted, drew his handgun, and got the pistol into a firing position. He pushed the rod out, unlocking the door. Nothing moved as both men remained silent and still, waiting for something to happen. Hearts pounded. Sweat ran. Glenn gave a quick glance to Thomas, who nodded in return. The seal on the floor reached out with his free hand and slipped a finger into the space between the door and frame. He gave it the slightest lift, and all hell broke loose. The door blasted open from the darkness below, propelled by the impact of several hands, punching up in awkward unison. The door flung upwards, and both men were immediately ravaged by a stench of unparalleled power. A charnel den lay below, filled with the rotten flesh of the undead and awful. Glenn scrambled backward, firing his pistol twice as three zombies clambered up through the square hole in the floor, their heads reaching a height a foot or two above the floor. The hole they were attempting to leave couldn't be deep where the door sat. Both men opened fire within a long heartbeat, filling the air in the living room with flying bullets that bit like supersonic, angry, flesh-destroying hornets. The withering fire let loose, cut the three zombies reaching at Glen down as if they were bloody grass being mowed in a morbid lawn. Their already deceased bodies gave way to the torrent of firepower and the bodies collapsed back into the hole, hopefully slowing down any other undead that might be sharing the evil space with them. Glenn reached to his belt with his free hand, freed up a grenade, and pulled the pin. Frag out, he screamed, and tossed the grenade underhanded into the hole on top of the three zombie corpses they'd just dropped. Glenn was already flat by the time Thomas dove into the corner furthest away from the impending explosion. The grenade went off only seconds later with a concussive punch that rattled the ears, bellies, and lungs of both men. Dust, rotten blood, and desiccated flesh billowed out of the hole in the floor like a volcano that grew from the geography of hell. The mist and smoke filled the air of the living room as the two men got to their feet and brought their weapons back to bear on the hole in the floor. Breathing heavy, Glenn listened hard for movement in the space below. He heard scratching almost immediately. What the fuck? They're still alive, he said as a hand missing two fingers reached up and out of the hole. Thermite, Thomas said flatly. Glenn nodded and fished out a larger grenade shaped like a canister. He pulled the pin as he finished getting to his feet, but held on to the spoon, not quite arming the powerful incendiary device. Glenn swung his M4A1 up and fired a few times into the hole, sending brass to the side and the reaching claw-like hand back into the darkness. Burn, you bitches, Glenn said as he let loose the spoon of the grenade and let it fall from his hand into the hole. He swung the door up off the floor and shut it quickly, kicking the bars across and latching it shut. A loud noise underneath the floor told him the thermite charge had kicked off and was starting its task. He could already feel the intense heat radiating through the stone only seconds after. Soon the crawl space would be hotter than a blacksmith's forge and twice as destructive. Let's get the fuck out of here. Gonna get real fucking toasty up in this bitch, Thomas said. The two men left the building, abandoning any interest in the foreboding stairwell and the rooms on the second floor. Glenn sat in the doorway of the slightly smaller home across the street almost an hour later, watching as yet another burnt, charred, and ruined zombie crawled out of the hole he'd dropped the thermite grenade into. The intense heat and flame brought on by the grenade had burnt the steel bar door away before burning the zombies to death. Now they had a steady stream of undead set aflame to deal with. Fortunately, from twenty feet away, it was easy work for the seals to shoot them in the head. To conserve their precious 5.56mm ammunition, Glenn used the local's weapon of choice, the AK-47 he'd recovered earlier. One shot at a time, Glenn put a round into skull after skull. 
Emotionless, he watched as blackened undead dropped to the ground over and over beside a handful of similar sad victims. Thomas watched idly from a few feet away, sickened by not only the stench of burning rotten flesh, but by their entire situation. Ten shots from the stamped rifle later, no more of the burnt dead came out of the hellhole. Their grisly task seemed completed once more. Okay, so fuck fire, Glenn said, slinging the AK. Yeah, fire bad. Let's go check on Raza, get moving if she's doing good. All right, I've had more than enough of this place anyway, Thomas said. Me too. The men never found any food or additional ammo in the village. Thomas smiled when he saw Raza half awake when they returned to the school building a few minutes later. She was distressed, but she returned his smile weakly with some relief on her face as he walked up to where she lay. Thomas sat down cross-legged on the floor in front of her and produced his small notebook. He wrote in Pashto for her. Are you okay? How is your pain? He handed the girl the little notebook and his pen. She took them in shaky small fingers and took a long time to write out a simple reply. I am in pain. Thomas took the book back and thought carefully. He wanted to ask her only questions she could nod or shake her head to. Watching how much work and pain it caused her to write made him feel terrible about how they communicated. Do you need medicine for the pain? She shook her head, indicating she did not want anything for the pain. Thomas was surprised at the little girl's strength. You were shot in the hip. You've lost a lot of blood, but we saved you. We need to move you to the soldier base we talked about last night. Thomas pointed at his hip, then at her hip, in case she wasn't aware of where her body had been damaged. She shook her head and motioned for the notebook. Thomas reluctantly handed it to her, and she painstakingly wrote out a message. We need to search for my family. They are not safe here. Thomas's facial expression betrayed his thoughts. She saw what he thought about her suggestion, and her little hands slumped in defeat. Her bright eyes fought hard and welled with meager tears. She shook her head slowly, emotion taking over. Thomas stretched out next to her on the floor and comforted her with a hand on her arm. She reached over and took his hand, squeezing it in a strong grasp. After several minutes of clutching his hand, the grip waned and she settled. Her strength was amazing. Thomas got his notebook from the floor where she dropped it and started writing again. This time he wrote off multiple messages, telling her how it was going to be. He paused between large sentences to allow for her slower reading. We will be carrying you to the military base in a few minutes. The trip will take several hours. We have to carry you on a thing like a bed. It will likely hurt some, but there is little we can do for that unless you want pain medicine. We are only a few miles away, but it will take time to walk there, especially if we are attacked like we were when you were hurt. When we get to the base, there should be more soldiers there, and they should be able to help us. There will be medicine for your injury as well as food and water for us. This trip will hurt, but we must do this if we are to survive. Only then can we look for your family. You must be stronger than ever, Raza. Raza nodded firmly, unafraid, and Thomas left to go help Glenn finish building the stretcher she would travel on. Carrying a person is exhausting, even if they are a small child that hasn't eaten nearly enough. Both men hadn't slept in longer than they could remember, and their mental exhaustion coupled with their physical exhaustion took its toll. It certainly didn't help that they were trekking over high elevation land that was more slope than anything. The terrain taxed the arms, legs, ankles, and lungs, even for two men in peak physical condition. Goats were made for this land, not men. Glenn walked at the front of the hastily built stretcher with his back to Raza. Thomas walked at the rear, keeping an eye on the child. Raza writhed in pain as the stretcher bounced and rocked. The two men couldn't walk safely on the rough Afghan terrain and keep her stable at the same time, and she paid the price in agony. Thomas watched as she welded her eyelids shut against the fire in her side. 
The concern he had now revolved more for the mental scars she might obtain from the journey than anything physical. The men had been on foot for almost thirty minutes in the fading evening light through the scrubby woodlands heading up and over the mountains to the FOB before Glenn saw the two figures following them. They were clearly alive, moving from cover to cover, attempting to use stealth. Through his M4A1's optics, Thomas could see they wore traditional Afghan clothing and carried weapons. The two seals put Raza down in an earthen recess behind a large stone, pressing up from the ground like a knuckle. Without exchanging a word, the two men dropped to the ground, and Thomas readied their long rifle. Down the length of the barrel through the scope, Thomas watched as the two men continued up the hill in a draw, attempting to scurry ten or fifteen feet at a time from rock to tree, from tree to rock. They both were armed with the insurgent weapon of choice with its trademark banana-shaped magazine. Glenn looked through the spotting tool mounted on a small tripod at the unfolding scene behind them. The high-powered optics was as good as the weapon's scope, if not better, and he watched as Thomas dialed the first shot in. Other than the difficulty posed by the encroaching darkness, this was an easy shot, perhaps three hundred yards downhill with a calm wind. Glenn and Thomas whispered a few bits of information back and forth, double-checking ranges, windage, rotation of the earth, and more. There was little to confirm, and both men had the dope for the shot dialed in automatically. Thomas heard Glenn give him the faint clear to fire, and in between heartbeats and the intake of breath, he gently operated the trigger and sent a lethal round down range. Thomas timed the round's impact for when the first man just ended his sprint to a tree. The round hit dead in the center of the pursuer's chest, and the two seals watched as a huge portion of his back sprayed out in a bloody chunk-filled mist. Thomas moved his body a tiny amount and put the crosshairs on the bulge that was the top of the head behind a rock of the other person following them. Before the head could duck down behind the large stone, Thomas squeezed the trigger a second time. The round sailed slightly lower than expected and skipped off the top of the boulder before hitting the crouched threat. They watched in professional appreciation as the top of the man's forehead was punctured by Ring's shot. His body almost stood straight up from the impact before falling backwards and tumbling down the rocks on the hill. Nice, Glenn whispered. Thank you, Thomas replied just as quiet. His eyes remained fixated on the area where the two targets had been alive just moments before. He waited for the inevitable. He didn't have to wait long. The first man he'd shot had died, but now stood back up. As the zombie pulled his body upright using the tree he'd been running to cover for, Thomas erased his head with a third and final round. This time, his body went down for good. The two seals packed up their sniper equipment and went back to the suffering Raza. Their trip was not over just yet. Sniper teams like Glenn and Thomas specialize not only in dealing death from afar, but in gathering information— the two men had been placed dozens of times on missions where they never intended to take a shot. Sometimes their skill and training as observers and spotters was all that was required. As the two men sat on a ridge 200 yards from the FOB, they used that very skill set as well as night vision equipment to determine what their course of action would be. I see no movement at all, Glenn said as he peered through his optics at the base. The base sprawled across a flat ledge on the side of the opposing ridge from where the two men and Raza were. The ledge ran perhaps a hundred yards from side to side, running parallel to a road that ran along the cliffside the base fronted. The ledge's back ended in a high rock outcropping, perhaps twenty yards to the rear. Both men wondered what the back side of the ridge looked like. The rear rock facing the base sat against seemed like a bad strategic weakness. The base had walls made of sand-filled HESCO barriers, plywood, and logs. The gate to enter the base was made of steel rebar, welded plates of scrap metal and concertina wire. It sat ajar, leaving a two-foot-wide gap. That open gate is bad juju. I can see one Humvee. The three sandbox structures I have have no movement, and the two Conex containers are wide open at the end, I can see. It looks like everyone left in a bit of a hurry, Thomas said, his intense focus on the base's layout paying off with clues. 
Agreed. If there were still living soldiers down there, the gate would be closed. You see signs of a firefight? You think they were hit by insurgents or undead? Glenn scanned the facility with his spotter's optics as well. I can see some RPG impacts as well as pretty typical small arms fire damage. No idea if it's new or not. I'm sure this place caught hell on the regular before all this zombie shit started going down. No way of telling. Glenn agreed, but said nothing. Let's observe for another hour. That'll give us, what, three hours of darkness to recon the joint? We leave Raza in the tree line at the base of the valley down there and move her up and in once we know it's safe. Torrance nodded. The plan was as good a plan as any. The gate of the base rocked back and forth gently in the cool night air. A slight breeze moved the metal barrier back and forth a few inches, releasing a disturbing low groan. Thomas stifled a shudder as he approached the ominous shape. Somehow, the varying shades of green in his night vision served not to sterilize the situation, but heighten the uncertainty and anxiety. Without all the colors available to his eyes, Thomas's imagination filled the darkest areas where his gear failed with images of blood and death. The two men infiltrated through the open gate and immediately moved to clear the center building, twenty feet inside the gate. The building was made of what was available, just the same as the other two. A few hesco barriers formed the corner pillars, and a mixture of plywood, logs, and bags of sand the walls. The building looked ugly, but the seals knew the structure was far tougher than it looked. The ingenuity brought of desperation was sometimes quite effective. The interior of what they discovered to be the main barracks of the base was a single large room filled with cots, trunks, and lockers. In the green glow of their night vision equipment, the operators saw multiple weapons very similar to theirs lying about. Who leaves their rifle behind, Thomas said. Insane soldiers, or dead ones who don't remember how to operate the bang switch, I reckon, Glenn replied. Which do we run into first? The two men moved at a blistering combat pace, leaving no sound in the air and no trace of their movements behind. They moved straight to the back of the central building and out the rear exit doors. Because of the terrible location of the base, the stone face was right opposite the exit, and they were briefly in a funnel. Both men instinctively felt an additional danger and hustled out to the building to the south. Other than several large antennas on the roof and a small satellite dish, the building was almost completely identical to the barrack structure, and, staying in suit, there was a similar rear exit. The exit door was a heavily reinforced sheet of plywood that Glenn had to pry open with a small crowbar tool he produced from his ruck. They both carried small titanium pry bars for just this occasion, as rare as the occasion might be. The door popped inward with the sound of the frame's ripping wood and was immediately shoved shut by pressure from the inside. Glenn backed away as both men brought their weapons to bear on the door at head height, the sound of scratching and clawing mixed with the low impacts of what sounded like boots inside made the two men angry. There were dead inside. Glenn thumbed his selector to full auto and ripped a stream of suppressed rounds across the door at where he guessed the faces of his fallen comrades would be. Half a magazine later, there was the sound of a heavy weight careening off some kind of furniture, and then silence. The wooden door, now bashed loose and barely holding onto the hinges, swung inward, revealing an American soldier, clearly dead for some time on the floor, decapitated by Glenn's buzzsaw fire. The two men pressed slowly inward, revealing the command room for the abandoned facility. Smashed radio gear and laptops still connected by cables that looked like veins and arteries were strewn about, covered in blood and gore long since crusted over in the high mountain dry air. Multiple dead bodies were scattered around the room, some on the floor, some sitting in chairs holding sidearms in loose hands with wounds to their chins, and some ripped apart by what might have been wild animals. You think an animal did that? Glenn asked. Thomas shook his head. I think that guy you wasted at the door did that. Jury's out on whether or not you can call them animals, though. Jesus Christ, Tommy, this is fucked up. I don't mind shooting insurgents and the zombies of Afghans, but I just put an American down, man. One of us. I'm gonna lose sleep over this. No, you're not. 
You're going to sleep like a baby. You know why? Because you just put that man, a fellow warrior, to rest. You didn't kill him. You released him from torment and brought him peace. And one way or the other, Glenn, when anyone dies now, they're a threat. I bet my left nut there are people killing family members left and right all over the world because that's what needs to be done to survive now. Glenn looked back at Thomas and nodded grimly. All Glenn could think of was his wife. He wondered if they were together when all this happened. Would he have the strength to kill her? Let's finish clearing this place and get Raza up here. We've only got an hour of darkness left, and I don't want to overexpose us to anything. Let's see if anyone else is home. Thomas patted his friend firmly on the back, and they left the ravaged communications room to find what other dangers were left in waiting for them. They found two more animated corpses in the latrine stalls on the far side of the facility. It looked to both tired warriors that at some point there was a hasty exodus from the base, and those soldiers leaving the base stored their recently deceased brethren in the bathrooms to stay safe from them. Whoever had put the dead bodies in the porta potties twisted the door locks closed and jammed either a stick through the lock to jam it or tied the doors shut with a length of paracord. Neither Navy man had respect for the idea. The two men heard the doors rattle and nearly break open when they approached, and they dealt with the two dead men by yanking the door open while the other fired upon and killed the confused zombie within. The smell somehow upped the ante from the crawl space below the house in the Afghan village they just cleaned out. In all, they counted twenty-eight bodies and one Humvee, Glenn shut and fastened the gate closed with the iron rods and concrete blocks the original inhabitants used. If the gate was hit by a vehicle, it'd fold like a house of cards, but it should hold out against a handful of undead and buy them time to handle the problem. Raza was put in the communications room after the two operators cleaned it out. Any intelligence to be had would likely be there, and it didn't make sense to split up into different buildings— a moved cot from the barracks became her new home. A retreat from FOB Forestall had to have been one done in incredible haste. Two dozen M4s were left behind, as was several thousand rounds of ammunition. Body armor was left on beds, and medical supplies were covered in dust on the shelves. In the metal Conex containers, they retrieved multiple cases of MREs, as well as flats of plastic water bottles. For all intents and purposes, the base was a gold mine for the seals. Everything they needed to survive for some time was here. Everything but friendly survivors. There's a note here. It's written in someone's notebook dated a few days ago, Thomas said, sitting in an office chair with his feet up on a folding table. His M4A1 was disassembled in front of him mid-cleaning. Glenn was cleaning his sidearm near Raza. What does it say? Glenn asked. Thomas cleared his throat and took a sip of water from a plastic bottle. It says, Kandahar untenable per Colonel Matthews. Kandahar base is secured. Single approach from the east is open and held, leaving at 4 a.m. tomorrow to consolidate forces there. That's where it ends. According to the date on it, that would have been two days ago. Huh, strange. What happened to them that they left in such a fucking hurry? Were they hit by the people from the town over the ridge? Glenn asked, replacing the slide on his pistol. Something big must have happened. They clearly left here in a big fucking hurry ahead of schedule. Glenn shook his head. Doesn't add up, man. If they were attacked, there would be spent brass everywhere here. There's nothing out of the ordinary. I think something happened inside the wall. Someone went loony and took the fuck off after acing people. Why else would they stuff bodies in the fucking shitter, man? Thomas looked at Raza and wondered which people were worse, the folks that had shot her or the folks that could have perpetrated a massacre like the one that had happened here at Forward Operating Base Forestall. He knew the people that had shot her were dead, and he hoped the latter were the same. Well, if Kandahar is still secured as of a few days ago, my bet is the place is still secure. Getting through the city might be a bit of a bitch for a whole lot of reasons, but the way I see it, we won't make it out here for long. Eventually, we'll run out of food, and to be honest, I want to go home, Thomas said as he sat up and reassembled his weapon. It took seconds for his experienced and deft fingers. I want to see my wife, Glenn said, 
looking up at his friend and brother in arms. I want to see your wife. Not funny, asshole. Thomas grinned. It was kind of funny. Yeah, a little. But seriously, I want to see my goddamn wife. I want to go home. Thomas nodded emphatically in agreement. I say we give our little deaf anchor here a full day to recuperate, then we load up with everything that isn't nailed or screwed to the floor in that last Humvee, and we head the fuck out. I'm down like a clown. Kandahar, here we come, Thomas said, as he opened up his second MRE of the morning. November 2013 November 2nd, 2013 More radio traffic from the NVC people. More the same as well. Command and control messages from Captain Piccarillo to his team as they search the city outskirts to the north and progressively west. We're getting the impression that they're trying to get last-minute supplies before the snow starts, which will be soon. Hector and Jason, my old bouncer colleague at the factory, got some distant eyes on the other day, which I'll talk about in a bit. Kevin has been listening to them intently, going so far as to leave his new woman Becky and their daughters Shelby and Chloe here in Hall E with the rest of us close family folks so he can sleep in the Humvee and listen in as needed. He has christened them Pasta and the Pastettes. I tried to explain to Kevin that his overnights were unneeded, but he wouldn't listen. Every hint could matter, brother, was his comeback, and he's right. I just hate to see his family suffer as he takes nights away. I guess that's the bitch of having your family so close to danger and duty. When we were deployed to Iraq, it was easy to forget about how you were treating your family. Easy to forget that a missed phone call home felt like the end to someone. That's not to say that shit didn't weigh on you. I still lose sleep over it once in a blue moon. But fuck, I'm nervous. Like, really fucking nervous. We celebrated Halloween a couple days ago here on campus and had just enough leftover candy and homemade sweets. Lots of tiny caramels, which are absurdly yummy. We did it here at Bastion. I know Spring Meadows and the factory celebrated as well, but the couple of kids at MGR just came here. The apartment tower in town is only a few miles away, after all. Most popular costume of the night for girls was a ghost. White sheets are plentiful, well, stained sheets, really. And since the dreams that so many of us had during the days of the undead walking, everyone firmly believes in the afterlife and in ghosts. Michelle had each of the kids wearing a sheet as a ghost pick who they were being so that they could tell the story of a dead relative or friend they lost during... Well, during it. At first I thought it was morbid, but it turned out to be cute. It's helped build the feeling of closure, I think. Ghosts are people we knew, friends, not just malicious spirits that turn your television on in the middle of the night. They were people. Their memories. They matter. The most popular boys' costume is a split down the middle with half the boys dressed in oversized BDUs wearing the closest thing they could find to a white baseball cap, and the other half all cut their hair into mohawks and drew fake tattoos on their arms and legs. If you're keeping score at home, Mr. Journal, that would make half of them little Kevin Wittens, and the other half little Adrian Rings. Creepy, yet flattering at the same time. See also, Michelle gets no love— unless everyone thinks she's a ghost. They were so fucking proud of their costumes, so excited when they showed off who they were to Kevin and me, so friggin' happy. I put on the best possible face I could to make it seem like I was enthusiastic about it, but my mind was elsewhere. I kept thinking of the movement of the NVC people less than an hour away and how strange it was that all the suffering I experienced has led to people thinking I'm some kind of fucking folk hero. Michelle knew it bothered me. When we laid in bed that night with Otis stuck between us like the filling of an ice cream sandwich, she talked to me about it, reassuring me, letting me know it was natural and good for heroes to be celebrated. We made love after, and that helped. She doesn't get my perspective of it. She can't. I didn't do anything to be a hero. I hated so much of it, dreaded it. 
avoided it, fought against it. It took Herculean will to achieve what I did over the course of almost two years, and if they knew how scarred I was on the inside, how hobbled and hindered and infested with doubt I am, they wouldn't celebrate it. They wouldn't think what they do of me. I'm not the man they want me to be, not the man they think I am. Michelle's retort with that fucking beautiful smile of hers, backed up with all this wisdom and shit, is that I am a hero because I bear those scars. She says that the people know what I suffered and that it is because I survived they look up to me. They see me for the man that fought beyond his own doubt and achieved the impossible anyway. They look up to Kevin and her as well, though for different reasons. Her for her spiritual calm, conscience, and foresight, and him for his bravery and dedication to duty. Sometimes we're celebrated not because of the ease with which we wore a burden, but because we wore that burden at all. I have a real hard time digesting the whole fucking thing. To make matters worse, to pass the time while Abby takes care of baby Gavin, she has started to write and publish a small newsletter. It's a single sheet of paper with three columns of news that she posted yesterday and today across campus. She posted one on each of the dorm's doors as well as on the main school building, the gymnasium where my sister Becca and her boyfriend Ryan run our substantial hydroponics garden, as well as the maintenance area down the hill and back and at the cafeteria. I gave Abby shit about writing a newsletter at dinner tonight in that very school cafeteria, and she claims, and I quote, It gives me a reason to go for a walk with Gavin, and it's an easy way for us to get news out to the people who have questions. I politely suggested that she find something more productive to do, and she reminded me with a smile, I quote again, our liberty depends on the freedom of the press, and that cannot be limited without being lost. I fucking hate nerds. I wouldn't object to her writing about current events nearly so much, but in just two of her newsletters, she's managed to share little tidbits about our listening to foreign-slash-potentially-dangerous radio traffic, as well as bringing up weird spiritual questions that make me think she's been spending too much time debating deep theology with Michelle— who, oddly enough, rarely brings up anything religious with me. I guess I'm really bitching about having to field questions alongside Kevin and Michelle as to who we're listening to, why it's a big deal, what our plans are to deal with it, and will we have enough food for winter, Adrian? Will we? Will we? Will my kids starve? Will you protect me when they come? Jesus, shit, all I do is try to answer fucking questions— if I leave Hall E, it's like a goddamn waterboarding session, and I have no answers for people because shit's still developing. I can't tell them who these people are because I don't fucking know. I can't tell them what the plan is because we haven't made one yet. I can't tell them why it's a big deal beyond the fact that they're strangers and strangers are scary. We have plenty of food barring a fire or crisis, that much I know. I shouldn't have fucking said that. God damn it. I need fairy repellent spray now, and a lighter. I'll set that ornery bitch on fire and punt her over to the MVC assholes for them to deal with. <sighs> cranky today. Like, really cranky. It's stress. I get that. You remember me being all tough guy macho back in the day? Talking about me being a sea nail, hammer nail kind of dude? I don't do diplomacy all that well, and I hate being second-guessed. In the military, you're told what you need to know, and if you don't get the info you need, you do the best you can with the information and resources you have. I want to tell these people to do their damn job, stay in their fucking lane, and not worry about it. But it doesn't work like that. They need to be placated, kept happy, assured that everything will be all right, and of course, they don't fucking want to be lied to, but... When you give them real news, as bad as it could be, they get pissed and angry at you because life isn't perfect and somehow it's all your fault, all my fault. Politics. I hate fucking politics. I hate it almost as much as stubbing my toe in the dark or that feeling when I know I've said something hurtful to someone I love. That's a shit feeling, Mr. Journal. This is running long, and I have more to say. I'm a long-winded motherfucker at times. 
As I said, Hector and Jason went out and essentially scouted the NVC people using decent digital cameras and rifles with decent optics. Their goal was to gather information and take photos under the radar. They did that. Hector swung by this morning and showed us what he'd gathered. Using Jay's previous meetings with them to identify people in Hector's photos, we were able to put names to a handful of faces, most notably Captain Piccarillo, who is a little Mediterranean-looking dweeb with a visible case of little man's disease, and a few of his sergeants. They definitely have an M113 APC with a heavy M250 cal mounted on top. Hector snagged a picture with an angle on the belt-fed ammo going into the weapon, so we know it's not just for show. He didn't take any pictures of cannons, thankfully, but that's bad enough. On the days that Hector was able to take pictures, they had twin Humvees stripped of unit markings and both with M250s. In the pictures, Kevin, Mike, and I were still able to identify belted ammunition feeding all the guns, so we know they aren't just for show. We have to assume they have enough ammo to run train on us. The good news, if you like, optimistic in the face of doom is that they didn't have any MK-19 grenade launchers. That would have been a big fucking problem. Well, a bigger fucking problem growing on top of our existing big fucking problem like a problem wart. He also saw a total of 14 uniformed soldiers, each with M4 or M16 platform weapons. Hector and Jason both commented that more than half of the soldiers looked to be amateurs, or at least new and nervous, which I took to be a good sign in the middle of a whole lot of bad. Fourteen of those guns against us is a bad thing. That's an entire squad, and that's just their search team. What happens when they get ramped up for a real fight? God, this sucks bad, but alas, I am tired as fuck, and Michelle is restless beside me. I think she can tell when I'm annoyed or nervous, even in her sleep. She's such a receptor like that. I'm shutting down for the night and curling up with her and Otis so they can both sleep better. Can't speak to whether or not I'll find peace. Yeah. Adrian. November 5th, 2013. Oh, it's fucking moving now. The NVC people made contact with the factory earlier today, and as I've often said to myself when the ninja shits strike me in the dark of night, shit just got real. Shits just got real. It's often plural. My shits come in team format, rarely solo. Furthermore, I know far more about the cut of Celeste's jib, and I have far more respect for her than I ever thought I would have. I like being impressed by people on my side, way better than being let down by them. Let me get to it. It started an hour or so after noon. Sentries on the factory roof saw the NVC search patrol heading their way, and they too saw the sentries on the roof. We chalked it up to shit luck they hadn't found the repurposed strip club up to then. We heard on the military channel immediately that they changed posture, anticipating an attack. Here at Bastion, we spun up as well. Our QRF got ready and into the vehicles and started moving east. I was off rotation today, as was Kevin, and while they relocated to be closer and the event shit went down, the two of us clung to the radios like a crackhead to a rock. Piccarillo over the radio made the call to approach and make contact. While they were talking over the military channels, we made small talk over the civilian channels, using innocuous codes to inform the factory in Spring Meadows our QRF force was heading their way and that they should avoid hostilities at all costs until they arrived. And I wanted to go so bad. If things had gone even a little differently, both Kevin and I would have been on the road in seconds, regardless of whether or not we were on rotation that day. When the call comes, everyone answers. The rotation exists just to make it feel like you have a day off. You never actually have a day off. Back on target... The NVC people rolled up at first with just the M113. Made sense. In a setting such as ours, armor like that is basically impenetrable, and I imagine that idea lends them balls. They have little reason to expect that anyone in the continental United States has a weapon powerful enough to take that tank out. Celeste and Hector made a plan and followed through. They filled us in about it just a few minutes ago in person. 
Hector had his shooters move to elevated positions in the industrial area the factory's in. The larger mill buildings and actual factories nearby had been cleared and they knew good shooting positions, had several prepared already, in fact. So as the M113 made its approach, they already had four shooters ready to strike if anyone dismounted. Hector went to the roof of the factory and Celeste, like a boss, I might add, walked out the reinforced steel front door straight up to the tank with nothing more than her 9mm on her hip. Well, the 9mm and one of the little walkies we've been using since way back. We heard her whole conversation with Picarillo live, matched up later with the closed-circuit video feed that Andy set up, which was an entire treat. You remember that, right? Andy, the tech nerd from the factory who set up the closed Wi-Fi camera system over there, then did it here? We've managed to maintain the systems and keep them up and running, which, up until now, has been only marginally useful. But today, the system paid off. After listening live, we watched the electronic recording of the video and then watched it again later with Hector and Celeste once they got here. Good shit, yo. Back to the story at hand. The hatch opened with a creak, and Celeste said, Hello, I'm Celeste Carlson. I'm in charge here. How can I help you? He says, I am Captain Piccarillo with the Northern Valley Cooperative. Pleasure to meet you. We're reestablishing a central government in the area and have been conducting a search for supplies and assets, as well as taking a census. It's nice to meet you, Miss Carlson. I knew it was him. Reminded me of Goodfellas, Joe Pesci, but with less nasally wine. Kind of looked like a younger version of him, too, but with a stronger jawline and no talent. As he finished talking, we could hear the hydraulic release of the APC's ramp dropping. They were dismounting to take up defensive positions around their little convoy. They're not entirely stupid. Are you guys in contact with Washington? Celeste asked. She sounded unimpressed by the show of force happening around her. No, there doesn't appear to be anyone in charge down there, miss. We're a remnant force of several National Guard units that have come together to help get the infrastructure back up and running. We're working with other government agencies in the region to restore order. I see, she said. Where are you located? There aren't any bases near here. Couple of hours north. We've reinforced the old Calendar Mountain Resort. We have food and water and a fully operational biodiesel facility on site. Plenty of room in the luxury condos for new residents, and the town at the base of the mountain is clear and safe of undead and raiders. It's heavenly. That's a pretty hard sell, Captain, Celeste said. From the tone of her voice on the scratchy transmission, I could tell she was grinning at him. He laughed. Yeah, well, I drank the Kool-Aid. It really is great. Understood. You know there are no more zombies anywhere, right? Saying it's clear of zombies up there is sort of a moot point. It's clear everywhere, she teased him. Yeah, that's what we're discovering. Seems like one day they all just fell down and gave up. March 3rd of 2012, she said. That was the day I shot Cassie's zombie, the day I forgave myself and proved to the powers that be that humanity was worth a second chance. Well, most of humanity, I think. Maybe. I guess it was about then, yeah, Picarillo said. No, it was exactly that day at 3 p.m., give or take. That's when Adrian earned us our second chance. Picarillo seemed thrown off by that comment. I keep hearing of this Adrian dude. People passing through talk about him every once in a while. I don't get it. Folk hero bullshit legends, I bet. People trying to figure out why lightning strikes. You haven't met him, Celeste said with far too much confidence for my tastes. Or Kevin, or Michelle. The three of them, they did it. I looked over at Kevin, and he winced at the mention of his name, too. What is it about us that he and I hate to be talked about like we're important? You've met this Adrian guy? You being serious? Picarillo asked. You could tell the dude was shocked. 
We must have felt very fictional to him, theoretical people, boogeymen. Yeah, he doesn't live that far from here. He's a great guy. You'd imagine that, being the savior of mankind and all. No shit, huh? We had heard he was local. Well, I know if he's the real deal, I'd like to meet him. Does he run a settlement too, or is he like a forest hermit being all Yoda? She laughed. I laughed. Kevin snickered. He's more Han Solo than Yoda. I might be able to get in touch with him. I can't guarantee he'll make the trip to meet you, but you'll like him if he does. He's a good man. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions about your place here? Depends on what you're asking. I suppose you ask and see what happens. Yeah, sure, Piccarillo said. Can you give me an idea of how many people you have here? Are you 50-50 men and women? Well, that's easy enough. We have about 50 of us, and we're more women than men. The place used to be a strip club, and the girls have stayed here. We lost most of our men during the worst of the zombie days. I'd say we're like 35 women, half dozen of us are kids. You're safe here? Well armed? Well enough. A few military rifles, hunting rifles and pistols. A few National Guardsmen and vets mixed in with our numbers. We do very well. It's a safe area. I heard some squeaking and imagined the captain moving around in the open hatch of the tank. It's a noise you don't forget. How do you guys get water? This building has to be on city water here. You can't have a well. Yeah, that's a struggle. We collect rainwater and snow, supplement with water from outside the city limits, creeks, streams, that kind of thing. It's been enough as long as we don't overpopulate. Since the zombies died off, we've been heading over to the river with buckets and pails, bringing the kids. It's not ideal, but the building is safe, and it's home now. Whatever works. Are there other groups in the area? Anyone known to be hostile? Anyone we should be on the lookout for? More people every week, it feels. Some moving into apartments and houses in the city or suburbs. People coming home, I guess. We can't keep track of them all. No large groups, to my knowledge. We haven't had a run-in with anyone in a long time. Life's just easier now, Captain. People are feeling safer. Food is growing. The sun is shining. Yeah, winter is on its way, but the summer was good. Wow. All right, great. Thank you for the information. That's very helpful. Please consider hearing more about Calendar Mountain. We have room if any of your people are interested in relocation. I don't want to keep you. We've got other places to check out as well. I'll be back in a few days. Today is the 5th. We'll swing back through it about this time on the 10th. Does that work for your people? Is there a better day? I think we have an intramural softball game followed by a pig roast that night. Kevin and I laughed at her joke, but Piccarillo didn't. It took him a solid ten seconds to catch up that she was being sarcastic. Told us a lot about him. He walks on stilts. Okay, then. About an hour or two after noon, we'll swing by. Do you need any trade goods? Do you have a surplus of anything you'd like to trade? He asked, all back to business. It's funny how the people who think they're strong move the conversation without regard to the ideas or wishes of who they think are the weak. Celeste thought about it. The radio was silent other than the hiss of having the mic on for a good half minute. Well, we have a lot of cucumbers and about eight jars of homemade garlic and dill pickles. We'd be happy to trade those for anything canned or meat, any kind of protein sources. We don't get much game here. That'd be great. I'll see what Calendar Mountain has to offer. We'll see you in five days. Mount up, everyone. Celeste walked away, and the audio faded off. I heard the APC's treads on the street clank away, and we shut down the QRF's movement to the factory. No need to let them know we had a hammer swinging towards an anvil. Celeste and Hector came here to Bastion much later and filled us in. We covered so fucking much it's not even funny. So fucking much, there's too little time tonight to talk about it here, Mr. Journal. 
I'll list off our next steps tomorrow. Adrian. November 6th, 2013. All right, I'm not the best military planner, but Kevin's fairly solid, and together with our other brains earlier this morning, we sketched out a preliminary plan to be ready on the 10th for the NVC meeting. Using actual paper maps salvaged from gas stations and libraries, we hand-drew ourselves a brand new map of the neighborhood around the club, and we guessed at their most likely routes of approach. If they were smart, they would roll in on a different street than the one they came in on originally. Now, because we know the area they're working in, we've got a very strong idea of the alternate route they'll take. Accordingly, we planned on them coming towards the factory on the original route, and the route most likely to be their secondary route. Either way, we have a central kill box in front of the old strip club, and a portion of our perimeter forces will fall back to make sure if the situation develops poorly— we have overwhelming firepower, M113 APC or not. Now, against their M2 machine guns, an elevated firing position is a direct requirement. We must engage from above their armor to get their gunners back down inside the Humvees. Luckily, the area of the city the factory's in has plenty of buildings that are three to six stories tall. A few offices, but mostly large brick mill buildings with shot-out windows and deep, dark recesses. A few good shots with a deer rifle theoretically shuts their big guns down. Now, the AT-4 anti-tank weapons can be fired from above as well. In fact, it'd be ideal. Tank armor is thickest on the sides and front and weakest at the rear, bottom, or on the top. Putting a couple AT-4s up high is good, and for shits and grins, a couple low is solid too. We know the terrain better than they do, and we can maneuver behind them for a better kill shot, again, in theory. Kevin selected a few innocuous places for folks to set up along the two routes we felt were most likely, and then we established a plan for my appearance. Unanimously, we agreed that my showing up would put Picarillo on his heels and really test his mettle. It puts me in a precarious position, but what the fuck is new about that? I'm nervous and excited all at once. My hands are trembling. I'm like a, a fart away from breaking a sweat, and I've cleaned all my weapons twice this afternoon. Michelle gave me a rash of shit for it, but she's never had a gun malfunction on her in a firefight. Against zombies is one thing, but against people, it's another thing entirely. Yes, it's obsessive. Yes, it's excessive. Yes, it's a compulsion. It's also all warranted. And if she wants me back in this bed whole or mostly whole on the night of the tent alongside my friends and family, it's what I have to do. Ugh. Kevin has training on the AT-4. We have the spent AT-4 from the day we went into the city to find Cassie on hand, and he says we can use that as a training tool. I haven't shot one since infantry school, so I'll be attending. You can never train enough. We've also appropriated 20 rounds per shooter to hit our range at the back of campus to hone in their trigger time. We haven't been shooting nearly as regularly, and proper gunplay skills expire if not used. Many of us will be rusty if shit goes down. Anyway, my plan is to go against my own grain and play up the religious icon role at the meet, try and convince him that we are actually good people and literally chosen, as we were. If I can convince him to leave us far behind and move on because we're, like, divinely awesome, all the better. I'd rather be thought of as a kook to be avoided than a target to be eliminated. Maybe this plan is us playing it wrong. Michelle doesn't think so. She's all for the spread of the idea of faith and truth. She believes to her core that we really are a new beginning, and we need to embrace it in every way we can, whether it makes us uncomfortable or not. Kevin's got it easy. As the warden, the protector, the enforcer, if you want to take it a step further, all he has to do is kick ass and optionally take names to live up to his part in this. I'm jealous. I'm supposed to be some fucking icon to teach people how to live again, and I'm terrible at being an adult, let alone a role model. It's fucking embarrassing. You know what's the worst piece of it all for me? Kevin and I just had a moment of quiet time together after dinner as he puffed one of our few remaining cigarettes, 
and we just exchanged this hard, knowing glance about the situation. This would be a dangerous meet with people who we would expect to be safe and reasonable, and we have hard, first-hand account evidence that these people aren't always safe or reasonable. They engaged the Wilson Scrapyard people for no good reason we could define, and we know from the survivors who came south previously that these people have a history of treating people badly. Remember Lindsay's story of her and Doug getting pushed out because the NVC were expanding and taking over their property? We've heard it multiple times over. They're expansionists. They want control. A smart leader would strongly consider pulling the trigger at this meet and taking their patrol group out. Neuter the clear threat, remove their ability to intimidate your people, and show whoever the fuck you leave alive that you are the baddest wolf in the baddest pack running in the forest. But I can't do that. I just fucking can't. I have to give them a chance. I need to try and redeem their past mistakes. I have to extend the open hand of kinship and hope that it goes well. I just have to. It's what I fought so long to achieve. I need to give them an opportunity to right themselves before I... Well, let's not think about what happens if they turn out to be the enemy Jay Wilson thinks they are. I'd like to think those days are over, that my wolf skin is hung for good and I'm just walking amongst safe sheep. Training and preparation between now and the ninth. We're headed there the day before to set up for the meeting. It'll be a long day and night for us, but being in position far in advance will be crucial. I'm nervous. A smidge hopeful, too. Adrian November 11th, 2013 We have problems. Yesterday we ventured to the factory to meet with Captain Picarillo and his scouting-slash-strong-arm appropriations committee. I'd intended on putting the fear of God into the little man with the big tank, but things don't go always as planned. It'll be easier if I just explain what happened. We were ready for them. Our anti-tank weapons were in trained hands, ready to fire on their armor if need be. Communications gear and signals were prepared. IOTV vests were on our combatants, as were helmets. Ammunition dispersed, cover prepared, dialogue kind of scripted, and teeth brushed. Hell, most of us started the day with clean underwear, too. We dispersed our vehicles into local garages and ground-level warehouse entrances so they weren't visible, yet were still easily accessible. We could need our Humvee-mounted saws on the move fast and stage them in a place where they had a fast exit. I myself had a spot across the street from the factory in the second floor of the warehouse opposite. I took up position ten feet inside an office with my marine brother Caleb plus Danny McGreevy Jr. and his daddy's hunting rifle. There are few people on the earth I'd want looking down a scope on my behalf beyond this kid. Happy in PJs, maybe. Maybe. He may be young, but his cop dad taught him how to shoot, and we've only built on that. I've taken to calling him the Ginger Reaper for his headshot skills. Anyway, the air yesterday felt dry and bitterly cold. A few snowflakes came out of the sky every few minutes as well. A strong west-to-east wind kicked up the leaves that were covering the ground and gave our longest-distance shooters a bit of worry as to whether or not they'd make their shots when it counted. I felt confident in them. They'd come through for us in the clutch before. Ethan and Joel, the PJs, were on hand to shoot and lend medical care, plus Kevin and Quan were in elevated positions to make shots. That's not even counting Abby and Hal, plus Blake, who were there yesterday too, despite my protests. I believe our newest parents need to raise their children. Hell, I wanted my brother Caleb to be elsewhere too, but I don't get my way often. Right on time, Picarillo's convoy came into our AO, and we knew shit had changed. They came to our subtle ambush with a show of force that outclassed us in every way. Picarillo's M113 led the way with four up-armored Humvees in tow, followed by a pair of up-armored HEMTTs and two more M113s playing caboose. The new APCs had M250 cals, and the two new Humvees had the MK-19 grenade launchers we prayed didn't exist. They approached on the avenue we anticipated as their second path. We were ready for that, but 
not for the amount of armored targets they presented us with. Before they stopped moving, we were behind the eight ball, and if we pulled the trigger, we would be outgunned, and I soon saw we would be outnumbered, too. We couldn't miss a shot with the AT-4s or we'd be fucked, and that margin for error wouldn't work for us. It's too close to a fair fight. You know what the first rule of a fair firefight is? Find a way to make it unfair for the other guy. Picarillo's tank stopped with one Humvee directly in front of the old strip club's fence opening, and the rest of the group spread out well along the length of the street. The uniformed soldier types immediately dismounted to pull security. I couldn't see it all from my hidey hole, but I could hear their chatter on the military frequencies in my earpiece and could put two and two together. The pit of my stomach felt filled with lead, lead and fucking sadness. The writing went on the wall, and we knew it. We were not the biggest wolf in the forest that day. Kevin grabbed up our police radio and sent out a tiny transmission on that channel, so theoretically the NVC people didn't hear it. He said, Hold steady, everyone. Adrian has the ball. Yeah, right. Like I'm gonna make that call and enter into a firefight with multiple armored vehicles, numerous heavy machine guns, and several fully automatic grenade launchers. I know how that decision pans out. I fought in Iraq. I saw what we did to those insurgents with the same tools. Celeste greeted the captain with a smile that didn't give away any of the nervousness she later confessed to, or any of the knowledge she had of our prepared counterattack. I won't recount their conversation here, it's all been said before, and you can imagine what he said and what she said. It started boring, moved to trade talk, they brought a dozen plastic gallon jugs of water as a gift, and then meandered to the captain bringing up the idea of allying with the factory people, then flat out suggesting that they up and relocate to the valley where Calendar Mountain is. I had felt my mind slowing during Celeste and Picarillo's conversation, I felt it drift away, trying to bury itself in the logistics of a hasty retreat from this situation. How to lay down suppressing fire on the vehicles to buy us time to get out in hours. How then to elude them on the surface streets, lose them so we could get home to Bastion. If they followed us all the way there, though, we still couldn't take them out. They'd smash our gates down and roll over us like dough in a bakery. My brain refused to focus on the moment, in the moment, and it took Celeste laughing at something Picarillo said to snap me out of it. I was here to make a statement. I needed to make a statement. I might not be able to turn them away with our quasi-military might, but I could use words to instill doubt or trust. I told my older brother I was going to head down and talk. Dude, what if they shoot you? Caleb asked me. I don't think that scenario was one we skipped when we planned this. It'll be okay, I said to him. Or it won't. Either way, it's gonna happen. For some reason, I stopped before I left the office and looked at the growing Danny. He's getting bigger every day like his dad, tall and broad, popular with the girls. He looked fearful, worried for me. I winked at him, and for some reason I took off my military radio and the police hand radio as well. I didn't want Picarillo to know we had that gear. It was bad enough that I would have body armor and be carrying my M4A1 and the Kimber 10mm. I took a huge risk leaving the warehouse. When I reached the open door, I knew there was a young male soldier on a knee less than five feet away covering the entrance, and I really didn't want him to shoot me. One coming out, I hollered at him, and he twitched like I'd tasered him. His gun pointed into the darkness of the doorframe past where I'd slid to the side, and I showed him both my hands as I slowly emerged into the street. I moved my rifle to my side. Captain? The young soldier yelled to Picarillo as I walked into the brisk November day. I saw a single snowflake float down from the sky, and somehow that made it all feel worse to me made me feel alone, exposed. I watched the short Italian wearing cold weather gear and an olive drab winter hat spin in his turret to see me. 
His face hardened, and I knew he felt like the balance had shifted, even with his tanks and big guns. I'd been there all along, and he hadn't known it. I'd gotten inside his head, for better or for worse. You must be Captain Piccarillo, I said to him with a guarded grin. Of the Northern Valley Cooperative, who are you? He replied gravely and terse. I'm Adrian Ring. I might as well have opened up on him with a minigun. He froze. The kid in front of me stood and froze, practically at attention, and all the soldiers who could hear me say my name stood in turn doing the same. If I'd wanted to pull the trigger on an ambush, that would have been the moment. Their collective pants were down. The captain gathered his wits and gave me an epic head-to-toe eye-fucking. He looked at my gear, my stance, my face, and then my hair. He wasn't impressed. I thought you had a mohawk, he said. I'm going for a more adult look lately. I like your hat. It's a pleasure to meet you, I said. He nodded and agreed, saying the same. Fake. Celeste here said she knew you, said she could arrange a meeting. I can't say I was expecting that to happen today. Without breaking eye contact, I laughed at him. With a show like the one you brought today, I find that hard to believe. All this armor seems designed to impress or intimidate. I watched as his eyes got thin and he got angry. I called him out correctly. He'd expected me and wanted this to be intimidating. My laughter and honest assessment took the wind out of those sails. Well, new group with unknown threats, figured it'd be safer to move out with a larger force in the event of an ambush. You wouldn't know about any ambushes happening today, would you, Mr. Ring? I shrugged, still looking him in the eye. Adrian is fine, Captain. I appreciate you having the patience to chat with me like this. I appreciate you hiding in a building, then coming out like a ghost while my back is turned. Doesn't speak to your honesty. I shrugged again. It does speak to how I didn't shoot you in the back of the head, though, doesn't it, Captain? The trickles of people coming down from the north and what they say doesn't speak well to the caliber of people who you represent. I'd rather play it safe and do things this way on the first handshake. I hope you can understand not revealing your hand when you're told you're playing against someone who's dealt from the bottom of the deck before. Plenty of unhappy people have left Calendar Mountain and the NVC, I can't control people's opinions about our methods or how our predecessors acted. Gossip happens. But you'd like to, am I right? I winked at him. He chuckled. That seemed to burn off some of the animosity we'd suddenly developed. I'm an officer, Mr. Ring. You served, right? That came to us from someone heading north from down here. Army, if I recall correctly. What rank did you achieve? What unit did you serve with? Doesn't matter anymore, Captain. I don't represent the army, and I am not the man I was when I served. I protect the people who I live with, and I try to be a good man. That's all. Huh, Piccarillo replied. Well, what do you think? I trust you listened to what I said to Miss Carlson earlier. Have you and your group considered joining the NVC? What we offer is tremendous, safety, food, fuel, everything you need for happiness and growth. I could arrange a meeting with some of our group leaders. They could answer any questions you might have. It's a pretty picture, thank you for the offer, I said. A tour might be more convincing. He looked around at his men and women in salvaged military uniforms as if their presence would help sway any decision I might make on the subject. I already knew a tour was out of the question. You don't lead your potential enemy around your home in the hopes they join up. Is that a thanks but no thanks, Mr. Ring? He asked me. Captain, I don't fully represent the settlements I'm sort of speaking for. Any decision would be made after a lengthy discussion. We don't do things hastily, I hope you understand. Settlements, plural, huh? More like this one here? More like this one here, yes. How many, he asked, resting his elbow on the Browning machine gun mounted on his tank. Another gesture designed to throw me off. 
More than one, less than fifty. Bookkeeping was never my strong suit, more of an infantry kind of guy. His face changed. I thought you were supposed to represent a better way, a shining beacon of our future, and here you are, acting dodgy, avoiding my questions, hiding in the shadows. If you ask me, Mr. Ring, you're not much of an example to follow. And to think, you've only just met me, Captain. Imagine the possibilities I could sink to. I don't like your attitude, he said. People in positions of authority rarely have, and that's not me saying you have any authority, Captain. I don't want this to be testy, and it's getting testy. I never once said I was a good role model, but I was chosen to lead a better life and do the right thing, and so far, I'm a better man doing the best I can, and that's enough for now, I hope. We'll see what the future brings. As for you and your APCs and your heavy-handed diplomacy here— I recognize you're carrying a big stick and appreciate you not swinging it. Now, to move forward, we can chalk this up as a fresh new day with fun neighbors with great senses of humor. You'll have to stomach the idea that I do not bow easily, even in the face of tank treads and belt-fed machine guns. As I spoke, he picked up a small handset from inside the APC and said something short into it. By the time I finished talking, I heard an odd humming or thunking sound in the air. Now that I think about it, I'd heard it the whole time under the grumbling tank diesel's idling. I couldn't place what the growling noise was until I finished. That's when the helicopter flew over our head fast and low. I couldn't identify the exact model in the quick flyover, a blue and white civilian bird with the side doors removed, I saw manned, mounted guns in the doorways, probably welded on. It did a loud circle over our positions and then climbed to an elevation that'd make shooting it nearly impossible from the ground. It circled above, watching us like a vulture over a doomed animal in the desert. Air superiority is theirs. Our resident Air Force pilot, Kate, only got a Cessna up and running at the tiny airport near us, and that's not military in any way. A fast-moving, maintained helicopter with even light machine guns on it says a lot and changes the game. What would have been an uphill battle became a suicide situation. Then the prick says, Well, Adrian, so long as you understand who you're talking to, I could have punched him in the fucking throat. Absolutely, Captain. Can we schedule another meeting just like this in another ten days? Maybe with some other representatives from the NVC. I'll arrange for others of my people to be here as well. Maybe we can agree on something that's mutually beneficial. That'd be a good start. I'll see what the council says. Ten days. It was a pleasure, Mr. Ring. He said with a smile that was as fake as a porn star's tits. He turned to Celeste. Good day, Miss Carlson. Spin us up, everyone aboard. The young soldier who shit himself when I said my name looked at me with eyes made of adoration before he loaded back onto the small APC. I knew he was fascinated with me, fascinated with what I represented or who I was, but I let it slide. No sense pushing that, not at the moment, not yet. The convoy left with the clanking of treads and the steel whine of heavy diesel engines, but the little helicopter with its strapped-on machine guns stayed above watching the factory for half an hour before peeling away and heading north, presumably to cover the convoy's egress. The ride home last night and the talks today have been... animated. My hands hurt. I'll write more about it in a day or two once we've talked more. Otis seems nervous. Michelle definitely is. Adrian. A City Laid Asunder. Mid-July 2010. Afghanistan. What was supposed to be a single day's rest turned into five, then into seven, and finally into eleven out of necessity. The following morning, after the men cleared FOB Forestall, Raza's skin felt cool to the touch, yet she shed sweat as if her tiny body sat buried in coals. 
Her wound had become infected overnight, and the seals worked with great intensity to purge her body of the toxicity, or else she'd die. Medically, the men had little resources to work with. Thomas followed a primary rule of medical care, hydrate. He kept Raza's body plump with fluids, flushing the evil out of her slowly. He also used as much of his remaining antibiotics as he dared, leaving some for him and Glenn should they need similar care. It seemed an eventuality. A few days into Raza's suffering at the cliffside base, Thomas opened her wound and found bacteria thriving there. Disgusting films of varying colors and a distinct odor told him the form of the infection, and he was able to more accurately treat her. A change in antibiotics after a thorough and horrible scrubbing of the interior of the wound led to a rapid improvement in her condition. A day later, she was conscious and able to tell them she felt better. Only a few days later, the two men sat in a room a few feet over from where she slumbered. Glenn's patience had run its course. We need to leave her, Torrance said flatly. Thomas knew that Glenn had taken quite a bit of time building up the nerve to say something so bold. Not an option, man. She comes with us, Thomas said to Glenn. His tone was firm, but friendly. She's nothing but a burden, brother. We'd be in Kandahar right now if it wasn't for her. We've been sitting here for how many fucking days waiting for a deaf Afghan girl with a blown apart hip to heal up? It makes no sense tactically. She can't even put a barrel down range for us if shit gets thick. We should slip her a few shots of morphine, put her in the ground, say a few nice words about her, and move the fuck on. Glenn made his point emphatically with an MRE fork, stabbing it into some form of colorless and flavorless meat. Thomas nodded, hearing the sense in his partner's words. It doesn't have to make sense, man. It's the right thing to do. We're U.S. Navy SEALs. We don't leave the wounded behind. We don't abandon children, and we don't give up. We never give up. You hear that? We, plural, like a motherfucker. Glenn stared at Thomas, angry that the man had gone for such strong reasons, reasons that he knew Glenn would have a hard time arguing against. Tommy, you know as well as I do, we don't leave our own behind. But she ain't American. She isn't a warrior. She's making our chances of surviving this bullshit world drop every day we're tied up taking care of her. I get it, she's a little girl. She needs help, but so do we. We need to cut her loose, ease her misery, and move on. Answer me one question, Glenn, Thomas said as he felt his temper begin to flare. He physically swallowed it down and kept cool before saying anything else to his best friend. You got it, Glenn said confidently. If we leave her behind or we put her down, even gently, how are you going to explain it to your wife? You going to tell her that a little girl's life was less important than ours? You going to be able to look her in the face and be fucking proud about leaving Raza behind? Glenn's lip twitched. Thomas knew he'd struck the right chord. Fuck you, Tommy, bringing up my wife. Fuck you. Thomas nodded, unhappy with everything. Yeah, fuck me, Glenn. Fuck everything. The men waited without talking about it again until the girl was able to move. All right, the best way I can pack that motherfucker gives us a shitload of 556, 762, 9 mil, and two cans of M3350 cal for the turret Ma Deuce. We've also got 40 remaining IV bags, all the med supplies they have here, plus two spare M4s, a saw, three packs of water bottles, spare batteries for the radios, NVGs, etc., etc., four jerry cans of fuel, and all the remaining MRE cases. There's also one of those tree air fresheners that smell like pine and ass and space for the three of us to exist comfortably, Glenn said as he sat down in the room with Raza and Thomas. Thomas laughed at the bad string of jokes. They already knew the Humvee they'd be using would be packed full of supplies. There was little sense in leaving anything behind that the two men could pack into the truck. This would be a one-way trip, and the two were well aware that they'd need everything the FOB had to offer. When can we roll out? Thomas asked as he handed Raza one of their handwritten messages. The two had been discussing their childhood experiences, 
Raza took great delight in hearing about Thomas's brothers and how they tormented one another. A story about how Thomas's older brother Adrian had slipped and fallen in the winter, resulting in him shitting himself, was of particular enjoyment to her. Thomas loved it as well. Maybe half an hour. I don't know what good the cover of darkness will offer if we wait. We haven't seen or heard anything in a very long time. My gut tells me we're very much alone in this neck of the woods. All righty then. I'll get Raza ready to go, and as soon as we can, we bug the fuck out. Kandahar, here we come, Glenn said. Thomas stood outside the driver's side of the Humvee moments after shutting the flimsy FOB's gate. A few feet above him, Glenn sat in the turret of the truck behind the 50 caliber Browning monster that would provide them with heavier firepower for their journey. Inside the truck sat the frail little Raza, sitting uncomfortably in the passenger seat, looking out the windshield at what the two men were watching. Her eyes struggled to focus through the thick fog of painkillers Thomas gave her. Far down the slope where the base sat heading towards the village was a scattered line of shambling people. From where the two seals were, it was clear the people moving were not alive. Their disorganized gait, missing limbs, and complete lack of self-awareness in a war zone told them as much. Thomas watched as the six figures stumbled closer and closer to the dirt road that would lead them up the ravine's edge to the base directly towards them. Thomas heard over his shoulder as Glenn climbed up into the vehicle's turret and chambered a massive round into the machine gun. The zombies were well over 500 yards away and only barely a threat to them, but their presence was highly off-putting. Light them up. Let's see how the dead measure up to a 50, Thomas said. Roger that, Glenn said. Glenn had spent a huge amount of time in their pre-deployment training working on operating the massive vehicle-borne weapon he currently sat behind. Thomas and Glenn's SEAL team knew far ahead of time they'd be working with the huge gun, and Glenn was a stickler for preparation, especially when it meant he got to fire hundreds of rounds out of a massive weapon. Glenn's time with the weapon meant he was not only proficient with it, not only highly skilled with it, but more of a surgeon with it. Glenn Torrance, Ph.D. in heavy ass-kickery. Glenn let fly a controlled burst of four rounds and watched them impact the dry, grassy turf near the dirt road less than five feet from the closest zombie. Thomas knew that'd be the last miss, and he was proved right when the next burst of four rounds absolutely liquefied the zombie he'd just ranged in. One moment the Afghan zombie was there, and... The next, all that remained was a pink cloud filled with tiny shreds of body parts flying through it. The power of the fifty cal was enormous. Glenn pivoted the weapon minutely to the right and squeezed off another handful of rounds, annihilating another zombie. He moved on to the next target and the one after that until nothing remained of the undead threat. I'd say the combat effectiveness of the Mod Deuce is very high against the dead, Tommy. I mean, this wasn't a real big test group, but the results look pretty fucking conclusive, Glenn said through a grin. Vaporizing the undead was a mood enhancer. All Thomas did was nod and get into the truck. They had a long drive, and the road to Kandahar would be very, very rough. If the Afghan idea of roads were perfect, it'd take the trio ten hours to drive straight to the city of Kandahar. It was a true pity that the roads in Afghanistan were far from perfect, even before the world was overrun with the dead. Under what passed for perfect or just acceptable in the Afghanistan Department of Transportation manual was a wide variety of road conditions including, but not limited to, the following features. Holes, dead bodies, destroyed vehicles, craters, shambling undead, roadblocks, IEDs, beggars, insurgents, thieves, donkeys, and much more. The misfit trio didn't see any donkeys, but they saw each and every other thing at least once. Kandahar and the roads to it were flat-out shitty no matter how you looked at it. The group stopped about five miles outside the city to take shelter for the night, they had struggled with taking increasing amounts of fire from hidden locations as they got closer to the city's frayed edge. 
Buildings already demolished from the years of war gave shooters infinite places to hide, and it was all made worse by the incredible amount of dead bodies scattered about, as well as the forms of the not-quite-dead rummaging about looking for living victims. Thomas and Glenn didn't engage the undead as they drove. There were simply too many. They did return fire when they were shot at by the living, however. At one point early in the journey, they were passing through a small village that sat affixed tightly to the road passing through it. Glenn and Thomas weren't familiar with the area, having only flown over it in Blackhawks. They risked driving through the small town's center. All was well until they passed under the narrow, looming minaret of the local mosque. The town and those living in it had likely seen nothing move through it since the end of the world on June 23rd. Weeks of complete abandonment had driven the locals to extremes, and when they saw the lone Humvee come through, they struck at it as if the desert-patterned camo-clad vehicle was an entire caravan filled with the riches that would save them. Two shooters opened fire directly down on the top of the truck, patiently waiting to stand up until Glenn moved his weapon off the top of the mosque. The heavy AK rounds impacted the roof of the Humvee in a rapid, clanging burst. It sounded like a hundred men with hammers and bad aim for nails. Thomas reacted instinctively and floored the truck, grinding more life out of the motor and sending it further away from the mosque, giving Glenn the much-needed distance to elevate his barrel to the threat. Thomas cut the wheel around a conspicuously large pile of debris on the side of the street just as it exploded. As the dirt, wood, and metal fragments tore upwards through the sky a fraction of a second too early, both seals thanked their good fortune that the explosion was fairly small and badly timed. They'd seen truly large IEDs before. 155mm howitzer shells linked to blow together, and this was perhaps a landmine or something only slightly more powerful. Raza, mercifully deaf, could only react to the visuals of the situation and the vibration in the metal of the Humvee. She looked to Thomas's face and saw his grim determination. She held a scream and the urge to flail her arms about in check. Raza felt the huge gun above shake the truck as Glenn got it on target at the mosque, ripping the entire top of the minaret apart brick by brick with the massive gun. She couldn't see the men destroyed by his fire, but she knew from the shooting before what the shaking meant. Death to those that threatened her safety. She felt a strange calm come over her as dirt, rocks, bits of brick and stone and other refuse showered down on the hood of the vehicle she rode in. She was scared, but not afraid of dying. I got the fucking mosque, Glenn said over the comms to Thomas. Thomas scanned ahead as Glenn's words came to him, and he saw a duo of living men with AK-47 step around a corner and into the street. They raised their weapons and opened fire at the Humvee. The fresh rounds struck the front of the vehicle with vicious intensity, walking up the hood and into the windshield, pockmarking the heavy, bullet-resistant glass. Contact front, Thomas yelled, pressing the pedal even further into the floorboard. Glenn rotated the turret to the forward position as he heard the incoming metal-jacketed rounds spank off the heavy steel of his turret. Filled with purpose and lacking any real thought about his own safety, he brought the gun's lethal aim onto the doorframe where one of the men was attempting to take cover. Sadly, the building couldn't stand up to the withering power of his heavy machine gun, and the rounds he poured at the enemy punched through it, eradicating the threat's life and crumbling the building on top of the puddle that was his corpse. It took only another moment for Glenn to start punching holes into the other building across the street where the second shooter attempted to hide. Neither seal saw whether or not the second local died, but as the building toppled down, it was hard to imagine anyone could have survived Glenn's onslaught. The men left the town to die, and they moved on with their young passenger. As they made camp in a draw in a nearby valley, neither man gave the village or the men they killed in it a second thought. In the bright and crisp early morning, Thomas sat alone on watch. He'd slept the first shift of the night and had taken over for Glenn a couple hours prior to the dawn's first appearance on the mountainous horizon. 
Glenn and Raza slept under the truck on meager bedding on the ground, and he moved about the area they were parked. They'd placed the truck behind the lone remaining wall of an isolated building near a vertical valley wall. The purpose of the building was long since lost. They were obscured from the road by the wall and a sloping hill on one side, and the walls of the world on the other. It wasn't the best place, but it served them well that night. Thomas rested in the driver's seat of the Humvee and dug out the radio on impulse. They hadn't put the new batteries in it yet, and the complete lack of attention to that detail suddenly bothered him. They'd gone so long without any hope of radio contact, both sailors had forgotten about ever hearing any new radio contact. Thomas got the battery in the radio and got it fired up as the low-hanging thin clouds burnt away above. He crossed his fingers and transmitted a brief and completely unprofessional message over the channel. This is bent over one to anyone listening. Anyone still give a fuck out there? Clearly not the best way to announce his presence, but decorum was something he and Glenn had been lacking for some time. Copy that, bent over one. We have you five by five. Please identify yourself. A friendly voice responded. Thomas heard a solid amount of cheer and surprise in the voice. He felt training suddenly kick in, and he fired off his team's actual call sign and gave them a quick status update. It felt so alien to him to be back in the structure of the military machine. It wasn't long before a higher-ranking officer took over the radio. Punisher, this is Lieutenant Colonel Fallon. I'm what passes for the boss here now. Sure is nice to hear we've still got some ass-kickers alive and kicking ass out there. How's life in the Wild West for you right now? I'm told you're too strong with a wounded local. Roger that, sir. We're making our way to Kandahar right now for the airbase. We'd no idea whether or not anyone was there, but if any friendly forces were still out and about, solid. As best we can tell, we're the Alamo right now. You're the first voices in the Wild West we've heard in days. Where are you headed in from? The colonel asked. Thomas liked the strange officer based on the way he said the word Alamo, long and drawn out like he'd watched too many John Wayne movies late at night. We're headed in from FOB Forrestal. Shit show, sir. Looked like someone inside went batshit crazy or got bitten or something. Looked ugly. Thomas heard Glenn stir under the truck and crouch down to grin at him. Glenn listened intently to the radio traffic with ears freshly awakened. You know, we had a couple trucks arrive from there about eight or nine days ago. They said they were collapsing onto us because they were running out of food. We felt it was odd when they only came in with four guys. We let them in, and after asking a few hard questions, they drew down on our forces here, and we had a firefight with them. They all died, and we lost four of our own. Fucking pathetic. The two seals cringed. The tale made sense. Bad apples make bad applesauce. But I'm glad you two and a half are all safe and soundish. Thank you, sir, Thomas said back. What's the road to the airbase look like? Any chance we'll just be able to drive up and in easily? Do we have any air assets that can provide assistance? No air, no ass. This is Afghanistan, son. Nothing we do here is easy, the colonel said. That's fine too, sir. We're SEALs. Everything is easy if we try hard enough. Good attitude. Well, let's see. We've got about 30, maybe 40,000 dead locals milling about the base walls, give or take a few thousand, but let's face it, we haven't really counted them lately. The Taliban, God bless their evil souls, have continued their version of Allah's work despite the presence of so many of their dead buddies walking around. We'd really hoped they'd shift gears and work on putting their fellow nationals into the ground, but that ain't happening. Fucking miserable pricks, they've been attacking us almost daily this week, probing to find a soft spot on the wall to get in here. So far, no luck on their part, but there aren't a whole lot of us here to hold them off should they get a little lucky. Dumb fucks will probably let the whole city in here too when they make a hole in the wall. Sounds shitty. How many are we, sir, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I'd prefer not to say exact numbers over the air, scrambled frequencies or not, but... We've got enough to fill one of the two remaining planes here right now, and when we gather enough to fill the second plane, we're getting the fuck out of here. The colonel sounded very excited. You performing a rear guard op? 
Thomas asked, looking about for anything approaching their position. More or less, we're a placeholder. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines with no reason to go home. We're keeping the base up and running while our forces across the country return to us. We want to bring everyone home. You know, leave no man behind. Thomas looked at Glenn as the colonel talked. Glenn looked away. I understand that, Thomas said. We're waiting another fifty days or so, then one way or the other our plane is taking off. Our plan is to head to Rammstein, Germany. Solid. Maybe from there we can head home. Maybe by then this'll all be sorted out and over. Bad fucking chance, Punisher. We haven't heard anything from Germany in a long time, and that means things are bad there, and if things are bad there... Yeah. Well, that's a whole different shitstorm. Today's problem is getting you inside my wire. We've had the best and brightest here working on a plan this whole time, and we got a pretty mediocre idea. Ideas are good. Sure are. These things are stupid as shit, you see, and they respond to noise and light like moths. They're real dumb. You make enough noise or cause a large commotion, they flock to it. We've done this a couple times to move them out, so this should work out again for us. We're gonna take some bullhorns to one area of the base and make loud like two redneck cousins drunk on Keystone and fucking in a trailer on July 4th. It'll be epic. That should draw in a big old crowd from where you'll enter the base, and, God willing, you'll be able to drive right up to the gate and right on in. God willing, eh? Thomas said, his voice full of sarcasm. Yeah, you bet. We'll be back to you in a few minutes with more details. In the meantime... Get your shit together and get ready to drive like you've never driven before, sailor. Roger that, sir. Glenn and Thomas shook hands with glee, and they proceeded to get their shit together. The route to the airbase entry unfurled like a plate of spilled spaghetti. The radio controllers routed them around known IED locations and hot spots of zombies that weren't moving to the noise the soldiers were making. It seemed, no matter how loud or obnoxious the soldiers in the airbase were, some groups of the dead refused to acknowledge them. Thomas wondered if God was on their side or not. He probably had better things to pay attention to. The trick to the entire trek to the base was to move the truck quietly. When moving briskly, the diesel motor made quite a racket. That noise would cancel out the work bringing the undead away, so Thomas had to drive very slowly. It also meant that they couldn't use the massive heavy machine gun. If they had to shoot anything, the two men would need to resort to using their M4 weapons with the suppressors affixed. Glenn took his spot in the turret behind the 50, holding onto his much smaller M4A1 and feeling a little silly. It felt to him like cleaning a house with a tool brush while the maid watched holding a vacuum cleaner. He'd get the job done with the smaller weapon, but and there was a significantly better option available right in front of him. Thomas kept the vehicle moving at a steady ten miles an hour, looking to both sides with an intense feeling of badness deep in his core. It pained him to move so slowly in such an urban environment, especially one so overrun with threats. Seals always moved fast and never alone. To be in a single vehicle with no secondary means of escape quite simply scared the hell out of him. He knew Glenn felt the same way. Both could hear the radio traffic on the channels between the forces inside the airbase. As the crowd of undead gathered en masse at the location where they were making the noise, the security forces selectively were engaging. It seemed to Thomas that ammunition wasn't a huge concern, but it also seemed like a huge waste of rounds to simply shoot at the enormous amount of zombies. Thomas thought they would be better served if the base defense forces lobbed a handful of heavy mortar rounds into the throngs of the dead instead. They might not be 100% lethal on the tough undead, but the explosions and concussive forces would certainly render many of them unable to move. He shrugged and felt thankful for all they were doing. Kandahar, according to your map, we are at the two-click point. We've got a left, two rights, and a left remaining to get home to you. Thomas said, looking down briefly at the map he'd jotted notes on. It was a rough map, but it had worked so far. Copy that, Punisher. All seems well on our end. Continue as normal. We're on it, Thomas replied, eyes alert and looking for threats. 
He felt a strange tugging at his sleeve, and he looked over at Raza. She was looking up at him, her eyes filled with urgency. When Thomas met her gaze, she looked and pointed out the windshield towards a crack between two buildings. It might have been an alley were it thicker. Blocking the edge of the alley was an ancient Mercedes truck, and it kept a wall of struggling undead out of the street. If they figured out how to crawl underneath it... Glenn, you see that Mercedes truck at two o'clock? Thomas asked over their personal channel. Yep. Holy fuck, it looks like a fucking dam about to break. I got it. Glenn shouldered his M4 and put the tiny red dot in his holographic side on a forehead and timed the shot with Thomas's driving. Behind the roughed-up German vehicle, his target's skull popped open louder than the report of the gun. The body fell to the ground, but stuck on the trunk. He repeated the process as the Humvee approached and drove by the packed alley. As they passed it, he held his fire, fairly certain the threat the alley posed had been dealt with. No one saw the man hidden in shadow, crouched behind a counter in a store across the street, holding the rocket-propelled grenade. The hiss and squeal of the RPG round registered only scantly in the ears of the seals as it blitzed into the front of the Humvee, caving in the driver's side wheel, ripping the hood off like tissue paper, shattering the thick ballistic glass and almost tipping the truck over onto its roof. Fortunately, the girth and weight of the steel on the turret kept the truck on its three remaining wheels. The explosion, only a few feet from where Thomas sat, deafened him, the ringing in his ears overwhelmed his ability to hear anything, but his vestigial memory told him where the attack had come from. Unable to think, his body did what he had trained it to do. The driver's side door was already ajar from the frame of the Humvee being ripped apart by the RPG's attack, so he grabbed his weapon and jammed it out of the space in the door frame and sprayed suppressed 5.56mm rounds on full auto where he thought the shot had come from. He emptied a magazine in what felt like a heartbeat and slapped a new one in before the empty landed on his lap. He did this without looking at the weapon or his magazine pouches. His eyes were looking through the busted glass of his door for the movement of the man that had done this to him. And just as his second magazine went dry and was falling out of the weapon, he saw the man running through a hole in the side of the building, carrying the empty RPG. Thomas shouldered the door of the Humvee open and had his sidearm up and firing before the man could find cover. The seal watched as two of his six pistol rounds found their fleshy target and sent their victim down into the rubble violently. He holstered his pistol and slapped a new magazine into his M4A1. He hollered to Glenn but couldn't hear his own voice. As he scanned the surroundings for the inevitable other attackers, he turned and looked to the turret where he saw Glenn up and firing in the other direction. Glenn's cheek was covered in dark blood below his helmet, but he was shooting accurately and didn't appear to be down for the count. Thomas spun back to his sector to ensure they'd make it through this, just as two more men began firing down on them from the second story of the narrow boulevard of destruction. Thomas felt a javelin of pain stab through his right calf, and he was dropped to a knee. I'm hit. Fuck, I'm hit. From his knee, he propelled his body backwards under the rear end of the tipped-up Humvee, giving him a modicum of cover. When his body came to a stop, he opened up on the windows where he took fire from and returned suppressing fire. He couldn't see anything firing back at him, but he continued to squeeze off suppressed rounds that mushroomed into the stone of the building harmlessly. He watched a dozen of his rounds pockmark the frames of the windows accurately, but then the barrels of the attacker's weapons poked over and started their horrible return fire anyway. His suppressed fire simply wasn't scary enough to keep their heads down. He cursed the quieter weapon they were using to avoid detection. From above him, he saw and felt the frame of the Humvee rumble. It rocked with a rhythm that could only be one thing, the Ma Deuce in Glenn's hands. Thomas's eyes refocused on the window frames as Glenn's fire obliterated the upper floor of the Kandahar building. Bricks and wall fell off the side of the building as the massive slugs rendered the structure bare. The M4A1 might not have scared them, but the M2 ended them. Thomas got to his good foot after a few seconds. He assessed his right calf and saw there was a gouge running from knee to ankle nearly the width of his finger and a few inches deep. 
The heavy round had torn the flesh from his shin, but not destroyed the bone miraculously. The fat muscle of his calf flopped around loosely, barely connected, but the leg worked somewhat. He felt he could walk, but the pain would be incredible. His hearing started the journey back to him as he turned to Glenn. Glenn had a gash on his temple that was as long as a cup of coffee was wide. White bone of his skull poked through the cut, and he grinned the whole time. The two men exchanged words neither could hear until their ears recovered enough for them to actually communicate. You're all fucked up, dude, Glenn said, pointing down to the bloody leg Thomas limped on. Thomas hissed in pain. Join the fucking club, cunt. Your wife is gonna be pissed at me. I let you get ugly on this deployment. She'll never forgive me. Glenn grinned. How's our little girl? Thomas was jolted by the fact he'd forgotten about her, especially in the wake that she'd just pointed out the threat of the undead right before the attack. Thomas hopped around on his good leg and leaned into the cabin of the Humvee with a smile. What he saw rotted his soul in an instant. Little Raza had been hit by something sharp that had been moving very fast. The object had struck her midway between her brow and her hairline, and it had peeled the top of her head off. Her bright blue eyes, now lifeless and swollen nearly shut, looked at Thomas. Raza was empty. He stood up out of the vehicle as the wetness cascaded down his cheeks. Glenn saw his friend's face and felt the emotion flow out of him, regardless of any self-control. Both men were full of anger and sadness. Thomas leaned back into the vehicle, keeping his eyes well away from Raza's corpse. He grabbed the handset of the truck's radio. This is Punisher. We've been attacked by insurgent forces and are no longer combat effective or mobile. One KIA. We need a hand here, Kandahar. Thomas dropped to the ground as the pain flared up larger and larger in his leg, threatening to overtake his will to stay conscious. He grabbed his pack and dug out the medical gear to address his injury. Punisher, we can see your location, but you need to move to us another block and a half. Whoever hit you has blocked the road leading to you, and we've got our hands full here at the wall. Our QRF is already moving and we'll beat you in five minutes, but you gotta meet them. We're on it. Thomas said through a wall of pain that threatened to snuff him out. As he dropped the handset with pain-numbed hands, Glenn appeared beside him and took over. Glenn's pain couldn't compare to his friend's, and he was much more able to make Thomas's leg stable. He worked on his friend in the filthy street of the destroyed Afghan city. We got a hoof at a block and a half. Mogadishu mile, motherfucker. A Kandahar click, Thomas said, the pain turning to the beginning of shock. The only easy day is yesterday, right? Glenn said, turning Thomas around in the dirt and grabbing him by the canvas loop at the back neck of his body armor. With his left hand, he dragged his massive friend, and with his right, he held his weapon at the ready. From both sides of the street, steadily, like the drops falling off the roof of a home in a rainstorm, undead came forth from the destroyed and desiccated city. Glenn fired his rifle as if it were a massive pistol, and did so with skill that would make his trainers proud. Thomas, dragged as he was on the seat of his pants, kept his mental focus and fought off the shock. He fired his weapon at the undead following them. They looped around a street corner, avoiding a blockade placed by either locals or friendly forces, and pushed on. Glenn stopped briefly, letting go of Thomas to put a new magazine into his weapon and grab a lungful of breath, only to grab his friend again and drag him further. Glenn's stamina was endless, his perseverance in the face of certain death unchallengeable. Thomas, his mind and body ruptured, was no different. Unable to walk, barely able to think, he fired over and over at zombie after zombie, blowing heads and knees apart. The two men, even in their wrecked state, were as deadly as ever. Minutes later, they saw a trio of army Humvees scream down the crowded street directly at them. Neither man really saw the soldiers coming to their aid or could tell you later what any of them looked like. In the coming days, they thanked everyone they met, as if each were personally responsible for their rescue. Thomas and Glenn sat in the infirmary of the massive airbase. Most of the facilities in the sprawling fortress had been abandoned due to a lack of personnel. 
The hospital alone dodged that fate. Most of the medical staff couldn't bear to leave the units behind, so the two SEALs had plenty of company. In the days after their arrival, most of the remaining hundred or so people at the base had stopped in to welcome them. The two new faces were a source of hope for those remaining behind, and everyone wanted to see people that reminded them that they had made the good choice. The men and women had stayed back to help people like Glenn and Thomas get home with them. The two special operations men received hot meals, showers, or in Thomas's case, a sponge bath from a reasonably handsome young specialist, and praise that seemed never-ending. After so much time alone, they were almost ready to be alone again. Lieutenant Colonel Fallon was visiting them that day, carrying three paper cups of hot coffee on a steel medical tray. He handed the two men their cups and hoped they took it with cream and sugar. They drank the hot drinks eagerly, happy to have anything. I'm sorry about the girl. I know you two went through hell to try and save her. Glenn and Thomas simply nodded. Her death was still raw to them both. On the bright side... Six more soldiers arrived today, so another ninety or so more and we can blow this pop stand. Looks like we might be heading home after all. Sir, the doc tells me I've got three weeks of bed rest before I'm able to move at all. Would it be possible for me to get back in the fight once I'm up and running? Thomas asked. Are you insane? The doctor says you nearly lost your entire calf muscle. You'll limp for the rest of your life, son. You can sit the rest of this show out. You've earned your wages. Fallon sipped his coffee. All due respect, sir, but in three weeks you either let me help you find more folks out there, or I'll go do it myself. I'll climb the wall and limp away if I have to. Glenn chimed in quickly. You won't be doing it by yourself, brother. I guess a limping seal is better than none. Why? Why do you feel the need to do this? Like I said, You've earned your rest. Fallon looked at the two men and could almost see the bond between the two. It was physical, emotional, and spiritual, blood brothers in every sense. There are men and women out there just the same as Glenn and me, sir, scared, alone, and cut off from support a long ways from home. We can help them, and by God, I will not leave those that would shed blood for me behind. You say we've earned our rest, but... I think they've earned theirs just as much, and it's our job to get them here to do just that. If I'm able, I'm willing. Fallon smiled, understanding what he meant. Fallon's expression suddenly changed as he looked at Thomas's face. What's your last name, Thomas? Ring, sir. <laughs> you got a brother? Four boys in the family, sir. Fallon smiled knowingly. You got an older brother named Adrian? Thomas grinned. The name clearly brought up fond memories for the young man. Yes, sir, he's my closest brother. He served under me in Iraq. Not directly, but I knew him. His NCOs spoke very highly of him. He was a good soldier. He's a ring, sir. They only make us one way. What way is that, Thomas? Unstoppable, sir, Thomas said with a smile. November 13th, 2013 It's a funny thing working to not incite a panic in our population. Remember how I said it was easier when people didn't ask questions, when they were unaware of the development that would keep them up at night? When I hated talking to people in a way so I could avoid making them fearful. We're working to be hush-hush, and Abby is working directly against that. More on that later. I'm not sure who's in the right. We've had a series of ongoing conversations here at Bastion with all the people who could participate in the defense of our location, as well as contribute to our attempts at a peaceful resolution to the situation that looms large over us with the NVC. Right now, we're assembling our Bastion Logistics, Kevin, Michelle, and I have had sit-down meetings with Fletcher, the animal doctor, Ethan, and Joel regarding our medical supplies and capabilities in the event we wind up entering into ground combat. 
news is we are very good for a short time, but a protracted engagement with severe injuries will be very shit for us. We've sat down with Blake and Hector to assess the automotive capabilities of our four locations, as well as our fuel situation. Good and good, so long as it doesn't become protracted. Kevin and Mike have briefed us on our ammunition supply. Good, so long as we don't engage in a lengthy battle. Sense a theme yet, Mr. Journal? And our food supplies are good, according to Melissa and Ollie. Food's the one situation where a handful of deaths actually improves our situation. Addition by subtraction. Go figure. Michelle reports that morale at Bastion is tenuous. People are nervous. Her and me too. And I don't want more violence. I partially blame Abby. Celeste says the feeling at the factory is the same, though... Several people there have said they're considering a move to Calendar Mountain because of the beautiful country up north, as well as the chance at more space and greater levels of perceived security. I guess showing up with a shitload of machine guns and tanks makes people think you know how to use them. Hard to argue with that logic. Patty reports that the small population at the MGR building in town is neither nervous nor scared, prepared to do whatever's necessary to survive and maintain their way of life. Agnes, Anders, and Adam. How is it that until this moment in time, I didn't realize that the leaders of Spring Meadows are all A names? I shall refer to them as Team AAA henceforth. I'll say that their people are good. So far, it seems that they're entirely off the radar of the NVC and... We'd like to keep that feather in our cap. Andy, our resident tech geek from the factory, has done a complete check over our electronic surveillance systems. In the event of an attack on the factory or bastion, our cameras mounted on the old phone poles are up and running. We talked with Andy about installing more cameras in series, communicating via shitty laptops linked with Wi-Fi to give our video security greater reach. He's looking into it. He's also looking into beefing up the perimeter surveillance elsewhere. It'll require us doing some materials retrieval, but we've never been shy about hard work. Oh, man, I bitched about Abby earlier. Remember how I said she's doing that newsletter? Well, because she's a member of the inner circle here, she gets to sit in on all our upper echelon meetings. It doesn't work by invite, really. You just know where and when we're meeting, and you're there if you want to be. Most who can be there are. The meetings happen primarily in my dorm, Hall E, near the river, if you forgot. And for the most part, they aren't secretive, but kept small so they can be efficient. Think cabinet meeting. My problem with Abby right now is this fucking newsletter she's writing. As soon as she gets any reliable information, it goes public in the newsletter— then someone in the know inevitably is asked by the greater population for more info, and people don't always know what to say. Shit, I don't. So then one of us gets testy at Abby and talks to her, and she says what she's always said about the newsletter. It's the right of the people to know. She's right, and I fucking hate it. I also hate that in the meeting where she and Hal were away taking care of baby Gavin— Kevin and even Abby's mom, Patty, suggested that we stop inviting her to the meeting so she has less to say and much less to hear. That won't work. I know her. All it'll serve to do is make Abby into a pit bull for information, and then she'll treat us like the enemy. If we deny her that knowledge, she'll get it another way, and at least now she can tell the truth, instead of searching for half-truths, speculating on whatever it is she can figure out, and writing shit that may or may not be true that conceivably might make shit far worse. Better bad truth from a friend than a worse lie from an enemy. She's a pain in my ass, but I think perhaps the awkwardness of dealing with the truth of a situation in the moment is the price we pay to lead our people honestly. I don't know. I know I love her like she was my own child, and I know in my heart all she wants to do is help the people. The scribes of mankind working at documenting the world at large once again. So strange. Huh. Ethan and Joel identified the NVC helicopter as a Bell Model 429. 
If you've ever seen a traffic helicopter fly above Mr. Journal, you've probably seen a Bell 429. It's an unarmored civvy job that sits maybe six souls and needs a single pilot. Popular and in common use before the shit hit the fan in 2010. The one we saw the other day had light machine guns mounted on both sides of the open doors, and if I'm not mistaken, the guns were on swivel mounts atop a steel or iron pole that had been welded to the landing struts. Obviously, aftermarket. Kate, the Air Force AC-130 pilot who flew Kevin and company across the Atlantic Ocean to get here, says she has enough hours on the stick of a helicopter to fly it if we could get it from them, or find one of our own. Of course, what the hell do we do with our own helicopter if we get one? Chopper dogfights? We have very little weaponry designed to take that out. AT-4s aren't suitable as ground-to-air, which leaves us with the spray-and-pray tactic with the saws or a few lucky shots with a heavy-caliber hunting rifle. If we hit the pilot or a fuel line or the engine, we can take it down, but that requires an awful lot of luck, and if I've proven anything, luck isn't something I can rely on. Damn it. Just damn it. That bird is a huge smear of shit in my planning underwear. We can take out the fucking APCs, we have the gear and the know-how, and I'm confident we can get that done if we need to, but that chopper. Today is the 13th? Michelle and Kevin reminded me we have a meeting with the NVC people on the 21st, and shortly after that we're supposed to meet with Captain Maria and her boondoggle group to the south on the 25th. We're sitting down with some of the NVC group to hear more about their place and what they have going on which I'm sure will feel an awful lot like being a Jew in Germany right around 1936. Between now and then, we fret. Clean guns, harvest food, and hope the skies stay clear of storms so we can get the food off the land and saved for winter. Though a storm will put their bird on the ground, and I'm not sure what's more important as I write this. Adrian November 17th, 2013. Despite my doomsaying and worry warding in the days after the meeting with Captain Pasta and the Pastets, I am in a good mood today. I don't know why. Maybe I have multiple personality disorder or I'm bipolar. Light snow falls here at Bastion and across our humble associated estates. I love snowfall. I'm not a big winter fan, but... I do love the early days and nights when the white flakes first fall. The feeling in the air coupled with the quiet brought on by the density added to the air feels serene. Sometimes when the snow falls at night, I like to step outside and just walk around. Couldn't do that when the zombies were here, but now it's safe. I used to hate the orange glow from all the streetlights in the clouds when I did it. They cast this weird chemical harshness against the bottom of the puffy clouds and somehow took away from the magic of the moment. That no longer happens. There are no sodium arc street lamps or xenon ones or LED ones or whatever the hell they used before that day. Now it is dark as can be every night, and the only light around us is the light we make ourselves. There's something in that idea I need to ponder. Last night, I went out into the snow as it fell. I left Michelle with our homeboy Otis and said I needed to get out for some fresh air. She told me to take my time and warm myself up with a cup of hot chamomile before I came back to bed. I appreciate her carte blanche support. Feels supportive. When I got outside on a stone bench near Hall E, I saw Abby and Hal sitting. They didn't have baby Gavin. They sat next to Rich from Texas and Jay, the guy who came over from the Wilson scrapyard. Romping around in the snow were the two German shepherds he brought with him. I know now their names are Pacer and Nick. Apparently, Jay played point guard for his high school basketball team, and he named all their puppies after NBA teams. What's up with people naming their dogs after NBA stars and teams? My buddy John named his dog after Dwayne Wade. Can't be hatin', though. Dwayne was John's homeboy, and I'm sure Pacer and Nick are the same to Jay. Anywho, when I stepped out of Hall E and 
let the outer fire door click shut behind me, they more or less looked over in unison at me and got real awkward. Abby, less awkward than the others, and that's saying something, but still, they was weird. I waved and walked over, and in the twenty steps it took me to get to them, I figured out they'd been talking about me. You know how I know? They asked me about the weather. You don't ask people you have years of history with about the weather unless you don't want to talk about something. Rich said, man, snow is weird, huh? I said, yeah, sure was, and he told us that he spent a few years in the suburbs of Philly before his parents took jobs in the Dallas area. He didn't remember the snow. Everyone chuckled, and I pretended not to know they were talking about me. After a few minutes of me doing my best to throw snowballs to engage the dogs, Abby and Hal excused themselves to go take care of Gavin, who they had left with Patty. I forgot Patty had come back to campus to see her grandbaby. Rich hung out for a few more minutes, and then he excused himself, said he was cold. I then took a seat on the frigid stone bench next to Jay and stuck my hands in my hoodie pockets. I won't lie, Mr. Journal, by then I had a growing sense of paranoia. With all the strife that's been building, I started to think that Abby and Hal were building a consensus against Michelle, Kevin, and me. Like, maybe they were starting a grassroots movement to stand up against our decisions for Bastion. I had that feeling of anger and betrayal start to creep up the back of my neck, and then I didn't feel cold anymore. Did you really end it all? Jay then asked. That kind of broke my concentration on being angry. Yeah, I, I think so, I mean. Uh, I know it all ended when I did what I did. Couldn't be a coincidence. Others who had better connections to the powers that be know more about it than I do. I didn't get the same insider access others got. You'll need to talk to Michelle about that. Abby and Hal told Rich and me a bunch of stuff. We heard some of it, but to hear it from people who've been there with you since it all started, Hal didn't show up until pretty far along. He was in England and Africa with Kevin. You know what I mean. And Abby, she was with you here right when it started. She watched you work, helped you. I laughed. Without her, none of this would have been able to happen. Don't let her dodge her role in it. You make it sound like I'm some kind of celebrity. More than that, dude. Rich and the others from Texas drove like 2,000 miles through hell to get here because they hoped they'd find you. Jay looked up to the sky and the snow that fell from it, amazed. Yeah, that's loony. You don't get it, do you? People dreamt about who you were. You, man. You. Dead people visited strangers in their dreams and told them all about you, about how one man was going to make it work. People are coming to see you, to meet you. The shit is real. You're more than a celebrity, man. You need to really digest that shit and start acting like you know. Do you have a cigarette? I'm dying for one. Not on me. I don't smoke. We have some stashed away in the cafeteria. Follow me. I took him across campus with the dogs, and we walked in silence. It wasn't until I led us into the storage room at the school's cafeteria building, and he'd lit up a butt outside before either of us spoke. If I'm not a celebrity, then what am I? He laughed and spit while the dogs ran in circles, chasing each other. This is way fresher than the last pack my dad and I were splitting. Thank you. So, you're like a religious figure, man. The second coming. I felt that hot anger come back. Bullshit. I won't listen to that. I am so far from the second coming, it's not even funny. I am, at best, the distant cousin of the 33rd coming. People need to stop that shit right now. He laughed and spit again, then clapped me on the shoulder like we'd been friends for years. Adrian, Mr. Ring, whatever it is you want to be called, I don't get to be in charge of what you did and who you are. That's a pretty good comeback. Yeah, I've been working on a few of them. Glad that one had a chance to step up to the free throw line, Jay joked. I don't know, man. I've never been good with dealing with attention. I hate being in charge. I hate thinking about feelings. I, I need a simple life, one lane, limited exit choices, nice scenery. I can't handle the idea of being someone people look up to. Is that why you're not a dad yet? And that stopped me cold. 
It had a point, like a good fucking point. Did I dodge marriage with Cassie not only because I was scared to love her, but because I was afraid of being a dad? Because I was afraid of her relying on me? That I was afraid I'd let her down? That I was afraid that I couldn't handle the responsibility of being looked up to by a kid of my own? Well played, Jay. I think I want kids. Want a kid. No more we'll see what happens. I want to talk to Michelle about this. Too deep for me, I told him. Bedtime. You okay out here? Are you okay here? Is your sister doing okay? Captain Deflector to the rescue. I'm okay. I won't be all okay for a long time, but it helps to be around so many good people. You're like legit good people here. My dad read you wrong. He almost never reads people wrong. I guess he never gave you a chance. That's a shame. It's the tattoos, or maybe the old haircut. Maybe, but I'm okay. Thanks for asking. Still not sleeping. That's why I'm out here. Sharon is a mess. She misses mom and dad. She's sleeping. That's good. Try and get her into work. Have you been given permanent housing yet? I mean, are you staying with us? We're pretty full up here on campus, but... Auburn Lake Road still has a few empty houses, I think. They're figuring it out. Roy is settled in with the couple that work the land here, the red-headed guy and his wife. Ollie and Melissa? Yeah, they're good people. Frank and his two daughters, I'm not sure about. I haven't seen them in a couple days. They aren't staying where we are. Cool, I'm sure they're good for now. Good chat, Jay. Back to bed for me. I said. Then I threw another snowball for the dogs to chase, and Jay and I said our good nights. I drank my chamomile tea, ate one of the snickerdoodles Michelle baked earlier in the evening. Not my favorite cookie, but a fresh cookie is a fresh cookie when you need a cookie. And snuggled up next to a warm Michelle after booting Otis out of my spot. He meowed in protest, but jumped back up on the bed and cuddled in my butt crack. I fell asleep so fast, I can't remember anything after that. I'm at peace for some reason. That talk with Jay somehow gave me some kind of clarity. Not sure why, but I'll think on it. Maybe it's the kid thing. Maybe clarity is the wrong word. In more practical, non-wussy news, the factory in Spring Meadow as well as MGR are reporting ground movement— the factory in Spring Meadow are seeing the NVC vehicles moving about at will, but they're saying the Humvees are staying away at a safe distance. It still unnerves us that they're even around, but they're not being aggressive. Moving around is not being aggressive. Say it again, Adrian. MGR is seeing foot mobiles, and Kevin started sending out another patrol shift on horseback to keep an eye on town. MGR is saying it's a small number of people, ragtag civilian types scouring the area for food or supplies. I'm wondering if it's more people heading south to avoid a harsh winter, or disguised NVC operatives scouting our area, or religious pilgrims coming to wash their feet in the rivers of the Holy Land. Laugh the fuck out loud. Staying positive. Food harvest has stepped up, the regular light snow has Ollie worried about our few remaining crops, so he's pulling stuff up as fast as he can to save all that he can. I don't think we'll lose much, but I'm not the expert. A few more days, and we meet back up with the NVC people at the factory. Someone from their council is supposed to meet me. If I'm lucky, I get a tour of Calendar Mountain. Probably not that day, but soon, hopefully. I understand I risk being captured, but... You can't win if you don't play. I guess how we proceed beyond that is based off of how the meeting goes. Is it weird that I'm excited? I feel like this will go one of two ways. The council people are legit and awesome and we ally with them and things get better, or the council dude is a complete jizz bucket shithead and we have to go to war. One way our people get safety and the other way I get to shoot guns. Call me selfish if you want. I deserve that. Adrian November 20th, 2013 I need to go to bed. I say that as an adult capable of making adult decisions, yet apparently unable to do so. 
negotiating from a place of weakness is not something I'm familiar with. If I am familiar with it, I have chosen to forget what it's like. As best as I can remember, whenever I came into contact with another group of survivors, I had the upper hand for one reason or another, or I at least was able to delude myself into thinking so. Delusion, not just a river in Egypt. When I dealt with Westfield, I was mobile. I could stick and move and could cut and run from campus here if they came at me hard. When I dealt with the crazies at the farm, they couldn't move. They were tied to their misled beliefs and their convictions. That, coupled with their lack of agility and lack of skill, led to their demise. I give them credit, though. They came at us here at Bastion and hurt us bad before Gilbert and I went at them with Blake. We waited too long for proof to go at them, and it cost us dearly. I'll never forget Abby crying. I'll never forgive them for hurting her. Rest in peace, Gavin. The same happened with the factory. Well, not really. When we went head to head with the two sisters who ran that place, it was a fight from the get-go. But in each engagement, we had the upper hand. Even when they ambushed us, we managed to stay one step ahead of them every time. And that step let us whittle them down until we could overwhelm them in a head-on assault. We paid a price in blood, as you must, but we had a coupon to get that price down. Spring Meadow, though entirely peaceful, never had a chance to win a fight against us if it went that way. Not enough people, not enough guns, not enough vehicles or expertise. The hits keep coming, well, until now. The NVC people have us at a disadvantage. They outnumber us, they probably outskill us in terms of volume of trained shooters, they out-resource us in terms of their biodiesel production, and they outclass us in firepower with grenade launchers, 50 cal machine guns, and not one, but three armored personnel carriers. I won't even go into the up-armored Humvees and the HEMTTs. They also know more about me than I do about them. I mean, I know what I've been told by the refugees that came south from their AO, but I don't know them. I know Captain Pasta, I know he's a wart on the side of a pig's dick, but he could be a bad apple in a barrel of good ones. I won't know until... We're heading out to the factory for the meeting at Odark 30 tomorrow. Kevin, Ethan, and Joel are taking up sniper positions while I meet with whoever shows up from their council. We're not rolling fat, we're taking two pickups, no Humvees, no HEMTT of our own, no heavy force. Kevin reasoned that if we know we're walking into an overwhelming force, there's no sense in committing our whole strike ability and losing it all. If we're going to lose, lose small, and if we're going to win against a large force, let's risk minimally and try for a surgical strike with some talented trigger pullers from afar. Yes, my ass is on the line, but what's new? My next tattoo is going to be a line on my ass because my ass is always on the line. Inside jokes only I find funny. Good times. I talked to Abby an hour ago. I informed her what the situation was in complete honesty, and she looked shocked that I did so. She must have expected kid gloves or a line of bullshit. Thank you. Everyone will really appreciate what you just told me. It means a lot to me that you're being open and honest. I knew you would come around. She said to me, I don't like people knowing my business. It's hard for me. It's not your business anymore, Adrian. It's their business. When your decisions impact their safety and future and that of their children, they deserve to have a say or at least deserve to know what's coming down the pipe. Think of the families. Think of my family. Yeah, I suppose. I hate you being right. You're smart for someone who can't legally drink. Ha, says who? The alcohol commission isn't exactly open for business. I mean, I wouldn't drink anyway. I'm breastfeeding. The little prune's working okay? Does Gavin get like three mouthfuls before you gotta tap out and take a break? She slapped me harder than anyone else could have. I deserved it. Funny. Look, Adrian, you're a good man and you do smart things, mostly. But you also need to be held accountable just like anyone else. Michelle is good at that being accountable. She listens to criticism, but more importantly, she builds consensus before making decisions. She gets opinions and picks a course of action after. You do the opposite, 
you and Kevin and whoever make these military and political calls, then tell us how it went. I remember how it goes. I helped make some of those decisions. I hear you, but you gotta understand that we could have plants here from the NVC. Spies. We could have people ferrying info to them. We could easily say too much about dangerous shit, and it could lead us straight into an ambush. I need to be careful with what gets said and to whom. I understand people have a right to know, but at what point does their right to know interfere with my safety and my ability to handle an opposing threat to the group at large? And there you have it. Abby and I talked in circles for twenty minutes as we swayed each other back and forth. Nothing was hostile, but I knew I couldn't convince her to soften her stance, and I knew I wouldn't change much either. I just hope people here are trustable right now, because tomorrow, well, I'll deal with tomorrow, tomorrow. Adrian November 21st 2013. Two pickup trucks and a Humvee meet in the street. The truck says to the pickup, Hey, asshole, why are you so wide? Humvee replies, It's the only way I can mount your mom. Pickup replies, Joke's on you. I'm an inanimate truck. We can't talk, and I don't have a mom. I worked on that joke for like two hours earlier today on the ride home. I feel like there isn't enough car humor in the post-zombie world. There aren't that many running cars anymore. Maybe that's why. That joke was awful. I apologize, Mr. Journal, but if you can rub two sticks together, then you've probably realized that if I'm cracking jokes, I'm in a good mood. And if I'm in a good mood, then the meeting with the NVC people didn't end in violence and went fairly well. Big ass sentence. My high school English teacher just rolled over in her grave, assuming that she made it into one. But seriously, two trucks and a Humvee met in a street. We actually parked the trucks far out of the way with Ethan and Joel while Kevin and I went to the factory to meet up with Pasta and the Pastettes. But Pasta rolled up in a single Humvee with no Pastettes. Instead, he brought Parmesan to the party. I was out in the front of the factory with Celeste and Hector, sitting on a picnic table that they continue to forget to bring in, despite the shit weather of late. Earlier today was clear and cold, but the sun was warm, and sitting at the table while Kevin provided overwatch with the PJs seemed like the right way to warm up and send a message to anyone approaching that we were friendly and ready to chat. So the Humvee rolls up, and Piccarillo gets out of the back seat. He's still wearing his OD winter cap down over his ears in full weather gear. Out of the other back door opposite him, a man of average height wearing a clean army uniform and sporting a full bird appears. He's maybe 35 years old, but looks younger than that with a military haircut. He's tight, I can see that. No arrogance in his posture, no smarmy bullshit face, and he's relaxed. Maybe even a little worried, and that made me feel better about whoever he was. Shitface McDick for brains walks around the Humvee towards us and meets up with the colonel. He says something in the colonel's ear, and they then approach us. I hopped off the table and walked toward the two NVC officers. You must be Mr. Ring, the colonel said as he put his hand out. I shook it. I'm Colonel Thorpe, formerly of the 1st Battalion, 101st Field Artillery. Now I work with the Northern Valley Cooperative. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. In my earpiece, I heard Kevin say, no fucking way. Holy shit, I'm coming down to you. It's nice to meet you, too, I said back after Kevin shut the hell up. Please, call me Adrian. My dad was Mr. Ring. I say the same thing. Well, my dad was Mr. Thorpe. I chuckled politely at his volley of my dad joke. This is Celeste and Hector. They're the community leaders here at the factory. They all introduced and shook hands and were social and stuff. Adrian, thank you for taking this meeting. It's been a mighty nerve-wracking period of time as Captain Piccarillo's unit has crossed paths with your people repeatedly. It became even more troubling when we realized whose toes we were stepping on. The Adrian Ring. I gotta say, I thought you'd be bigger, and you're a pretty big guy. You've done some incredible things the past couple years. You've got a reputation, do you know that? 
of course he knows that, Celeste said. He's who he is. I gave her a look and returned to the colonel. I do what I can to help folks. I've got a lot to make up for. As far as having a reputation is concerned, that's not for me to decide or care about. I got enough on my plate. I heard you were in the 75th Regiment. So Esponte, eh? Thorpe teased. Not quite. I scrubbed out after R.I.P. Nothing more than a wannabe operator. A couple ticks up from an airsoft gladiator. He pointed to a ranger tab on his shoulder. One of the hardest things I've ever done. You finished the indoctrination program and then scrubbed out? How'd that happen? There was alcohol involved. Let's leave it at that, I said with a sad wink. He chuckled and nodded. Just then, Kevin came bursting out of the heavy double doors of the factory, practically stomping through the entryway, wearing a menacing expression. I looked over my shoulder and knew something terrible was about to happen. I heard one of the two NVC guys draw his sidearm as Kevin appeared. You fucking burry cocksucker! Kevin bellowed straight at the colonel, angry as me when I spill coffee in the morning. Right then and there, I knew shit was going south. I turned to face the colonel and the captain and made the split-second decision to punch the captain straight in the throat before he could do anything, but when I turned, the colonel had a pearly white grin like I'd never seen before. Jesus, did I step in shit and have to wipe the selfie off me? Thorpe said, striding forward towards Kevin. Holy shit, Kevin said, walking forward. Human garbage, the colonel said. The Boston accents were thick now. The handgun went back, and fortunately, I hadn't punched out any throats. The two men smashed into each other, hugging like they were family, which, as it turns out, they kind of were. After the two of them practically swapped spit for ten minutes and both crying a little in a manly fashion, we migrated over to the picnic table and sat under the November sun while Thorpe, first name Patrick, and Witten, first name Kevin, exchanged a spirited round of Bostonian slang to catch up. I understood it all, but there's no way I'm regurgitating it here. There were lots of wicked pisses and no suz while they told each other the stories of how they got to where they were. Kevin maintained a modicum of secrecy with our details post-arrival in America, but he did tell a lot about his time in Jerusalem, and then London and Mildenhall, and of course, Morocco and the Azores. He told him about the dreams, the White Room, and the Trinity. All of that inner circle supernatural mumbo-jumbo. It's still weird to hear. It'll always be weird to hear. Oh, I should add that they knew each other from the Babe Ruth baseball team they played on as teenagers. Kevin grew up in Southie and Patrick grew up in Roxbury, Boston neighborhoods. Kevin went in the Army full-time while Patrick went in the National Guard, went to college, and has done well in the civilian world. He was working as a general manager at the Calendar Mountain Ski Resort when the shit hit the fan, and when his unit formed up to help, things were pretty far gone, and he suggested that they move to the mountain to secure it as a base. His decision definitely saved his entire unit from an ugly, ugly situation in the Brockton, Boston area during the first year of the apocalypse. He told us some stories about savage illnesses and looting and pillaging that happened right at the outbreak after that day. People waging wars over fresh water and food. Cities didn't do well, Mr. Journal, not at all. But they fared well in the mountains. Fewer people there during the summer meant fuller grocery stores to loot, and the mountain was operating at light staff, so there was little fighting required to secure it. They got the APCs trucked up, the HEMTTs up, and immediately got to work making what is now known as the NVC. I got all of this out of the conversation he and Kevin had, all with Captain Pasto watching on, impatient and angry, polarizing, watching him. Thorpe was congenial, friendly, disarmed, and polite, happy to be talking to us and elated to be with his old friend. I could see genuine appreciation and relief from Thorpe, and Picarillo couldn't be more different. I decided then and there Picarillo was indeed a bad apple. I couldn't speak to the remainder of the apples in the barrel with him, but Thorpe seemed on the level, and that made me feel great about the meeting. What if Picarillo was alienating people on his patrols? What if everyone we've met thus far ran into units that he has been in charge of? 
It would explain why they had such negative things to say. After Patrick and Kevin reminisced and reforged their friendship, we talked about the bad rap the NVC had. I explained that I had heard literally nothing good about them, and that based on the stories of dozens, I couldn't agree to a fair shake or any kind of community sharing until I knew they were legitimate. Yeah, I totally get that, Thorpe replied to me. I can see that. I can also say that we've had some pretty burnt-out soldiers working the expansion details, as well as providing security. You know how it is. Operational tempo can burn a man out. You guys know about what it's like working with a local population that's hostile. It isn't easy doing the right thing. There's always a price to be paid, either from laziness or action. Never mind people hate authority and they're jaded about the lack of government, too, especially since the dead people stopped biting everyone. Back when the undead were around, most of our enemies were obvious. They were walking corpses. Now it's a little tougher to discern. We've made personnel changes, Adrian. Things are different. We really do want peace and quiet. We're holding down the fort to allow for a better future. Buy the people time so our nation's infrastructure can return, and believe me, it will. Colonel Thorpe used hard sell. It was effective. That's all fine and well, Patrick, but I have a lot of people who are trusting us to make good decisions about this. More than one community contributes to our collective, and there are different agendas for each community, different needs, values, and goals. I can ascertain who you are as a person and your organization to an extent through you, but ultimately my people are like the states, collected but separate. I hear you. Look, I totally understand, and please know there's no pressure. We came at you very heavy-handed thus far, and for that I apologize. You have to know that you're a name, man. People know who you are. People talk about how badass you and your group are. You're this boogeyman in the night, riding around as you see fit, slaying zombies and evildoers like it's your fucking job. You're a vigilante, and you're the exact kind of people that have cost us lives. Well, it is my fucking job, I said back to him, because someone has to be the hero, Patrick, even if you're an asshole like me. I don't want to risk my life or the lives of my people, but when you can step up to do good, you fucking do good. When you can help, you help. He smiled. Then we understand each other. Maybe. Look, Adrian, this was great. I think it went as well as could be expected. Let's plan to meet up again in a week or so. After Thanksgiving, tell me the day. I'll bring some other personalities down from the mountain, as well as some goodwill gifts to show you a bit more of who we are. And it'll be diplomatic and terrific. There's no rush to this. We don't want to push... We just need to know we're safe from you and where you stand as it relates to what would happen if violence broke out. Are you our ally or a potential foe, right? Let's see if we can sort this out. We're good people, Patrick, Kevin inserted. You know me. I'd die for Adrian and what he stands for. What we've done for the people, we've done good. At every turn, all we've done is what we thought was best for the most. No doubt, and Kevin, believe me, your reputation with me is rock solid. It'll carry weight back with the council. This meeting was big for everyone. Things are going to be great. I really think so. And I think he's right. We meet again on the 30th. Adrian. One Last Hurrah Late September 2010. The lack of warmth in the day and the sharpened rocky terrain made Thomas incredibly uncomfortable. The sun sat brilliant and high in the bright blue sky, but it cast precious little warmth down on the late September day. Enough of a crosswind split the air, chilling exposed skin and lifting the dirt so as to clog the eyes and sting the flesh. The spot that he and Glenn had settled on for their sniper hide was a very unlikely place anyone would think to look for a shooter. Two large boulders leaned against one another. Both the color of sand had tumbled together a long time ago in what was now Afghanistan. The colossal stones were oval, the size of mattresses, and had chosen a bone-dry creek bed as the site of their geological struggle. 
Multiple other stones littered the slope of the hill nearby, making the two boulders blend in. Thomas lay on his stomach pointed downhill about three paces behind the two boulders, situated so he could point his scope and the weapon beneath it through the triangle-shaped gap at the base of the two stones. Sister rocks to each side protected their position from view, and if they needed to extract under fire, there were multiple avenues of escape to cover. The angled slope of the hill also had many other large stones scattered across it, making the two boulders they chose as home blend in. Many of the stones in the creek bed were still jagged. Had the water run for centuries here, they might have been worn smooth by now, but it was not so. The water had only streamed here long enough to wear the loose soil and dirt away from the stones, leaving a torturer's bed of sharp edges behind. That was the trick. Find the place most uncomfortable or most difficult place to pass, and pick that as your strength. Go where others could not or would not, and dominate that place. Glenn sat slightly more comfortably a foot away from Thomas. His ass rested on a large pack jammed full of ammunition as he kept watch for anything approaching their position. The SEALs had to worry about the Taliban attacking them just as much as the undead in this region of the country. Where they were was serious Wild West territory. See anything? Glenn asked quietly. He scanned the ridge to their rear through the ACOG mounted on his M4A1. Nothing had approached since they'd taken up the position two days prior, but diligence was the hallmark of staying alive, and these two men had a reputation for making very few mistakes when it came to diligence. No, nothing's approached the compound since this morning. Thomas blinked hard, spreading some moisture out of his flesh and onto his parched eyes. You took six hostels, right? Glenn asked absently. He already knew the answer was six, but... These conversations passed the time. Yeah. Thomas had taken half a dozen wandering undead down with his powerful rifle earlier. It was child's play shooting the slow, ponderous, dead walkers to an experienced shooter. More so when they were hundreds of yards distant. Leg sore? Glenn probed. Thomas lied. No, it's good. Wish it were warmer, though. This breeze is killing my eyes, damn it. Should have brought you some Visine, brother. One of the medics told me a week ago that he has a whole box of the shit stowed away someplace, worth its weight in solid gold. Hells yeah, I'd suck his dick for a few bottles of it, Thomas said idly. You're gay. He'd suck his dick for a chicken nugget or a pat on the head. Thomas grinned. Doesn't change the fact that I'd still blow him for eye drops, Glenn. Don't get all grammar Nazi on me. We're dealing with an apocalypse here and the rescue of 14 very good U.S. Marines in that compound down there. I don't need your shit, good sir. I get it, I get it. You're all on task and shit. I'll change gears, get professional as well. Glenn adjusted his sunglasses and fidgeted with all his gear to ensure full professionalism. Thomas didn't even look over his shoulder at the show. He knew Glenn's routine. Thomas kept his keen eye on the scope, and through that scope, he watched the Marines they'd come to rescue and the firebase they were fortified inside. The firebase was a simple affair. Connex containers and sandbags mixed in with plywood and scavenged timber. The base had only just been started when the end of the world hit in June, and the Marines inside it had struggled to keep their footing in such dangerous territory. They'd managed to expand it some even, despite the dangers. Now they had a tiny area dedicated to a garden and a small pen for captured goats. Near the base were several ravaged trucks that had the remnants of weapon mounts in their beds. They'd been shot to hell with a heavy caliber weapon and had burned to a crisp. In the flat ground between the destroyed vehicles and the firebase's wall, Thomas could see several burnt corpses. He wondered if they had died of their burns or had walked, dead and on fire, towards the base they so wanted to destroy in life. This had been hardcore AK-47 country before June 23, 2010, and when the dead had stopped staying that way, things had only gotten worse. When the Taliban hit the local villages surrounding the firebase, they'd done so to send a message to the Marines and to create a few hundred extra threats for the young men and women to deal with. 
Even trained marksmen wasted some rounds when the only shot that counted was one to the head. Trained marksmen that were firing at the Walking Dead wasted a lot of shots back in June. It simply wasn't something the brain easily digested, training or not. The Marines of Firebase Walker started off with the full rifle platoon to establish their foothold in the crux of the two Afghan ridges. Three squads of 12 plus support officers and a corpsman would have been enough to wage war against a decent-sized province, but with no air support, no reinforcements to call upon, no ammunition resupply to expect, and no hope of ever getting home, the Marines were hard-pressed to survive the past few months. They'd suffered the loss of two-thirds of their fighting force, as well as both of their corpsmen. Hope was running lower than ammunition. It had been a genius gesture by their lieutenant to save batteries for communication, and here they were now almost dead and able to receive the support they'd been begging for since June 23rd. The first wave of that support, small as it may seem, was Glenn and Thomas. Once Glenn and Thomas were certain that a chopper could land safely outside the base, they'd send for it and the Marines would be scooped away by one of the few remaining CH-47 Chinooks and taken back to Kandahar. They had one chance at the helicopter evacuation. The fuel supplies for aircraft at Kandahar were dwindling far below the emergency level, and the parts needed to keep the choppers in the air were nearly gone as well. When Glenn and Thomas called for the helicopter to come, it would signal the end of any air rescues for friendly forces in Afghanistan. There could be no mistakes. The plan had been to arrive via the sole remaining Little Bird helicopter in Kandahar and hike four clicks into the spot Glenn and Thomas had chosen. Once they'd made it across the harsh terrain and established their hide successfully, they would contact the base, let them know that they were in position. Once they'd observed Firebase Walker for 48 hours, the two men would make the call on go, no go for the rescue. The call could go one of three ways. The coast could be clear enough to call for the helicopter and the 14 Marines plus two SEALs would fly home safe and sound. If the SEALs felt calling the Chinook was too much of a risk, then they would exfil the entire firebase on foot, using the meager supplies the SEALs brought to fight their way to a point close enough for a column of Humvees to come get them. Or, if those two opportunities were negated by circumstance, it would be the decision of the two SEALs to leave the Marines to their fate. Glenn and Thomas hopped off the little bird two days ago, completely disregarding the last option— the SEALs were leaving the firebase with the Marines one way or the other. The infiltration to their rocky home had gone smoothly. Suppressed weapons and moving at night meant that when they engaged threats, the fighting was enormously in their advantage and drew minimal excess attention. The men had learned that the greatest threat to their safety was drawing attention to their activities. It was bad enough that the Taliban might hear their rifle fire, but the undead, all of the undead, would come from miles around and converge on their location if they made any serious noise. In platoon strength or less, the attention would be little bother, but two lone seals would struggle to kill an entire valley filled with dead, hungry Afghans. The firebase had been elated to hear of their arrival. The highest-ranking Marine in the base, Staff Sergeant Theo Ellum, had received their call with clear elation in his voice. Man, it is some good to hear from you, Punisher. We've been expecting you. Ellum used Glenn and Thomas's moniker proudly. When the war had been in full swing, the pair had been referred to as Punisher One over the radio. We're glad to hear you and have eyes on Firebase Walker. We're going to wait a full 48 hours before making our decision on the extraction. You're all set on food and water, ammunition? Thomas had asked. Ellum's elation changed quickly. We got H2O. We got enough MREs to last the end of the week. We are on E when it comes to ammo, though. Our 50 cal is drained entirely after the four-vehicle assault last week, and we're down to about two magazines of 5.56 for our M4s. We have five salvaged AKs and about 200 rounds for them. The grenades we got left to throw were just handfuls of shit. We got plenty of that. Thomas laughed. Well, we got our own combat loads of 5.56, plus we brought you guys another 14 mags as well. 
It ain't much, but it'll get us through the extraction, even in the face of a small firefight. When was the last time you guys saw any Indians? There was a pause before Elam replied. The last serious face-off was when they rolled up on us in the technicals with the Dushkas and the PKMs. I believe our head count was five dead bad guys, and all the guns were trashed when we lit up the vehicles, scorched earth. Man, that's a bitch. A Dushka would be nice to have on hand. No other sightings since then? Elam responded quicker this time. Our sentries are reporting the same shit as usual. Far fringe on the edge of the valley, we get a head poking up over a rock to take a look at us every so often. We had a mortar round drop in our breadbasket two days ago, and there's nothing we can do about it. No counter-battery radar out here in the sticks anymore. We're lucky it was small, maybe 60 millimeter, but those fuckers have us zeroed in something fierce. Thomas shook his head and realized the plight of these Marines. Cut off, without options or adequate equipment, fighting an indigenous force that's not afraid to die, that hates you with every fiber of their being, and then the end of the world happened and zombies started showing up. At least they were Marines and prepared as best as any could be. All right, Elam, if you've got nothing else critical, let's go silent. We'll be observing and attempting to engage any of the dead we see with our suppressed weapons, and if we see any of your raghead spotters, we'll send a nice metal jacket kiss their way. Right on their forehead. Send them home to Mama. I love you guys, man, for real, Elam said, his emotion coming out. Shake our hands on that Chinook in two and a half days. Remember, Marine, we're just as likely to call you asking for help, too. We're all a long ways from home. Thomas rested. He'd sat behind the scope of the rifle for almost sixteen straight hours, letting the pointy rocks dig into his body. Even with his body armor, his muscles and skin cried out in pain as he took a rest inside their stone fortress. He laid on the barren soil, his head resting on the top of his helmet, with only a pair of Nomex gloves to serve as a cushion. He dreamt. Thomas never was much of a dreamer, even when he was a civilian safe at home with his family. Since birth, Thomas had been blessed with the ability to fall asleep almost immediately, an asset of immeasurable value. Most of the time when Thomas dreamt, his mind relived the events of the day or the prior week. He would see training exercises play out again, or he'd reenact entire gun battles in what felt like slow motion. Occasionally, his brain would skew the perspective, and he'd see it from an aerial view or from the eyes of his foes. That, too, had become a skill of great use. The past few weeks, he had dreamed of family, and that made him restless when he awoke. He dreamt of his mother and father every night, and several of his SEAL Team brothers. His brain had seen fit to deny him happy dreams of his brothers and little sister, though, and those were the dreams he felt desperate for. He wanted to relive happier times, joyous times, with people he loved and wanted to see again. No joy. Wake up, Glenn said, kicking Thomas in the foot. Thomas opened his eyes and saw that the sky had turned over to a shade of dawn blue, meaning he'd managed to sleep and dream for nearly five hours. His body still ached from his time behind the rifle, but the rest had done wonders for the bruises, not nearly as much for his peace and calm. What's up? Thomas asked in a whisper. He sat up and looked down at Glenn, who was still lying prone with the M110, his focus on something outside their lair. I'm seeing a blip of movement north. Could be a goat moving between rocks or a tango spotting for another mortar round. Not sure. Can you get eyes on and give me a hand? Of course. Thomas grabbed the spotting scope from inside a small case nearby and crawled down low to aim it towards the north. He realized the problem Glenn was having. Their weapon location had dismal line of sight in the area Glenn needed to be looking. Thomas found a tiny gap between the larger boulder and a smaller one and dug out the tiny stones and loose dirt to make a small space to set up the scope. It took him a minute, but when he finished, he had a great view. In less than 30 seconds, he saw a figure walking, wearing a traditional dark blue burqa so many of the women here wore. He immediately reassessed the description of walking. She stumbled and shambled without grace. The midnight blue fabric she wore on her torso was covered in large old blood stains, darkening the already deep blue to black. The stains ran all the way to her feet, 
There was no way anyone could survive so large a loss of blood. His mind went to little Raza. Flashes of her dead body crowded his vision and hampered his thoughts. He shook the visual of her away and zeroed in on the threat. Dead woman at your 10.15, 250 meters. Blue burka coming around the end of a rock that looks like the fender of a Chevy truck. Glenn twisted the barrel of the M110 for a few seconds, finally giving up with a grunt of dissatisfaction. I can't get the angle. I can get her. She ain't moving real fast. Thomas reached over and stowed the spotting scope in favor of his M4A1. With his ACOG on and the suppressor off, the shot would be gravy. Sounds good, Glenn said quietly, returning his attention to the firebase in the eastern and southern approaches. The ring man shouldered his weapon and quickly found the undead woman again. She'd moved about ten feet from right to left, heading to the west, and she even had less chance for cover than before. He lined up his shot and let Glenn know it was coming. Sending. Good to go. Thomas gently exhaled and let his finger contract on the trigger. The high-velocity round kicked out of the barrel, rattling their eardrums and popping the woman's head apart an instant later. No blood, brain, or bone flew away. The debris storm brought on by the headshot stayed trapped under the blue fabric of her burka. Her body ricocheted off the hip-high boulder that looked like a truck and landed hard on the rocky slope of the northern ridge. It began a slow roll over small stones down, whipping the blue material around in a dead woman's dervish. Something snapped near Thomas, and he immediately had a mouthful of dirt and a face that stung. Almost imperceptibly, he heard something careen off the stone behind him, and he knew they'd just been shot at. Sniper, he yelled as he rolled out of the tiny opening he'd created with his bare hands not a minute before. As he rolled, he heard the echo of the shooter's gun report in the valley. They were far away and a talented shot, maybe 500 or 600 yards. Thomas grabbed a stone the size of a helmet and heaved it into the space the bullet had passed through, effectively sheltering them from the shooter's wrath. Motherfucker sent that woman out to draw her position. I should have known. Sorry, dude. Thomas was furious. He'd been baited into giving up their position, and he fell for it. Glenn remained calm behind his rifle. No bitching, please. Let's just find the cunt and shoot him. Gonna be a little difficult with them knowing our position and us not knowing theirs. Thomas was still pissed as he brushed dirt off his face. Nonsense. We know the angle the shot came at. Now we just need to flank him. Glenn was speaking tactically simple. Thomas knew he was correct. I'll drop back directly south using the stones to get some space. Then I'll head west as best I can and try to draw fire. Once he starts shooting at me, you move over here to this hole and shoot him. Thomas said as if he were retelling the story of how a trip to the grocery store had gone. Be careful they aren't trying to flank us, too. I would, I were them, Glenn said. He thought about it for a second, then grabbed the radio. Firebase Walker, this is Punisher. Punisher, this is Walker Actual. We heard two shots, is all well? It was Elam's voice once more. Not so much, Walker Actual, Glenn replied. We're kindly requesting your eyes to the north to find a shooter and light suppressing fire if possible, so we can maneuver to flank. On it, Punisher. Give us a minute, Elam said. Roger that. We'll move on your firing, Glenn said quickly. He sat the radio down and turned to Thomas. Let me do the running, Tom. Your leg will slow you down, Glenn said. I got it. I'm serious, man. You've lost a step since taking that AK round to the calf this summer. Besides, you're a better shot than I am. Glenn was serious, and he made sense. All right, whatever. Thomas wasn't happy about the logic, but it was solid logic, and being smart was better than being dumb and brave any day. The two men went about switching off roles as the Marines in Firebase Walker prepared to lay down covering fire to spring Glenn from their shooting position. True to Elm's word, the Marines opened fire after a few minutes. The firebase had two sentry towers, and Thomas saw through the scope of the M110 as four of the remaining warriors ascended the rickety ladders to the firing platforms above. They took quick firing positions low on the tower top amongst the piles of sandbags, disappearing behind the protective barriers. 
A young Marine with out-of-regulation straw blonde hair disappeared behind the fortification with fortuitous timing. Thomas watched as one of the sandbags took a round from their sniper just inches from where the kid's head had been a moment earlier. Almost a full second later, the shot's report echoed through the valley. The incoming round was met by the Marines with unaimed and slow-suppressing fire. With precious little ammunition to spare, the Marines were simply firing rounds at the areas where stones could be hiding a shooter. In reality, there was a good chance that the sniper they were shooting at was well out of the range of their M4s anyway. They had to hope the sniper didn't know that. Go, Thomas said. Without pause, Glenn leapt over the stone to the south, where the sniper hopefully couldn't get a line of sight or shot on him. Glenn's body was only exposed for a second, but both men heard a round scream through the air with a snapping whiz. The shooter wasn't perturbed in the least by the marine fire. Walker, you can cease fire. Your suppression isn't working, Thomas said into the microphone hanging beside his cheek. He heard yelling inside the distant wall of the firebase, and the marine gunfire abated moments after. The ring brother dipped his head low and listened to the sounds of the unfolding battle at hand. He could hear Glenn's gentle footsteps so very faintly moving from large boulder to large boulder nearby. Glenn would move with incredible care and certainty from cover to cover until he was very far away from Thomas. Glenn's goal was to triangulate the points of the battle. He wanted the sniper at one tip of the triangle, Thomas at another, and he at the final point. That would, theoretically, divide the attention of the enemy long enough for Thomas to find the shooter and put a round through him. Thomas fidgeted with the seal-issued headset and waited patiently for his partner to give him the all-clear to roll the rock away that faced the north and start looking for the man that was trying to kill them. One of the primary ways snipers manage to kill their targets is through fear. A single sniper, not even a particularly good one, can pin an entire platoon of enemy men down because those men are deathly afraid that any piece of flesh they show will get shot off. It's simple. Snipers are death from above, an unseen executioner that passes judgment and sees the sentence carried out ex parte. You cannot fight an enemy you cannot see, and especially so when they see all of you when you wish they couldn't. One of the most effective weapons against an enemy sniper is patience, no matter how elite a shooter is, they cannot shoot what they cannot see, and if you remain out of their line of fire long enough, he runs out of time. If his or her target contacts support, a solitary sniper loses his advantage and then has to face multiple enemies coming from multiple locations. If you are patient enough to lay low, more often than not, the sniper's paranoia and concern for being flanked will cause them to flee or begin to fire in a way that exposes them. The two seals were very patient. Over the course of three morning hours, Glenn had managed to move almost 75 yards away before he even contacted Thomas over the comms. When Glenn reached a spot he felt useful enough, he began the game. Thomas, I'm going to raise my helmet and see if he takes a shot. If he does, I'm going to displace like a rabbit on meth, and hopefully you can see a muzzle flash if he fires again. Go for it. It wasn't the best plan, but with just the two of them out in the valley, they had very few options. Thomas listened for the shot at Glenn's helmet, and he wasn't let down. A sharp crack of the high-velocity bullet rang out after a single moment, and Thomas took his cue. He pulled the stone blocking his shooting path away with his left hand and sighted down the scope with his right hand on the grip of the rifle. Thomas managed to do all this with both his eyes open. One eye was focused through the crosshairs of his powerful optics, while his left eye remained hazy and unfocused, seeking out a second flash. He was ready to fire as he scanned right to left, looking for the sniper's position. I'm okay, Glenn said over the comms. I think he's to the northeast a bit. I held my helmet showing that way, and he saw it fast. I'm going to move again. Get ready. Roger that. Thomas swung his field of vision more intensely to his right, to the northeast, Glenn mentioned. He looked for anything out of the ordinary, strange colored bumps at the base of boulders, stones with ill-placed protruding lumps, or strange elongated irregularities that could be a camouflage-covered shooter. 
He looked for anything black or anything angular. Nature didn't make many straight edges, and many amateur shooters forgot to adequately mask the straight barrel of their weapon. Thomas heard the shot ring out half a second after his eyes saw the orange spark and diminutive puff of dust. His primal mind, his warrior mind, was thankful he'd seen the blossom of the flash. It meant the bullet wasn't intended for him. Instinctually, he slid his left eyelid closed and moved the scope to the spot on the ridge's fringe where he'd seen the small burst of light from the gun barrel. I'm good, he heard Glenn say. The shot had missed. Thomas only barely registered the comment. In truth, the words were lost on him. His primal mind, the warrior mind, had given him tunnel vision in every possible way. He heard the noise from his friend and knew he was safe. The message wasn't given with enough intensity to pull his focus from murdering the man who'd just shot at his best friend. The crosshairs of the scope moved quickly across the terrain, but with fluid grace and precision. Had an artist conceived of it, they would have painted the movement as if it had traced a ballerina floating across a grand stage of performance. Thomas was literal grace under fire. The perpendicular black lines stopped on top of a faded brown object that looked to be a small stone beside a larger, darker brother. Thomas's eye picked out a small, jet-black spot near the base of the light stone and realized that it was the tip of a barrel from a rifle. As his vision absorbed the scene, he realized that the shooter was covered in an earthen-colored burqa, not unlike the blue one the undead woman had been wearing from before. Thomas's entire body worked like a rehearsed symphony in concert. His left hand had just finished pushing the stone aside, but now was already returning to the scope atop the M110 to adjust for wind at the barrel, as well as wind at the target, the elevation, and the range for the shot. His four fingers and thumb did all this based on his mind's assessment that the shooter was 550 meters distant and was about 50 meters higher in elevation than he. Unconsciously, he factored in for the breeze, moving at five miles an hour from east to west here in the valley at the moment, as well as the rotation of the earth, not likely a factor. And as he emptied his lungs gently of the crisp Afghan air within them, he contracted his trigger finger gently, freeing the firing pin to hit the primer on the round and sending a projectile out the heavy weapon's barrel. A shooter loses the sight picture through the scope when they fire. The recoil of the weapon shakes it simply enough. When the weapon settles, the best shooters have already put the crosshairs back on the exact spot they'd just sent the round. The M110 was semi-automatic and had served Thomas as a fine weapon for regaining his sight picture since he'd started to use it. Thomas got his eyes back on the location where he'd put the round just in time to watch the body roll away from the boulder it had been behind. As his warrior mind gave up control to his rational mind, he watched as the earthen-colored body tumbled diagonally down the slope of the ridge. It flopped around, rolling over and over, eventually disrobing itself of the beige burqa, revealing the body of a woman. Thomas judged her to be older than the first woman he'd shot, with thicker hips and fuller breasts. Thomas's shot had hit her just below the neck, directly in the space between the collarbones. The power of his rifle's bullet had annihilated everything between ribcage and spine, neck and nipple. Her lungs had been scattered on the ground ten feet behind her before she even knew she'd been shot. Thomas shot her tumbling body again without malice. This shot left nothing above the neck, reducing her skull and brain to the equivalent of fleshy slag. Her body came to a rest against another freestanding boulder and began to leak a red stream of blood beyond it. Shooter's down, he said to Glenn. Make your way to the firing position slowly in case there's a second shooter. I can't see you from my angle, but the spot is 550 meters distant from me at my 1230, about 50 meters uphill at the crest of the little ridge. I'll cover you as you move. Roger that, Glenn replied. Glenn moved out, protected by the same power of fear that had just caused him and his friend to take cover for three hours. The turn of events was supremely satisfying. Glenn moved with Thomas and the best shooter from Firebase Walker providing overwatch. The two angles of fire gave him reasonable protection should there be a second sniper hiding somewhere on the ridge. 
Mercifully, the wind kicked up fast enough to muddle a long-range shot. It was hard enough to shoot someone at 500 yards without a 15-mile-an-hour cross breeze. Funny that something so simple could make you safer from something so dangerous. Glenn moved from large stone to boulder and from tiny hillock to ditch one twenty-foot burst at a time. He would only move after getting the all clear from Thomas, and he moved to the next closest piece of substantial cover. He took no risks with his life, and that caution meant the two hundred meter trip took almost twenty minutes. When the seal reached the decapitated and ruined body of the woman that had tried to kill them, he shuffled slowly, bent over at the waist with his weapon ready to fire. He dropped to a knee and rapidly searched her body for anything useful. After a minute, he abandoned his examination and moved uphill to where her rifle was. He scooped up the Soviet-made Dragonov rifle and slung it over his back. He picked up a canvas bandolier containing a few of the smaller magazines that the rifle used, and he backed away. Glenn froze and moved behind the stone the woman had died next to, taking cover from something beyond Thomas's vision and shouldering his M4A1. Thomas watched and waited for his friend to tell him what he saw. A minute later, Glenn triggered the comms unit and spoke. There's vehicle movement at the far end of the ridge exit. I see two large trucks full of tangos, but something's wrong. They're acting weird. Keep eyes on. The walker shooter and I have you covered. See what happens. Thomas responded, aye, aye, and they waited. Thomas tried to read the body language of his buddy as Glenn leaned over the large boulder and observed the potential threat downrange with his rifle. Glenn remained still, but after nearly ten minutes of observation, he stiffened, and Thomas knew something had changed. Fuck, we got a collapse on the base, major enemy on the way. Glenn had already turned around and was moving towards the base's entrance fast. He wasn't even trying to stay in cover now. This was a full retreat with haste. Thomas knew enough about his friend to realize whatever he'd seen was bad news, and he needed to move at the same rate and damn fast. He got to his feet and got the M110 over his shoulder so he could grab up the packs filled with communications gear, food, and ammo. He put the straps over his shoulders as best as possible and put the rest into his offhand so he could wield his M4A1 like a giant pistol. He never moved without a weapon in hand anymore. The two seals sprinted separately to the firebase's entrance. Prior to the rise of the dead, the base had no proper gate or door. They hadn't finished construction on the fortifications when what passed for society in Afghanistan fell apart. To help complete the door requirement, the Marines had strewn random boulders around the perimeter of the base. The soccer ball-sized stones made for a great small vehicle deterrent, with the added bonus of tripping up the undead quite easily. It was fortunate that the deceased paid precious little attention to where they were going. The two naval special warfare men leapt over the stones and dodged around them with grace, despite their speed and heavy loads. Thomas did move with pain, though, as Glenn saw, and suspected he would. His mangled but healed calf would be the source of discomfort for the rest of his life, and, with the added strain of almost 140 pounds of gear, the damaged muscle pulsed with soreness. To plug the actual space that the base wall had for an entrance, the Marines had screwed together two layers of 4x8 plywood with 4x4s in the center. They narrowed the base's entrance to just the width of a single man's shoulders using steel cargo containers and covered the entire front of the hole with the double-thickness wood barrier. The door could only be opened by pulling on ropes that lifted it up like a guillotine blade. Two of the Marines had called down from the sentry towers and the others had gotten the door lifted for the seals. Glenn and Thomas were able to insert into the base quickly through the narrow opening, with the homemade portcullis dropped closed in their wake. Both men were mildly winded, Thomas more so. What did you see? Thomas asked Glenn, stifling the pain in his legs and the need to inhale more precious oxygen. The higher altitude played havoc with breathing here. Well, I saw four large trucks unloading insurgents, he blurted. Glenn pulled off his helmet and scratched at his thinning brown hair. I thought you said there were just two trucks, Thomas asked. Just as he finished his question, a substantially built black man with sergeant stripes walked up to them. Out of the corner of his eye, Thomas saw the Elam name tag on his left breast. 
He thought it strange that he was wearing the stripes this far out in enemy country. Elm approached them, but let the seals talk. I saw two at first, but two more came, farm trucks, for hauling. They had twenty or thirty more people in the backs of each. Might be a hundred of them out there, but that's not all. Tom watched as some of the color disappeared from his friend's face. I think all of who got off the damn trucks were undead, a hundred or more, blindfolded with their throats cut, an entire village worth of the damned heading our way over that ridge. Elam entered the conversation. Well, shit, that's easy. As they come over the crest of the hill, we pick them off. None of them will even get close to us, I'm sure of it. The two seals and the gathered marines exchanged some expressions of relief. Had there been a hundred shooting Taliban coming over the hill, the likelihood of injury or death would have skyrocketed. With just the mindless shambling dead coming, there was a chance they might not even head over the hill properly and make any kind of formulated attack. The enemy might have disgorged a hundred wandering threats to themselves. Above in the sky, all of the gathered men heard a whistling noise that coupled with a faint rumbling in the air. The vibration of something moving towards them very fast shook the air. In perfect unison, the seals screamed, Incoming! As the collected mass of armed and armored marines and seals hit the deck, the lethal mortar round impacted on the other side of the sandbag-encircled center structure of the base. The structure served as the sleeping quarters and had been built low and strong with sandbags around it and atop it. The deadly shrapnel smashed into the earthen defenses and no one yelled out in pain. From the tops of two of the sentry towers, young marines scrambled down to find some kind of suitable cover that might absorb the power of the mortar explosions. They tipped and wobbled and grabbed onto the wooden structure to avoid falling out of the towers in their hurry. Motherfuckers! Elam yelled as he lifted his helmet off his nose and his chin out of the ground. Thomas smiled. Clever bastards, shoulda known. Glenn matched his smile and agreed. The Taliban were improvising and adapting to the New World Order. What the fuck are you talking about? Who's clever? What's so damn smart about this? Elam was a little behind the seals in the realization of what was going on. As Thomas started his reply, another whistling projectile screamed down from above and impacted in nearly the exact same location, once again hurting no one and causing minimal damage. When the dust settled, he continued his explanation. Dropping these mortars on us makes a hell of a lot of noise, don't it, Staff Sergeant? Plus, it means we need to keep our heads down while the noise sends all those dead bastards right at us. They're providing indirect cover for their undead army as well as giving them a big fat fucking bullseye to find us. Smart, real smart. Shit, Elam said. As another mortar round began its hellish descent on the base, all Thomas could do was agree. Shit indeed, Staff Sergeant Elam. November 25th, 2013. I've caught a bit of a stomach bug again, hence my disappearance after such a big meeting. I would have written more earlier, but between running a fever and having semi-solids launch out of both ends of me like the beginning of tactical nuke strikes from missile silos in the Midwest, I've been sleeping. Michelle has been a rock star while the ninja shits have their way with me. Fletcher Thomas has come into Hall E here twice a day to check on me, He's worried it's something serious like cholera or diphtheria. Thank you, spell check, or whatever. The PJs don't seem concerned, and I trust their judgment more than his. Motrin and water, kid. Fletcher helped horses. The PJs helped people in developing countries with the above-mentioned diseases. I'm like 25% sure Fletcher will diagnose me with hoof-and-mouth disease. Michelle's homemade broth from chicken bones with teensy-weensy diced carrots and bits of meat have been my savior. It gave me enough strength to make the trip to the overpass to meet with Captain Maria this morning, though I don't think I should have gone. I feel worse now, though the meeting went well. I let Kevin manage the group when we went out this morning and did my best to remain in control of my vomiting and diarrhea in the second Humvee. I managed to get a seat next to Rich, the guy from Texas, and... We had as good a time bullshitting as you can in a vehicle with shitty seats, shitty suspension, shitty visibility, and the shits. 
I didn't, if you're curious. Mission accomplished. Anywho, Maria beat us to the meet, as she often does, and James drove the Humvee out onto the overpass to meet hers. Long story short, Maria said she was well, her people were well, and I talked to her about meeting with the people from the NVC. I was open and honest about how I felt, which was positive after meeting Pat Thorpe. A lot of that positivity came from Kevin's unabashed support of him. The two of them go way back, and it's hard to overlook that history. I explained to her about Picarillo and my gut-check dislike of him and whatever it was he did for them. I went on and explained that I was going to meet with them again and try to get a better feel from other higher-ups in their organization what their real deal was. I need more info to make a reasonable decision, and she agreed. Man, I miss Gilbert. I think she was happy with what I said. We'd talked nervously about them moving in the AO for months now, and our collective groups have been worried about their military strength. In a fair fight, the NVC could take us both on at the same time and probably win. If they didn't win, the cost to defeat them would be so steep, we'd be celebrating our victory after a hundred funerals. Unacceptable. Peace is the choice whenever we can make it. Only warriors really know what that means. It takes more strength sometimes to choose the peaceful route than the violent one. People who pay the cost when violence is chosen are acutely aware of what the best decision in that regard is. Their choice could mean their life, and that decision must be worth it when they make it. The funny thing is, the people who make those choices are rarely the ones who actually pay the price. Ship politicians to war. Uh, blah, 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 poop and stuff. Got heavy there for a second. Before we traded minor goods, set the next date for a meeting and split, Maria did ask me if I was willing to meet someone who had traveled a long ways to meet me. A pilgrimage of sorts. I felt a little uncomfortable about it, but I knew I was safe enough, and if Maria thought I could meet this person, it was probably okay. She said he came all the way from Honolulu. That's a hell of a drive. Though, in his credit, people were leaving that island in droves long before the apocalypse hit it. Too expensive, and the work there is shit, so my brothers in the Navy told me. Nice weather, though. Eventually, I gave up and agreed to meet the guy. A few minutes later, one of her uniformed men escorted a man, a woman, and a teenager up the overpass to Maria. She welcomed them and introduced me to David, his wife Jennifer, and their son Bruce. They were wearing coats that were either too big or too small, and they forced smiles despite their shivers, not indigenous to this kind of environment. David worked in industrial fabrication, and his wife worked in a zoo. I shit you not. They were awesome people, funny and polite, bright-eyed and intelligent. I liked them all immediately. The kid was personable after getting over his five minutes of shyness, and in all, I'm glad Maria had me meet them. I hadn't considered that they would ask if they could move to Bastion, which they did. We don't have any room inside the walls, really. I think I already talked about that. New people coming from all over have taken up the limited space on setting, and we've flooded them out into the town to keep them close. We're trying to be selective on who we allow inside the walls. I thought about it for a few seconds and decided another skilled worker to help Blake and Martin was too important to pass up. Jennifer, as well, has experience tending to animals, so she'll be of tremendous help to Ollie and his animal managing crew. After talking to them about what would be expected if they moved to the Bastion region, David's response was, Will we get to meet Michelle and Kevin? What about Abby and Hal? Weird, right? I suppose I should get used to this. It's going to happen more and more, I suspect. I told them that would be up to Michelle and Kevin, Abby and Hal. Kevin and Michelle greeted them when we got back to Bastion while I hit the shitter like a dropped bucket of paint and crashed on the couch downstairs with a cup of tea with honey. Honey's growing on me. I wasn't a big fan of it for years for whatever reason, but with processed sugar all but disappeared, we're left with our homemade maple syrup and harvested honey to sweeten things. I use maple syrup for some things, French toast and coffee, for example, though our cinnamon supply is getting meager, honey for others. Now, if we could get a steady supply of coffee. 
We scheduled our next meeting with Maria and company for December 20th, just before Christmas. David and family rode back with us in the second Humvee. I moved up front, and they sat squished in the back with Rich. Turns out both of them lived in the Houston area for a while, and they got on well talking about H-Town. Listening to Rich talk with David made me like him more. He worked with a veteran's charity outfit for years before the shit hit the fan, and as a vet, that spoke to me. I tried to ignore the parts where they talked about the Trinity, the apocalypse, savior of mankind, scribe of the new world bullshit, etc. This is definitely going to get old. Anyway, I'm tired as fuck. I'm still in a good mood despite my stomach bug, and I'm excited to celebrate Thanksgiving in a few days. I'm told by the lovely woman who takes care of me that preparations are well in the works and spirits are high. They're high because people are excited for the feast and also because the word that our meeting with the NVC went well has gotten around. People are excited that a peaceful resolution seems possible. Abby seemed really happy earlier when she took little Gavin up to bed. In a stroke of pure luck, the baby isn't screaming tonight, so I should sleep well. Talk to you in a few days, Mr. Journal. Now I cuddle with Otis and Michelle. Adrian. November 25th, 2013. Second entry. The baby woke up. Adrian. November 28th, 2013. Today is the day Americans, or those living on the land that most recently was called America, a.k.a. the United States, are thankful for things and people and whatever, also known as Turkey Day and the four-day weekend where I must associate with my family against my will, all for the sake of gravy-coated foods. Earlier today, we had a massive feast in the central cafeteria at Bastion to celebrate the year's harvest thus fall and to commemorate all that we should be thankful for. While our population is still smallish, we're trying to instill a gravitas to holidays again. They're not just a day off. The time they're setting aside means something. The time should mean something, at least. The food was out of this world. James, Eddie from Texas, and a few of our other resident hunters spent the last week out hunting wild game, and they were quite successful. They were able to take down over a dozen turkeys, two deer, and a handful of pheasant and quail. Ollie and crew have grown a stellar offering, and the vegetables and grains were fresh and delicious. Fresh-baked bread and churned butter followed with leftover liquor and fresh milk made everyone as happy as could be. Michelle and I sat in the center of the cafeteria area and more or less entertained everyone at one point or another as they passed by with their cheesy plastic school plates full of food. To a one, I think every person who made eye contact with me said thank you for all I had done, and I caught more than 30 or 40 people doing the same to Kevin and Michelle, as well as the old guard of people who stood with me from my early days. Mostly the new faces, but conspicuously, Abby and Hal were very, I think the word is reverent, when they said thank you. Felt strange to me, but it wasn't until now that it really hit me how weird it was. Maybe being parents have given them some kind of new perspective on things. Never having been a dad before, I can't speak from experience. Michelle surprised me with the invitation of the lion's share of people from MGR, the factory, and Spring Meadows. Turns out she'd been working on getting them to come here to visit on the super down low. They sent about half or more of their people to attend our celebration, and in return, we sent out a care package to the locations so they had a fresher feast at home. Radio traffic tonight from the locations after everyone got home was positive and appropriately thankful. It makes me feel good. At the dinner, I happen to see Blake and Kim, who are super pregnant again. They're due in about two weeks, so she's approximately the size of Hall A and only slightly more mobile. This pregnancy has been tough on her, so she said, and leaving bed to attend dinner was the most she'd done in weeks. Our medical team has had her on bed rest due to swelling and blood pressure stuff. It was great to see her and the growing little Adrian Gilbert. Some of the Texas transplants asked me if I would say something, and 
Despite hating public speaking worse than sitting on tax, I stood up and addressed everyone. Mr. Journal, I tell you, it was dead silent when I got up. Not a single murmur in the place. Everyone watching me and listening. I got nervous and asked for Michelle to come stand with me, and once she got up, I had the guts to say something. I don't remember everything I said, but you can rest assured it was moving and well-formulated and thought out. People shouted from the rooftops in my name, and children wept for joy. I made some awkward dick and fart jokes to get people laughing. Then I said I was thankful that so many of my friends and family were here to share the day. I said I was thankful the future looked peaceful and bright, and that I was excited to eat next year's meal. Some folks clapped, some laughed, and others just looked at me like I'd tried to smash a watermelon with an infant. I mingled with the old guard, played with my brother Caleb's kids, as well as chatted with the newer people who I don't know that well, and after drinking one of the last fingers of Blue Label in Gilbert's honor with the people who knew him best— I retired here to my safe place, Hall E. I played some infamous on the PS, and now I'm writing here. But I think I'm done. I don't have anything to add other than I'm nervous and excited for the meeting in two days with the brass at the NVC, one more street meeting with Colonel Thorpe, Captain Pasta, and whoever else they choose to bring in the attempt to impress us into collaborating with their group, I'm nervous because any meeting could go south, but I'm excited because Thorpe was on the level, and he gives me hope that a proper alliance and future is possible. Gonna crash now. Michelle won't be back until much later, after she's done helping everyone in the world with everything. Love her, but she struggles to know when to quit. Of course, that's part of what I love about her. Adrian. November 30th, 2013. We exchanged gunfire with a group of survivors on the way to the meeting today, and we called the meet off. Perhaps in an error of judgment, we headed out to the factory in a two-pickup convoy. Kevin rode in the front truck with James at the wheel and Ray from Texas and Ethan in the back seat. I rode in the second truck with Angela and Quan in the back seat and Texas Rich at the wheel. Like usual, we were armed with our weapons, but no crew served guns in turrets. As a rule, we drive like maniacs wherever we go. When I say we drive as fast as we can, I mean it. It's harder to hit a moving target, and it's a lot harder to hit a fast-moving target. On straight stretches, we are floored as often as not, and if the roads are clear, we take corners on two wheels like drift racing is a post-apocalyptic hobby. It keeps you safer if you have a good driver. Kevin's truck took a round to the windshield, and he called out contact. No one hit, but that sent us all into a tizzy. Guns up, pedals down, we barreled through the neighborhood we were in and got out of the kill zone. Windows went down, and we all started looking for muzzle flashes or something to return fire at. We don't just shoot everywhere, despite that feeling good. Angela saw movement on the driver's side of our truck, and she called it out. I looked past Rich as he drove us out and saw two men and a woman wearing heavy winter clothes running through a fenced yard carrying long guns. They weren't shooting at us as I saw them, but one of the men stopped and looked over his shoulder. He raised his gun, and that was our cue. The front truck and Angela opened fire on him all at once. He went down like his plug had been yanked as the fence they ran behind got chewed up by errant rounds. I grabbed our radio and called for the QRF. Once we opened up, the two others I saw started shooting back. Several rounds started coming back at us as we got further away, and I heard several smack into our vehicle. I didn't have an angle to shoot, but those who did shot the best they could to buy us time to get out. We turned the corner into a deeper area of suburbs on the fringe of town in the city, and we moved to a hard point to regroup and possibly take cover while our reaction force got to us. And that was it. The whole encounter ended by the time we realized it had begun. Well, the gunfight portion of it, at least. When we stopped in the circular driveway of a particularly large home, Ethan called out for injuries, and I lost my mind when Angela said she was hit. The sound of her voice, man. Pitiful. A shadow of who she is. Was. I got out and moved to her aid while Quan and Rich pulled security. 
Ethan came to us as I got her on the ground in the driveway and started to assess her. Blood was pouring out of her shoulder area near the armpit on the left-hand side. She was dead by the time we got her body armor off. Massive internal trauma caused by a single gunshot. She died in a fucking driveway, man. In the cold, for, for no fucking reason. No last words, no melodramatic ending, just her saying, I'm hit and an abrupt drop into shock, then death. I wish I could say I got angry and went on a terrifying war path to Avenger, but all I could think about was telling Danny his mom died. The look on his face as I told him now both of his parents were gone, that he was alone, the last of his name, the last of his line. The QRF reached us in less than 20 minutes, and they dismounted, and they hunted the people who killed her down. They surrendered without further incident, and they're sitting in the maintenance garage on folding metal chairs, handcuffed with several very fucking angry people watching them. Judgment will be made on them in the next few days, and I'm scared for that. Kevin and James helped me put her body in the back of the truck for the ride home. I couldn't bear the idea of her riding in the cold alone, so I sat in the bed of the pickup with her. I leaned against the back of the cab to avoid the wind, but I still froze. I'm still cold. The whole way home, all I could think about was how the blood matted her hair and how serene she looked in spite of that. How serene she was, despite all she had to do in this world to keep her life and protect her son. I kept seeing bits of Danny in her face and realized that all along her son looked as much like her as he did his dad. Those thoughts didn't make the idea of telling Danny Jr. about his mother's death any easier. Bastian knew we'd had contact. Word travels fast when the QRF goes out. I had the truck go straight to the clinic at the center of campus, and the medical team helped me bring her inside after we wrapped her in a sheet. Dozens watched on, unsure of how to act. It's been a long time since we lost someone, especially to violence. After getting Angela's body sorted out, I went immediately to Amanda and told her what happened to her sister. Texas Eddie, for some reason, was there talking to her, and he hugged her in a way that told me there was more than a friendship at play. I said nothing about that, and after she gathered herself, Quan tracked down Danny Jr., and we told him. More accurately, Amanda's eyes told him. Danny walked into the room with a typical teenager's bounce in his step, but the moment he saw the tears in his aunt's eyes, that shit stopped. He started crying and went to her. Neither of them said anything at all. No words were exchanged for the entire time until he let go of her and turned to me, Shit, I was crying. I'm not ashamed to say it. How? he asked me. Took a round in a random attack on the way to the factory. She went quick, I said back. There was no suffering. That was a lie. I lied to him. He nodded, and his lips got all fucked up like he was trying not to cry. I grabbed him and held him as tight as I could, and he grabbed me back, and we stood like that, shaking with emotion for a good long time. Eventually, we separated some. I'm sorry, Danny. I'm so sorry. He blinked the tears away and nodded. He went to the couch where Amanda sat beside Eddie and rested his dad's rifle against the cushion before sitting down with her. He was wordless and... I felt a little lost as to what I should do or what I should say. After a minute or two, felt like forever, the boy cleared his throat and looked up at me. Something inside him had changed. I, I could see it, feel it. You were with my father when he was shot, right? At Moore's gun store? I was, yeah. He died quickly like my mother? Yeah, there was no suffering. And today... You were with my mom when she was shot? Yeah, Danny, I was. He looked over at his aunt, and fresh tears spilled down his face. He nodded his hands in his lap, and Amanda put her arm around him. He sobbed and cried, and we all joined him, but after a minute of that, he coughed, cleared his throat once more, and looked me straight in the face. I'll never forget how angry he looked, how old he looked, or what he said to me. 
I don't think I want you around anyone else in my family, Adrian. All I could manage was to nod and leave the room. I had to respect his wishes. During all of that, we were able to get a message to the factory to let the NVC people know we had an incident. They understood without question. Our meeting has been postponed until December 3rd to allow time for us to grieve, bury Angela according to her family's wishes, and to figure out what to do next. I don't think sleep is in the cards for me tonight. I volunteered to Abby and Hal to take the late-night feedings for Gavin. I figured if I was going to be awake, guilt-ridden and loaded right to the gills with self-loathing all night, I might as well make myself useful. Adrian. And now a sample of Chris Philbrook's best-selling urban fantasy novel, Tesser, A Dragon Among Us. Prologue. The Dream. I am flying. I have done this before many times, and it is joyous. I feel the gusts buffet my body left and right, up and down. Though the wind is reckless, it isn't violent. I feel the energy of the air lift me higher and higher through the cool mist of a thick cloud that clings to my face and invigorates me. It is much like the first inhalation of the ocean's air after a long journey to the coast. Far below me I see green grass, lush treetops, and gray pebbles poking through the skin of the world. There is a single brown line of disturbed earth winding forward that I know to be a human road. I have flown over it many times before, and I have walked it as well. It is familiar to me but I cannot quite place where it has come from or where it is leading. It doesn't matter. I have eyes that see, ears that hear, and a nose that smells. In time, I will discover everything. When I flex my wings and dip below the clouds like a descending sparrow, I can see that miles ahead the road rises on a hillock and ends at a tall wooden gate. Fortified wooden walls spread in both directions, at the center, a majestic castle made of stone and timber sits in stark contrast with the surrounding hovels of mud. I think it is my castle, but I don't live there. It is mine in the same way that a king owns a dog, or a queen owns a king. My dream is almost over. I feel it like a blue dawn rising on the edge of a long night. It has been a good dream for the most part, Though in life, no matter how much the sun shines, storms always appear now and again. It is natural, unstoppable. It is the way of the world. It is the way of my kind. I sense that I have been dreaming this dream a very long time, more than a night, or a week, or even a year. Centuries have passed, Maybe a millennia since I last lay open eyes on the waking world. The castle I am soaring towards in my dream is certainly gone, buried underneath centuries of revolution and crumbled empires. These thoughts do not cause me alarm, nor do I fear what the world will be like when I open my eyes soon. I am beyond mortal fears. Those that wear two skins are but a nuisance to me. My skin breaks the teeth of those that drink blood and stalk the night. Were it not for the teachings and lineage of my kind, the magi would be ordinary, not the wielders of primordial might that they are. Goblins, monsters, and fae are my kind, and they pay me the respect that is my due. I am the bringer of death from high above. I am the giver and shaper of life in so many forms. I am the bringer of light that illuminates all darkness. I am the stone that cannot be broken and the blade that cannot dull. I am the legend your grandfathers were told by their grandfathers. My footsteps shake the ground like the war march of a hundred legions. My heart beats as the thunder shakes the sky. If this body does not suit me, I will change it and become whatever will thrive in the soil of the times in which I awake. I am Tesser, 
and I am a dragon. And as I arc my wings once more to soar above the clouds, my mind elevates me away from my slumber. My fear finally makes itself known. A question, a single nagging lost memory occurs to me. Why did I allow myself to be pacified in sleep for so long? Long slumbers are not my way. Acquiescing is not my way. I think I'll find out why I have slept so long now that this dream, this long, long dream is over. And those that have seen to my sleep had best have had a good reason for my time lost. Because I am Tessa, and I am Dragon. Chapter 1 Abraham Abe Fellows Beep, beep, beep. Is that a car? Beep, beep, beep. No, it sounds too electric. Beep, beep, beep. God, I hate technology. Beep, beep, beep. Huh, God, that's a good one. I don't think Mr. Doyle would approve of me referring to God. Beep, beep, beep. Why am I sitting in the coffee shop? Where's that infernal beeping coming from? What does this latte taste like old chewed meat? Or is that sock I taste? Beep, beep, beep. Oh, hell, that's my alarm clock. Coffee shop is just a dream. Oh, hell, it's bright out. Damn it, my hand is asleep again. Fingers are number than ever. I'll be fumbling with this shut-off button for five minutes now. That Indian asshole in the apartment above me is gonna start screaming again. Beep, beep, beep. I'll cast a spell. I know that can't trip well enough, and my fingers can be as numb as they want. Beep, beep, beep. Abe sat up on the edge of his worn mattress and addressed the phone sitting on the milk crate he used as a bedstand. The air stirred slightly as the young man gathered his thoughts to cast the spell. There was some magic in the air here in his apartment, his sanctum. On the mantle of the non-functional fireplace, he'd organized semi-precious stones that had mystical powers. There was always the scent of incense on the nose. Sense had power. I'm ready. Abe gestured with his tingly, stiff fingers at the touchscreen of his cell phone, still sitting a couple of feet from his hands on the plastic crate. He slid his fingers in the air and spoke a word laced with arcane power. Comovio. Abe watched as the image on the phone glitched. The LCD screen didn't feel the touch of his spell in the same way it would have felt a finger made of flesh and blood. He sighed at his newest failed attempt to mix technology and magic. The tingling in his fingers had abated, but he couldn't abandon the spell. Beep, beep, beep. Fucking thing. Comovio, he said again, sliding his fingers through the air, this time with more emphasis and focus. Abe felt a surge of energy come from somewhere and fill his word and fingers with a different tingle altogether. The red button reacted, jumped. It slid across the screen smoothly to the other side, silencing the horrid alarm. Beep, beep. What the hell? Abe said aloud, running his hand through his thinning black hair. He looked down at his fingers, his palms turning his hands over several times, trying to find the source of the sudden energy he'd somehow tapped into. He stood on creaky morning legs and looked about his apartment for something new. Perhaps some creature or artifact that Mr. Doyle had perhaps slipped in while he was sleeping. But there was nothing, just empty pizza boxes, clothes in need of a washer, and Magic the Gathering cards. His phone elicited another electronic bleat, and Abe had a sudden pang of failure. But he was wrong. This was just the ringer. He picked the phone up with living fingers and looked at the caller ID on the screen. It read simply, Mr. Doyle. Abe thumbed the answer button over and lifted it to his ear. Mr. Doyle? An older British man's voice came back. Abraham. Yes, Mr. Doyle, what can I do for you this morning? Abe asked quickly. Mr. Doyle didn't like it when he hesitated. Mr. Doyle said men who wanted to learn the art of magic should always act with confidence. There was a pause on Mr. Doyle's end. Is he at a loss for words? Has the apocalypse come? Abraham, I think you need to call in sick to work. Someone else will need to tend your company's accounting today. In fact, you should phone them that you can no longer work for them. 
something rather large is afoot in the world, and your time needs to be redirected to more appropriate tasks. Doyle sounded somewhere between ecstatic and horrified. Abe had never heard him speak in such a way. How the hell will I pay rent? How the hell will I pay rent, Mr. Doyle? I can't afford to quit my job at the firm. Doyle was an accountant at a large law firm. Emotionally, it was a dead-end position, but financially, it was a home run, despite the contrary evidence of the decor of his apartment. Abe looked down sadly at the milk crate again. Abraham, I can afford for you to be in my employ. Many of my earlier years home in the United Kingdom were fiscally bountiful. I shall replace your salary in its entirety. Sack yourself via the telephone and come to my brownstone immediately. Abe smiled. This is what he had wanted all along. He'd been an apprentice to the old British mage for nearly two years now, and all he'd learned was three minor spells and how to read ten ancient and long-since dead languages. By this point, if the magic thing didn't work out, all he had left was counting beans in a cubicle. Abraham, is this arrangement sufficient? Shit, I must have gone silent daydreaming again. Yes, Mr. Doyle, sorry, lost in thought. I wanted to tell you I was able to cast a cantrip a few minutes ago. It seemed far more powerful than anything I've ever done before. I think I'm getting the hang of it. Dearest Abraham, something else is happening. Something large. Something that will certainly have rippling effects on the whole world, both mundane and magical. Some of my most precious possessions in my study have begun to awaken, shall I say clocks ticking, candles burning again, things of that nature, all roused by something or someone. Abe started to wonder what that meant, but caught himself. Daydreaming was unbecoming for someone who wanted to master magic. I guess I'll quit and head over then, Abe said softly. I'll need to go in to get the stuff out of my cube. You guess. I suggest you stop guessing, Mr. Fellows, and start being confident and assertive. I haven't lived as long as I have to waste my time on someone who guesses at things. Come over when you're ready, and please don't forget to turn your alarm off. Doyle cut the call. Abe let his hands settle in his lap. He looked around the room, wondering what had happened that made Mr. Doyle ask him to make such a huge change to his life. Beep, beep, beep. The beeping startled Abe, and he dropped the phone to the hardwood floor of his apartment. He reached down to pick up the smartphone and laughed as he thumbed the snooze button permanently. How did he know my alarm wasn't off? Chapter 2 Tesser I'm buried in earth. Tesser's body was immense. From the tip of his nose to the end of his tail, he was nearly 150 feet long, fully half the length of a modern football field. Right now, he was coiled in tightly, wrapped up to be as small as was physically possible. Tesser had no idea what modern football was, though. Not yet, at least. How did I come to be here? The earth holding Tesser's draconic body still was pressing down with enough force to crush coal into diamonds, but his ancient scaled skin held firm. Dragon flesh would not succumb to something so natural and primal. The mere presence of earth, no matter how crushing it may be, wasn't enough. I need to reach the surface. Tesser's eyes were already closed against the dirt and stones, but he furrowed his massive brows tighter and focused his mind. A swirl of sensations cascaded over his awareness as he opened up to all the information the world offered him. One by one, each of the scales on his body registered what was against them, and precisely how much pressure existed. His nostrils, still sealed with a flap of scales to keep out the invasive sand, opened a slit and took in the tiniest amount of matter. The scent of organic matter told him his depth. Within seconds, Tesser realized which direction was up, and how far he had to burrow to get to the surface. The muscles that corded the length of Tesser's body were unlike anything science had ever seen. Only the dinosaurs were comparable, but to compare a Tyrannosaurus rex to Tesser was akin to comparing a garden trowel to a nuclear weapon. Both were capable of moving Earth, albeit in a spectacularly different fashion. Tesser's enormous hand opened, 
the fingers as large as tree trunks and tipped with curving black scythes of claws. The black tips ripped through the earth smoothly, loosening it in handfuls large enough to fit a small car. Still too tight. The immobile body of a dragon might register as stone to a geologist. The bones and muscles are far more dense and supernatural than simple flesh, and when several hundred tons of dragon chooses to move, anything preventing that from happening gives way. Tesser shrugged. The earth moved. Boston's back bay felt it. The media that night reported a minor tremor, a localized earthquake that reached 2.1 on the Richter scale. The earth below gave way abruptly. Tesser's massive arms and legs shot out and arrested his short slide. Several yards of stone, some of it shaped in an unnatural way, fell below him. Tesser immediately opened his nostrils and inhaled for the first time in thousands of years. He was assaulted by foreign smells that caused discomfort. Primarily, he disliked the burning smells, sulfurous and unpleasant, that reminded him of the raw eruptions of volcanoes and the ancient pits of tar that swallowed so many creatures hundreds of thousands of years prior. Tesser opened his eyes. Larger by far than many eyes to ever have gazed on the world, these eyes were orbs of gold and slit like a cat's. He could see in any level of darkness, complete blackness if need be. Presently, he looked down through the hole he'd made to this strange passage below. In the oddly lit passage, he could see a uniformly wide channel with three metallic rails running along. One rail hummed with an invisible energy that was oddly reminiscent of magic. Tesser was intrigued. The opening was small, only a third of his length. He would have to shift to a smaller form to fit through. Tesser was not limited to a single form. The body he found most natural, that of a massive winged dragon, was not his only choice. Tesser could take on the form of any living creature should he wish it, and right then he wished to be smaller. It was a form of magic, though not a spell, more ancient than the clumsy arts the tribal humans were just now grasping. Tesser employed magic the way a bird would fly or the way a fish swam. It was natural and happened without thought. Tesser shrank down into a form that would fit through the hole below him, starting with his hindquarters first. As his tail and hind legs compacted down, he dug his claws into one side of the space in which he had been dormant, clutching tightly so as not to fall. Once he had reduced to a little less than a third of his original size, Tesser unclenched his still massive claws and descended down until he fell, straddling the channel in the strange stone passage. The sides of the fairly round tunnel were covered in small, straight-shaped white stones that were uniformly smooth. Spaced every so often were images clearly made by something that could write or draw. It took only a moment for him to realize there were strange images of humans as well. The images were massive, far larger than the humans he remembered. The largest human he'd ever seen was a savage in a cold village in the far north. He was nearly as tall as Tesser's largest finger and claw. He was a specimen, and Tesser was glad to let him live after he threw a spear ignorantly at him. Needless death was not Tesser's way and the man would be good breeding stock to improve the human lineage. But these humans were a head taller than the warrior had been so long ago. That human came from a village that had only just begun to make markings on hide to remember things. But these images with the large humans, they have languages, and they are writing now, and some strange magic that allows them to capture perfect images of themselves, I must have slept a very long time indeed. Tessa heard the small sound of tiny feet moving from the darkness nearby. He'd heard the same sound before, and when he turned, he smiled. One of his favorite creatures ever had come out to greet him. A dark-furred rat scurried out, completely unafraid of the massive dragon crouched in the alien tunnel. The rat had come from a hole in the white stoned wall and sniffed emphatically, wriggling its tiny nose and whiskers, taking in the powerful scent of the dragon. Another sound came from far off down the tunnel, and even though Tesser didn't know what the sound meant, he knew what creature it came from. A human. I need to observe. I 
need to see this new world unseen. Tesser shifted forms again. By the time the MBTA security guard arrived, Tesser had taken the form of a second rat, though his tiny eyes were still golden. He stood fearless, his nose wriggling as emphatically as his new friends had been a moment before. The guard reached up to his shoulder and spoke. Tesser didn't understand any of the strange words and thought his manner of dress strange. He wore dark colors, none of which were the skins of an animal like the humans had worn when he was last awake. Tunnel collapse, big time. We're gonna need to shut down the green line heading west between Copley and Hines. Holy shit. The T was halted for several hours. Unfortunately, morning commuters were forced to find alternative routes. Tesser cocked his head and realized there was much he had to learn. He had all the time in the world in which to do it. As the other rat darted back into the hole in the wall, he decided to join him. The shrunken dragon would start with the lesson of the rat's tunnels. Rats always knew how to get around. This concludes our unabridged recording of The Dealer of Hope, Adrian's Undead Diary, Book 9, Book 1 of Adrian's March. Written by Chris Philbrook. Performed by James Anderson Foster, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2018 by Chris Philbrook. Production copyright 2018 by Chris Philbrook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.